Audiobook title, Being a Hero, 01-48, by K's underscore NG. This work belongs to author, K's underscore NG. Source, scribblehub.com. Chapter 1, I'm used to it. Uh, a dark room in a slightly bigger house in the residential part of a city. Uh, too rough. More gentle. Nay nor, nay nor, nay nor, dot. The sounds of several sirens could be heard, getting louder and louder, overpowering the voices coming from the loudspeaker. Several vehicles were traveling at a relatively high speed along the road, passing the house. Although the speed limit on the road was 30 kilometers per hour, the speed of these vehicles was well above that limit. Nay nor, nay nor, nay nor. After almost 30 seconds, the sirens faded as the distance between the house and the vehicles increased. Ooh, yes, I'm close. In front of a monitor, the only source of light in the room sat a human-like figure on a chair. A pair of dark, lifeless eyes, belonging to this figure, stared at the screen. Their legs were spread on the armrests, their left arm between the teeth, and their right between the legs. Inside the monitor, two slender women were rubbing their genitals together. Ah, yes, 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 coming. The figure applied more pressure to the bite on the arm and closed its eyes tightly, enjoying the coming climax. After a dozen seconds, the eyes opened and the figure, releasing the arm from their mouth, turned off the monitor and closed their eyes again, falling asleep. Bam. 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 Rena. Bam. 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 Rena. Damn it. Open the door. Bam. 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 Rena. The figure in the chair, opened her eyes, let out a soft yawn, and made her way to the door while rubbing her eyes with both hands. Noticing the floor creaking with each of Rena's steps, the person on the other side of the door yelled, Finally you're awake. Now open the damned door. Click. After opening the door Rena saw, for her taste, a beautiful, slender woman of the same height as her with shoulder-length black hair and asked her, What is? While staring into her eyes, the woman shuddered for a moment after being stared at with those dark eyes. Usually at this distance, you could see your reflection in the eyes of the opposite person. The woman however cannot remember ever seeing her own reflection in Rena's eyes. When her gaze went down and saw the state of Rena's lower body, that thought went out of the window and she clicked her tongue. TSK, if you have time to shack your groin over the whole weekend, go outside and look for a boyfriend. Ignoring the sarcastic remark Rena went back to the center of the room picked up her panties and a skirt from the floor, and put them on. Seeing her provocation not working, the woman clicked her tongue again. TSK, don't you have work? Piss off. My boyfriend is coming over, and I don't want him to get high cancer from seeing a pig like you. Still ignoring the woman Rena finished dressing up, picked up her bag, went past the woman, and wordlessly left the house. Clap. After the front door was closed the woman clicked her tongue for the third time in irritation. After leaving the house Rena made her way to the nearest bus station. Her destination? She did not know. What she did know, was, that the destination was not her workplace. The reason for that is, she quit the company not long ago. After finishing high school with good grades, she visited an internationally renowned university. Then with a rather good degree, she joined a well-known company and worked there for relatively good pay. As the company had good prospects for a high career and as Rena thought of herself as an intelligent and hard-working person, her future seemed to be set. And now at the present, not even half a decade later, Rena wandered aimlessly around the city as an unemployed person because she had voluntarily quit her job. Even though her superior literally begged her to stay and even offered her a pay rise, she still decided to leave. Why? She did not know. She just calculated that with her savings from working those few years, she could last for two to three years. She also had already planned what to do after she had run out of money. Whether or not she could see her plans to an end though, she did not know. After arriving at the bus station she just sat on the bench and stared into the sky, not noticing, or maybe noticing but ignoring the glances the people around her gave her. Unfortunately, it did not stop with only glances. Some of the people, no, quite a few of them giggled and whispered to each other when they were in groups. 
but fortunately, Rena was already used to such reactions so she did not mind. She just continued sitting there for hours until the sun went down. Only then Rena stood up and made her way home. On the way back she noticed a car not belonging to her parents parking in front of the house. Rena concluded it may be the car of the boyfriend and contemplated whether she should go in or not. Remembering the malicious words from the woman earlier, after a few seconds lost in thoughts, she opened the door and went in. We won't see each other if I go straight into my room. When she saw nobody in the corridor, she wanted to go straight to the room as fast as possible. But when she heard loud laughter from multiple people in the living room, she stood still. Hey on my way here I saw a ridiculous fat and ugly thing sitting at a bus station. Ha ha ha. I can't say whether it was male or female. The unknown male voice continued. It even attracted quite a crowd. Many people even took photos of it, ha 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 ha. The unknown voice continued laughing for a while until three more voices joined him, two female and one male. The new voices though sounded a little awkward. Afterwards Rena's feet moved again and she went towards her room leaving the creaking sounds of the floor caused by her steps behind. In the room, she locked the door behind her, undressed herself, and lay down on her mattress. She grabbed her phone and started to read her favorite smut novel while burrowing her free hand between her thighs. Only five orgasms later she put her phone aside and closed her eyes trying to suppress the tears slowly forming in her eyes. I'm used to it. 50. Chapter 2. It doesn't hurt at all. On the next morning, Rena woke up early, way earlier than usual, and prepared herself to go out. Since she quit her job, she usually spent her whole day at home on her phone or PC reading novels. Some of them were smut. Most of the time she read those novels because she just wanted to fantasize about the romance in them, she had never experienced before. But there were also times when she just wanted to relieve herself while reading the spicier scenes of those novels. There were special occasions, however, where just reading was not enough for her. At those times she would watch videos to support it. After she finished preparing herself, she left her room and made her way to the front door. Before she could reach it, however, she heard shouting from the living room. Damn it, how often do I have to repeat myself? Do something about her. Why should I be the only one? I'm not the only parent, you also should do something. You're supposed to be the father. The origin of those shouts was Rena's parents. You know that I am F-I-N-G working and that educating them is your F-I-N-G job. Do you want to embarrass U.S. further? B but I did. I look at Nina. She grew into a respectable woman. Sob. Sobbing could be heard from the woman. Rena's mother. Murmur they are supposed to be twins. How could they be so different? Sob. Damn it. Can't even have a break from my day off. I'm going out. After an enraged shout from the male voice, Rena's father, Rena could hear loud steps closing into the door of the living room. Bam! A tall blonde man could be seen stepping out of the room. He wore a black suit with many rings and accessories around his fingers and neck, seemingly already dressed up for going out. From his slightly open jacket and the shirt underneath you could see signs of the well-built chest of a man who had lots of muscles. When he saw Rena standing close to the front door his face twisted in rage and stormed in large steps towards her while raising his right hand into the air and forming it into a fist. As soon as Rena saw what her father intended to do, she shut her eyes close and wanted to raise her arms to protect her head but stopped and tanked her father's punch with her face. Third, after getting hit she fell on her butt. Luckily she did not protect her head with her arms which would have definitely triggered her father to become more aggressive. In the past, he had conditioned her not to defend herself when she got abused. While fighting through the pain on her face she slowly opened her eyes to see that her father had stretched out his right hand to her. Wondering what her father was doing Rena looked up, only to instantly avert her face and look down again. As a teenager, she had always had trouble looking at other people's faces, and that had not changed until now. For some reason, this also included her parents, especially her father. As far as she could remember, he had always had a grim, angry look on his face when she saw him. Rena was afraid of him. The only exception was her twin sister Nina. As children, they had a quite good relationship with each other. Unfortunately, 
The relationship deteriorated over time to the point that Nina would openly insult and treat Rena like garbage. Luckily, if other people except for their parents were present, Nina would simply ignore her keys. Rena's thoughts were interrupted by her father's grunt before she could understand what he wanted. Her body had already reacted again because her father had conditioned her to do everything he ordered. So her hand instantly went to her pocket, grabbed her keys, and placed them in her father's outstretched hand. Leave. Again Rena's thoughts were interrupted. Her father had dropped another bomb before she could realize what her, or rather her father's, previous action had meant. That is why Rena unconsciously looked up and met his eyes. This time however she did not avert her eyes because her mind was too occupied with other thoughts. For example, what the heck was happening right now? Even though she rarely looked into other people's eyes, she could perfectly perceive how they look at her. Generally, there are two types. The first type had their eyes shaped like a quarter moon but rotated by a 90 degrees degree so that the reflecting and thus visible part of the moon is on the top. Rena concluded that those people were mocking her appearance, personality, everything about her, her entire existence. The second type was rather hard to describe. If she could summarize their appearance with one word, it would be cold. Each time Rena felt those eyes on her she instinctively shuddered and wanted to distance herself from those people. If those glares could kill, she would have already died countless times. The pair of eyes that were currently looking at her belonged to this category. While Rena could more or less ignore the first type of eyes on her because mostly only strangers looked at her like this, the people that were included in the second type concerned her more. They included relatives, former friends and colleagues, and her parents, unfortunately. Beep. Again, for the third time, Rena's thoughts were interrupted. This time, however, it was not her further but the horn of a car. Because of her father's order to leave, Rena was already mindlessly wandering around and was now standing in the middle of a street disturbing the traffic. Embarrassed Rena gave a quick bow to the drivers and left the street. Unfortunately for her, her actions ended without any consequences. After a while, she felt her stomach grumbling and remembered she had not eaten anything for two days. So she made her way to the next convenience store. There she grabbed a sandwich three lunch boxes to go, and four bags of potato crisps. She sighed in despair when she noticed that she could not grab a carry bag but had to ask for one from the clerk at the cash register. Rena inwardly hoped that the clerk would offer her a bag during the payment process but her hope was crushed as the clerk did not say anything. After the payment, Rena mustered all her courage and muttered quietly, CCC can I HHHH of a BBBB bag? The clerk visibly confused tilted her head. Excuse me, did you say anything? Rena paled but tried it again nevertheless. CC can I HH of a BBBB bag? Can you repeat yourself a bit louder please? By now all of the courage went out of the window, so Rena could only mutter in an even fainter voice than before. C can I HH? Even then she failed to finish her sentence and only looked down. Now the clearly annoyed Clark got louder and started shouting. I can't understand you at all. Rena flinched at the outburst and could only stare at her feet while standing still. Only after a few seconds she grabbed the sandwich and two lunch boxes and left the store, leaving everything else she already paid for and an astonished looking Clark behind. Afterwards she roamed around for a while and only paused when her stomach grumbled again. She then decided to go to the nearby park to eat. In the park, she searched for a free bench. When she found one, she sat down, opened the sandwich bag, and began to eat. After chewing for a while Rena noticed something weird in her mouth and spat the contents into her hand. In her hand, she could see the remains of the sandwich with red color mixed in it. Even though the sandwich should not have anything in it with that color, there were also two yellow-white things that looked like teeth. Only then Rena felt two gaps between teeth in her mouth and instinctively touched her face. Precisely the nose area the damage dealt was apparently more than only two lost teeth. It doesn't hurt at all. 47. Chapter 3. It was too salty. It doesn't hurt at all. That was what Rena initially thought, but after she touched her face, she felt a stinging pain from her nose to her mouth and panicked internally. 
she stood up and went to the public bathroom of the park, looking for a mirror to inspect her face. After seeing her face a sigh escaped from her mouth, Rena hated mirrors, that was why she had none in her room. She avoided mirrors with her best abilities because she did not like what they show her when she looked in. Rena thought of herself as a human, or at least she was still believing that she was a human. That was why when she stood in front of a mirror she would expect to see something human-like, but what it showed instead was an abomination, a perfectly round ball with four limbs attached to it and another, smaller ball on top of it. Thinking about it logically, the smaller ball should have been the head, but head and body were usually connected by a neck, but the version of the human when Rena looked into the mirror, had no neck. What was worse was, that each time she looked at the small ball in detail she would get the urge to vomit, but she had always managed to suppress said urge because she knew it was her own face. This time however Rena was confident that she would have vomited if her stomach was not empty. Today's version of her face with a big bruise on her cheek, a visibly broken nose, and two missing front teeth would have been too much. Rena took a towel and wiped out the blood on her mouth and left the bathroom towards the bench. She still had not eaten yet and had left her food there. Hopefully, nobody has taken it. I don't want to go to that convenience store again to buy new food. Well, considering that I wasn't long in the bathroom, the people around should know that the food belongs to me. So there's no literal way that somebody took it. They would rather kill themselves before they eat food that was touched by something like me. He he, Rena jokingly thought to lighten up her mood. And indeed, the rest of the sandwich and the two lunch boxes were still on the bench. After taking a seat Rena picked up a lunch box and began unpacking. She could not continue eating the sandwich without the two front teeth after all. The box contained rice, five pieces of small omelettes, and some vegetables. It came with a pair of disposable chopsticks so Rena should manage somehow. When she finished unpacking her lunch, she started eating while contemplating about what had happened. She picked up the first omelette piece with a bit of rice and put it in her mouth. Yesterday Rena was kicked out of the house because the boyfriend of her twin sister was visiting. Rena did not even know that her sister had won. Well, it did not surprise her as she stopped caring about Nina and their parents ages ago. Gulp. After swallowing the omelette she picked up a second one, but only because she stopped caring about them. It did not mean that she did not love them. In fact, Rena still loved her family, especially her twin. Even her father had a place in her heart despite only having bad memories of him. Gulp. This time she picked up rice with some vegetables, but she knew they would shun her as soon as they know about her disposition, so she started distancing herself from them hoping she could hide her disposition when she was a young teenager. Unfortunately instead of just being shunned. Her relationship with them developed into something much worse. Gulp. She put the third omelette piece with some vegetables in her mouth. Before, her father had already been quite violent and had very often shouted at her. But Rena concluded for herself that at those times he had valid reasons for disciplining her. Afterwards however how he treated her got worse. Around the time she reached adulthood, it had got to the point where he would simply punch, kick and shout at her without any reason and without holding back. Well, considering how Rena's body was already built back then her father probably had concluded that he did not have to worry about injuring Rena's internal organs. Fortunately, the treatment did not. Well actually could not get any worse since then so the amount of abuse Rena got pretty much remained the same since she had reached adulthood. Gulp. This time again a piece of omelette with rice. Her relationship with her mother, Najiza, though could have been considered a pretty normal, healthy mother-daughter relationship. When her mother noticed that her husband began treating their daughter more roughly, she followed suit, because she was both afraid and nevertheless still deeply in love with him. So she also started to insult and hit Rena whenever a reason arose, but as her husband's mood deteriorated over the years, so did her relationship with him. So she switched from hitting and insulting Rena to hitting, insulting, and blaming Rena for their current family state. Gulp. Rena scooped up the remaining rice and vegetables in her mouth while feeling her face heating up. As children, she and Nina were very close, they did everything together from playing to sleeping to bathing, they wore the same clothes, 
often swapping them and sharing their toys and food. When Rina was crying because their father had hit her, Nina was always there to console and hug her. Sometimes when Nina saw that their father was about to hit her sister she would even try to stop him risking being hit herself. Gulp. After putting the last omelette piece in her mouth Rina put the empty box aside and unpacked the second lunchbox. She could not help but feel scammed when she saw that this box only contained three pieces of omelettes. Their relationship changed however when both hit puberty. When they were bathing together Rina noticed that her twin's body was getting more and more feminine. At first, she was only proud that her sister would become a beautiful woman in the future but as time passed and her sister developed more curves, her thoughts changed drastically. When they bathed together Rena's body never failed to heat up which muddled her mind with dangerous thoughts. Gulp. She picked up the first omelette piece of her second lunchbox while noticing her cheeks getting wet. Rina's instinct had told her to get away from her sister. She had hoped that she would not destroy their relationship due to some impulsive actions she could not understand at that time. So she distanced herself slowly but surely from Nina. Gulp. She picked some rice and vegetables while a water drop fell into her lunch. She stopped bathing with her, denied Nina's requests for swapping clothes, and requested her mother for a separate room. Looking back Rina could only laugh at her stupid actions back then. Of course, would Nina would feel betrayed by that gulp. She next put an omelette, rice, and vegetables in her mouth. Like her mother, Nina started insulting, mocking, and blaming her for unreasonable things each time they see each other. Since then the appearance gap between them widened at a fast pace. On the one hand, Nina grew more feminine and beautiful each day. Rina felt herself becoming more and more ugly while growing horizontally. Gulp. Rina stopped reminiscing about the past and concentrated on the happenings from yesterday. Nina had a boyfriend. She stuffed her mouth full of the remaining rice and vegetables while more water droplets were falling onto the last omelette piece in her lunch box. He had probably visited for the first time. Maybe Nina wanted to introduce him to their parents. When Rina came home at dusk, he was still there. Her parents, Nina, and Nina's boyfriend were laughing loudly after all. From what she could hear, she was pretty sure they were laughing about her. Though the boyfriend probably did not know that he was mocking his lover's sister. To the rest in the room though it seemed obvious that it was about Rena. When morning came her father asked her for the keys and told her to leave. Rena did not need to be a genius to know what it meant. She was kicked out of the house naked, well except for the clothes she had on at the time, without anything. She knew that everyone in the family had seen her as the black stain of the family but she could have never imagined that they would kick her out like that. They were after all things considered still family. They still shared the same blood. If she had the courage and could see herself succeeding, she would have groveled before them begging for forgiveness for distancing herself from them, especially Nina, a long time ago. With her chopsticks, she picked up the last omelette and ate it, but now they kicked her out, seemingly not wanting to see her again, not caring about how she would survive from now on. She shook her head slowly and took a deep breath to clear her head from the current thoughts. Then with the sleeve she carefully, not wanting to hurt herself because of the broken nose, wiped her face which had gotten quite wet for some reason. Afterwards, she picked up the empty boxes and dumped them into the trash bin. She was quite content with the taste of the first lunch box she ate. After all, it was quite delicious for ready-made convenience store food. However, she was not pleased with the second box. She did not even mind that there was less food in it than in the first one. What she did however mind, was the taste. It was too salty. 48. Chapter 4, Interlude 1 to 1, Determination overshadowed by schemes. Breath breath breath. A woman was running in the middle of a bustling street at a high speed, dexterously evading all passers by while her long silver ponytail hair was fluttering behind her. The long ears and her dark skin indicated that she was a dark elf. Breath breath breath. She wore a military knight uniform. The symbols engraved on her shoulders showed that she had a pretty high rank. Those who knew her though could only smile wryly at that assumption because that person was known as Milia, the vice knight commander of this country. Usually, only nobles could become knights, 
but due to the need for military strength for upcoming events, more and more commoners gained the privilege to train and become knights. That way they could even get a noble title. Unlike their noble counterparts, their titles were non-hereditary, as they were however only meant as cannon fodder for the event. Becoming a knight was the last step on the military career ladder. All that only made Milia more special because she was the first commander with a non-hereditary title. When she became the vice commander the higher-ups assigned her an adjutant who would teach her noble etiquette so she would not embarrass herself and the country. An undignified commander would make the country look bad after all. That was why her adjutant would cough up blood when she saw Milia running in the middle of the street. Luckily Milia was so fast that the untrained eye of a civilian could not perceive her if they did not concentrate on her movements. And even if her adjutant found out about her undignified actions, Milia would escape scolding this time. She had a good reason. Important information to be delivered to the king as fast as possible. Arriving at the royal palace she ignored the saluting guards and made her way to the audience hall. Without knocking she opened the large door to the throne and audience room hall, walked in, and kneeled down in front of the throne. On the said throne sat an old man with white hair. Even though it was apparent that he was in the last part of his life, he still had a gentle and dignified expression on his face. Seeing Milia his mouth formed a subtle but affectionate smile. In contrast, however, the ministers who stood around the king all grimaced and twitched their eyes in irritation. Before they could complain Milia spoke up. Your Majesty, I have an important message from the temple to deliver. Milia glanced around her and saw that she succeeded in stopping their intention to complain as they kept quiet. Amu, then let us hear the message. Ha, Milia continued, the high priestess had found a person with the highest hero affinity so far. Ooh. Her surrounding was clearly excited, they had seemingly forgotten that they were supposed to be irritated a few seconds ago, that is excellent news. Vice Commander Milia, bring him in so we can enroll him in the Knight Academy. Milia looked down, hesitated for a second, then looked back up at the king. Sadly, that person is in another world. The king frowned when he heard this, after a few seconds. Milia continued. The High Priestess has a solution. She concluded that as long as the connection to that world is not cut, she may open a portal to it. So we can fetch the hero candidate. However firstly, the ritual to open the gate will take at least one week. Secondly, Milia took a deep breath to calm herself. She will never be able to cast magic again afterwards. While the king grimaced, his ministers around him could barely contain their joy. We cannot have that. The High Priestess is one of the most important persons with her powers in our country. We must look for another solutio. Ahem, your majesty. One of the ministers interrupted him. Milia was irritated that they would always scold her for being undignified. But on the other hand, they would interrupt the king when they want. Unbeknownst to her thoughts the minister went on. I can understand your concerns. Even though I will not be able to sleep at night because of it. We have to do the ritual. It does not only concern our country but also the whole world. Sacrifices like the magic powers of the High Priestess must be made. Upon hearing this Milia could only cough up blood internally. Of course, they won't be able to sleep at night. After all those old bastards would celebrate all night when Fran loses her powers. For the ministers, the elite of the noble society, High Priestess Fran with her enormous magic powers was a thorn. To solve an oncoming crisis the current king Thor Miraculan the 37th, known as the Wiseman, made education free for all including commoners, and allowed them to visit the renowned military academy. Furthermore, he invented non-hereditary noble titles, allowing commoners to become knights, thus weakening the nobles while strengthening the commoners. Unfortunately, the king was too popular, so the nobles could not stop him from doing as he liked. As a result, Milia rose to the top of their military while Fran was now the official leader of the temple, so the ministers could barely hide their joy from showing when they learned that High Priestess Fran, a former commoner, would lose her powers. They had no doubt, that without her powers, the current High Priestess would lose her position. After thinking for a while the king asked Milia, is there anything else we should know? Yes, your majesty. The high priestess told me four people will be able to cross the portal. Furthermore, 
she estimated that she should be able to uphold the portal for around two to three days, but she also told me as soon as the fourth person crossed it the portal will close automatically. Do you have a suggestion? I think we should send one person in to fetch the potential hero. We have to guard the portal and the high priestess with our night orders until that person comes back with the candidate. A strong person should go though. We have no information on the other side of the portal after all, Amu. The king nodded and stretched out his hand. Knight Commander Rick will go and pick that hero candidate up. Tell him to prepare. And also tell the high priestess to start with the ritual immediately as you wish your majesty. Before Milia could stand up and leave one of the ministers spoke up. Wait. Your majesty. I think it would be wise to send a second person with the knight commander. After thinking a bit the king visibly frowned but nodded his head nevertheless. I see. You want a person to guard the portal on the other side to prevent it from closing. At that assumption the minister? No, all ministers smirked. As expected from you, your majesty. They don't call you the wise man for nothing. If I may be so rude, I would like to suggest vice knight commander Milia. She can rival Knight Commander Rick in fighting prowess and should be viable to guard the portal on the other side. Upon hearing that Milia gritted her teeth, she was not stupid and knew the risk of only sending one person but still inwardly hoped for the luck that nobody on the other side would see and cross the portal. She was also sure that the ministers would try getting rid of her that way. Well in fact they just did. The king seemingly not knowing any alternatives looked in Milia's eyes with a sad face and bowed his head. Normally it was unheard of if a king bowed his head to one of his subjects, but considering what he was about to order Milia, he was not overly concerned about norms. Vice Knight Commander Milia, I order you to go with Knight Commander Rick and fetch that hero candidate. Please, save our world. Milia closed her eyes and took a deep breath. After calming down she looked with a smile at the king and saluted, as you wish, your majesty. She stood up, gave a deep bow, and left the hall with determined but slightly wet A's. And so she left the royal palace and looked for her friends and family to say goodbye. She would never ever see them again after all. Even Milia could see whether she or the knight commander was more important to the country. In a castle on the highest mountain in the world, a woman dressed like a maid walked along a wide corridor. She had two black thin wings sprouting out of her back. A bit further below them, a long thin black tail with a heart shape at its end swayed left and right as she went forward. When she arrived at a big door with a red round magic sigil with a diameter of two meters, she stretched out her hand and poured her mana into the sigil causing it to dissolve. Afterwards, she opened the door and stepped inside. In the center of the room was a king-sized bed with a little girl about one meter height lying on top of it. Except for the two small horns on the left and right side of her head above her pointy ears that girl looked like a human child. The maid walked up to the bed and kneeled down. In that instant, the eyes of the girl shot open. She straightened up, stretched her small, short arms into the air, and let a drawn-out yawn escape her mouth. Yawn is it time already? Yes. My lady, the Valkyria kingdom has found a potential hero that could kill you. Kukaku. Well then, proceed as planned. Ha. Huh? The maid bowed and left the room. When she was alone, a small smirk formed on the face of the little girl. Kukaku. I can't wait. Finally. 48. Chapter 5. Interlude 1 to 2. Wasted efforts. A large crowd had gathered around the main temple in the capital of the Valkyria kingdom. Their size was estimated to be in the tens of thousands. While most of them were spectators, citizens of the capital, the closer you got to the center, the more knights you could see guarding the temple. Inside the temple at the center of the main hall, a woman was kneeling down on a slightly elevated platform. Both of her hands were clasped in front of her chest forming a praying gesture. Her eyes were closed and her head was tilted upwards facing the sky, well or rather the ceiling of the building, causing her open, long and blonde hair to touch the ground. Her name was Fran. She was the current high priestess of the temple. Around her, approximately a hundred knights were watching their surroundings. Among them was Vice Knight Commander Milia. Over the last week besides saying goodbye to her family and friends, 
Milia spent nearly the whole time guarding High Priestess Fran during her ritual and tending to her daily needs. The ritual to open the portal to the world where the hero candidate was, was about to be completed. So the security was especially tight today. Next to her stood Knight Commander Rick, while Milia's knight attire primarily contained clothes with a leather patch round her chest area, as her fighting style with her rapier was focused on speed, Rick wore full-plated armor. His fighting style was to tank hits from enemies and decapitate them with his huge two-handed sword on his back with one slash, so his full-body armor made sense. Milia concluded for herself that the only reason he had a higher rank than her was that he was the perfect counter to her style as her light, speed-focused thrusts dealt no damage to him. Thus she stood no chance against him in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Well, that and the fact that he was a bona fide noble with a hereditary title, HNNGGH, with a light groan. Fran drew all eyes of her surrounding on her. A massive amount of mana left her body gathered in front of her. Normally only those who are sensitive to magic could see the mana flow of a magic cast but with that amount, even an untrained civilian eye could perceive the mana. Fran did not reach the top of the temple despite being a commoner for nothing after all. After swirling around for a few seconds the mana slowly formed a slightly transparent, dark-colored gate. It was about three meters high and two meters wide. Rick looked around and when he confirmed that nobody was moving, he made his way to the portal, closely followed by his vice. When he crossed the portal, Milia stopped and glanced towards Fran. She was breathing hard from having to uphold the portal. Seeing that Milia suspected that the longer the portal stayed open the more detrimental it would be for Fran's health. She and Rick had to find the hero candidate as fast as possible. She turned towards the gate again and as she was about to step in, she heard a commotion around her. Before she could perceive what was happening, someone had grabbed her hand and pulled her away from the gate. The person who also wore an eye to but with a helm sprinted towards the gate and stepped in. Panicking, she looked around to see that the knights were also confused about what had happened. Milia approached the gate again while inwardly cursing her colleagues for not stopping that night beforehand. Now that two persons had already passed the portal. It could only carry two more. One of them should of course be the potential hero while the last one the knight commander. But now as an unknown person was on the other side instead of her, Milia had only two choices. The first one was to stay back and hope that the unknown intruder was actually a nice person who just wanted to spare Milia from the gruesome fate of being stranded in the other world for the rest of her life. It was clear to her. However, that that knight had malicious intentions. It was possible that Rick could kill the potential saboteur and carry out their plans alone, but was it worth risking the fate of the world for that hope? No. They had to bring the candidate to this world at all costs. So the second option was for Milia to enter the portal nevertheless stranding both the knight commander and herself in the other world. With no choices left Milia entered the portal or rather tried to enter the portal as somebody once again pulled her back and jumped into it. This time the person was too fast as Milia could only perceive a shadowy blur crossing the gate. As she looked around again she could only see dumbfounded faces. This time however she could not reproach them internally because that figure was even for her eyes too fast. Now she, the surrounding knights and the world can only pray for Knight Commander Rick and hope that he would see their mission to the end successfully. After stepping out of the portal Rick placed his right hand on the handle of the two-handed sword on his back, carefully observing his surroundings. There were four walls around and a ceiling above him which indicated that he was in a room. Noticing a man standing in the corner with a knife hiding a woman and two little children behind him while trembling, Rick could only smile fondly under his helmet. He also had a family at home and could imagine himself doing the same. Well, it was not needed anymore as his children were already adults and had offspring themselves. He let go of the handle, raised both hands into the air, and slowly walked up to them to show that he had no ill will. When he wanted to speak up to see whether or not they could understand him, he suddenly felt a sharp pain in his abdomen. Looking down he saw a magic-infused sword coming out of his stomach. Before he could grab the sword with his hands, it disappeared causing him more pain. Afterwards, 
He was kicked on his back which resulted in him tumbling forward with his combat and pain handling experience. He managed to prevent himself from falling over and turned around to see a person in a night attire holding magic infused sword that had sliced through his armor like butter. Leaving no openings, the assailant thrust the sword forward piercing Rick's chest, who had barely managed to tilt his body resulting in the sword missing his heart by only a few centimeters. Clenching his teeth to bear the pain, with his left hand he quickly grabbed the hand of the assailant while gripping his two-handed sword on his back with his right hand. Summoning all his strength, the knight commander swung his right arm down and split the attacker in half. Kaya, ignoring the scream from probably the children or the woman Rick slumped down while fighting over his pain. He had to prevail here and bring back the hero candidate to save the world where his beloved family lived. As he was about to calm down and tried to get up to leave the house in search of the hero candidate, a female voice rang behind him. Ho ho, as expected of the knight commander of the Valkyria kingdom, the strongest human alive, you are tough! Exclamation mark. Rick reached for his sword but before he could swing in backwards, a hand burst out from his chest. He only managed to look down to see a hand grasping a heart before he lost consciousness, but unfortunately not tough enough. Pulling the hand out of the corpse of the former knight commander the figure glanced at the present people confirming they were cowering in fear in the corner of the room. She then concentrated her mana in her hand and formed a small seal on her palm. Afterwards, she slammed her hand on the floor and pasted the sigil on it. Without any comments, she made her way to the window and jumped out. Landing outside she walked away from the house for a while before. Kaboom! It exploded leaving only debris behind. After concentrating on her sensory senses she confirmed that no souls were left in the ruins and continued with the mission given to her by the demon lord. As it was currently dark outside she concluded that nobody here could recognize her exact form so she put off her invisibility cloak revealing a pair of black wings and a thin tail with a heart at its end to the world. In her world, she belonged to a special demon race that was famous for its sensor skills, the succubi. Once again she concentrated her mana on her sensory senses. This time she searched for a soul that had the potential to kill her master. Fortunately. There was only one soul in this world that met the condition, and it was nearby. So she quickly jumped onto the roof of the nearest building and made her way to the soul. A few minutes of roof to roof jumping later, she was standing on top of the building facing the house where the soul she was looking for resided. Spying through the window she could recognize a somewhat plump woman on a chair relieving herself. In contrast to her actions though. The eyes of that woman did not reflect any pleasure at all. In fact, they reflected nothing at all. It was as if they were the eyes of a dead fish. The strangeness caused the succubus to activate the second layer of her sensor skills which allowed her to see the attributes of souls. Upon seeing them the succubus mouth formed into a wide, fierce, and thirsty grin. My lady will be very satisfied by this, she murmured while wiping out the drool from her mouth. Forty-one. Chapter 6, They Just Don't Stop Flowing After discarding empty packages in the trash bin, Rena sat down on the bench again and sighed internally. What should she do now? Where would she live? Renting an own apartment? No. It was impossible. She could not even talk to the clerk normally, so could she imagine negotiating a contract with the landlord? What a joke. What about staying with a friend? Hee hee, what is a friend? Can you eat it? Is it tasty? What about her former colleagues? It was not too long ago since she had quit her job. Although it took almost two years before she was able to converse normally with some of her colleagues, Rena was also aware of how they perceived her. They all dumped their work on her, and as they saw that Rena managed to get it done on time, they gave her more and more. As Rena was very efficient at what she did, she ended up doing practically all the work that four or five people would do, all by herself, until she finally quit her job. So again. What about her former colleagues? Rena shook her head to clear her mind of that thought. Then what about going back home? Maybe if she groveled at her father's feet, he would forgive her for whatever she had done wrong. 
Yeah, he, stupid Rena, save your dreams for sleep. She was positive that his fist would find its way to her face very quickly. So, drip drip, with seemingly no way out. Drip drip drip, of her current situation. Drip 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 drip, what else was left for her to do? What? But to wail in despair? And so she cried, her face tilted up to the sky. Her eyes rolled in the back of her head, tears falling down to the ground like a waterfall, snot running from her broken nose to her mouth. The emotions she had held in all these years burst out of her like a dam. Wah, wah, wah. Ignoring all the eyes of the people around her she kept wailing, as if she had to get all the bad stuff out of her system, the shame she suffered when people laughed at her. The helplessness she endured when she could not even mutter a word when talking to strangers, the physical pain she experienced when her father had hit her, the regret she felt when she distanced herself from her sister, the pain in her heart when her mother had blamed her for all the bad things, and most of all, the hatred she felt for her entire existence. Why could she not be like other people? Why did she fall in love with her sister? Why was she unable to make friends? Why could she not converse normally with strangers as others could? And why was there no one in the world, not even herself, who had loved her? So she kept on crying, for hours, until dusk came. Sniff sniff. Even then she was still sobbing, but at least she was calm enough to see that it was getting dark. Usually when she was too stressed out or needed to settle down from a stressful event she would either firstly, well, relieve herself while reading a smart novel, or secondly eat lots of food, or lastly escape into an imaginary world of a novel. The first choice was, due to obvious reasons, currently out of the question, the second was not viable for Ina either. Mostly, when she was eating, she had never had negative thoughts. Her mind was usually focused on stuffing her mouth with food after all. Today, however, eating had the opposite effect. One depressing thought after another poured into her head as if there were no tomorrow. In the end, for the second time in her life, she even cried while eating. Once, when she was nine years old, her father had punished her for a reason that she was no longer able to remember. He had forbidden her to eat for seven days, halfway through when Rena could not endure her hunger any longer. Her twin Nina gave Rena half of her food when her father was not looking. As Rena ate and thanked her sister with tears in her eyes, Nina wiped them away with her sleeve and comforted her in a soft, almost motherly voice. Rena, eat slowly, don't cry. Don't you know? If you eat and cry, you won't be able to eat when you grow up. So stop crying. You can do it later when I hug you. Looking back at this memory she could not help but notice how mature her nine-year-old sister was at that time. Nevertheless, in Rena's heart, it was one of the fondest memories of her life, even though she was starving at the time. From that moment on, she never cried while eating again. Until today, that is. So the only option left to her was the last one, to escape into an imaginary world. She took out her phone and searched for a novel about her favorite subject heroes. As far as she could remember she had always looked up to them, those who are strong in body and mind and would always come to the rescue of those in need, those who give their all, even sacrificing their own bodies, to protect young children, asking only for their smiles in return, those who can bear any injury with a smile, so that those they protect behind their backs will never lose theirs, and those who will never cry, so that those who look up to them will not despair. But Rena did more than just admire them. She aspired to be a hero herself. She who was confident in her mental strength because she had managed to live through her life so far. She who took all the blows from her father to keep him from targeting her twin. She who could smile even with a broken nose. Were it not for that last fact, she would have all the qualities needed to be a hero. It was just those tears. They just don't stop flowing. 40. Chapter 7. It's not that I was hopeful anyway, the most important trait for a hero was to never cry, no matter the pain he was going through, otherwise, the people they were supposed to protect would lose hope, as Rena's tears kept pouting out of her eyes, she was automatically disqualified from becoming a hero herself, it was close though, were it not for the last point, it would have been possible for Rena to become a hero, not, he he, 
Rina could only chuckle at herself as she really believed in delusion for a long time, as if she had any of the traits a typical hero in those novels had. She was confident in her mental strength, because of what she had experienced so far? Did it still count when she had escaped going insane by eating, masturbating, and reading hero novels? Her physical strength? With her body? She had surrendered her body as a punching bag for her father to protect Nina from that fate? As if, Nina was, in contrast to her, loved by her parents. They would never do anything that could hurt Nina. So Rina had sacrificed nothing and protected nobody. She was only her father's outlet for stress relief and could do nothing about it. What about smiling while enduring pain to bring hope to the surroundings? In the past, during her further beating session, she had always had a small smile on her face. Ironically, this was misinterpreted by her further and the beatings became more severe. So does that count? If her mechanical dry smile combined with dark, dead fish-like eyes filled with despair can give hope to the protected, then sure, why not? Rena shook her head at that thought. She knew it all along. She just did not want to realize it until now. She never had any traits, attributes, or affinity whatsoever to be a hero, and never will. Not that it would matter. Even if she had all the listed hero traits, she would not be a hero. Why? Again, Rena knew it all along. She kept telling herself how nice it would be to become a hero. Deep down though she had never aspired to be a hero. Even if a gun was pointed at her and she was threatened to become one, she would refuse. Why would she want to use her body to protect strangers from danger while asking for nothing in return? That would be beyond stupid, not only for her but probably also for the rest of the world. But that was a problem for her. It would mean that there were no heroes in reality that they were only products of someone's imagination. But, this also meant there were no heroes who would pull Rena out of her misery. That's right. She never wanted to rescue, she wanted to be rescued, but she kept telling herself otherwise. After all, only people with noble hearts deserve to be saved. So she started sobbing. After one minute it developed into crying, after five into wailing, and so she kept on wailing for one hour, two hours three hours, until, miss, are you okay? A soft female voice interrupted her. In an instant, she stopped crying and looked up. What she saw, caused her mind to stop working. A woman with long, waist long, black hair stood in front of her. She wore an office suit which indicated that she was on her way home from her late work shift. Even though her suit had probably multiple layers of clothing, Rena could clearly see her slender figure. The woman's breasts were neither too small nor too big and the curves on her waist were just right. Frankly put, that woman in front of her was absolutely her type. Unaware of the mayhem in Rena's head, the woman approached and wiped the tears and snot from Rena's face with a handkerchief. Ouch! The stinging pain brought Rena back from her dazed state when the handkerchief touched her broken nose. I'm sorry, did I hurt you? The office lady apologized in a slightly panicked voice. N N N N O I I I I H H H have a B B Brock cake N N N N nose. I see. Why is your nose broken? M M M M I F F F F further H H H hit M M me. After hearing that, the woman's killing intent flared up for a fraction of a second. Luckily, she managed to suppress it instantly before Rena could notice. Looking at the plump girl's state, the woman could not imagine what Rena's upbringing had been like, as her eyes were darting around nervously, clearly uncomfortable with the current situation. Not being able to stand it anymore the lady grabbed Rena's hand and spoke softly, come with me for a bit. Meanwhile, Rena's mind was entering the next phase of haywire. WWW what is happening? Where is she leading me? Ah, her hands are so soft. And I know what are you thinking Rena? Ah, she smells so nice. Stupid. Since discovering her sexuality, Rena had never had any contact with girls. Thus she had never had the chance to build up any resistance to physical contact with other women. So as Rena was now, even H. Lilding H. N. D. S. was enough for her imagination to go wild. As a result, Rena's expression alternated between blushing, paling, and shaking her head the whole way the lady led them. She had even failed to notice the Love Hotel sign on the building they were entering. 
Reno would be in a daze forever. Clap. Were it not for the loud clap of the office lady which pulled her back to reality. Looking around Rena could see that they were in a small room. In the middle of the room was a red, heart-shaped bed with two red heart-shaped pillows on it. WWW where a a a r w w we? You didn't notice the sign when we entered? We're in a love hotel room. WWWY? The office lady tilted her head. You are having a hard time in that park, so I brought you here. Am I bothering you? The unsure look on the woman's face prompted Rena to instantly shake her head. Great. Well, wait for me for a bit. I want to take a bath first before we do it. D D D do W W W what? Rena asked confused. At that question the woman smiled at Rena, causing her to blush. Then she seductively licked her lips. S E X, of course, and entered the bathroom, leaving a dumbfounded Rena behind. It took a while for Rena's brain to start working again. Sex. Never in her life had Rena heard a word that had such a beautiful ring in it. What could it mean? The woman made it sound like it was an activity. Was it something that could only be done in heaven? Was she in heaven already? She was joking, obviously. Of course, Rena knew what it meant. It just made no sense for her. Why would someone so beautiful like the office lady want to have sex with her? Could it be that she wanted her? Of course not. She just wanted to mock Rena because of her plump body, because of her ugly face, and because of her naivety. Rena did follow a stranger absent-mindedly after all. Maybe taking a bath was just the woman's pretext to get out of Rena's sight for a while. For example to call her friends to come and harass, maybe even torture Rena together. But it's okay. Rena just had to bear it. After all, it was not the first time she had found herself in such a situation. And on the bright side, it meant that she would not have to sleep outside. Clack. After a while, the bathroom door opened and the woman stepped out. This time wearing a seductive, semi-transparent negligee that covered only the most important parts of her body. Looking at Rena, who was bright red, she licked her lips and slowly walked towards her. I'm ready. Now let's have fun, comma the woman whispered into Rena's ears, while pushing her down on the bed. WWWYMMM me. I fell in love with you at first sight. Your cute face, your plum belly, those thick thighs. I want to make you mine. The lady said as she ran her hands over Rena's body as she lay beneath her. LLL lies. That was all Rena could mutter, which caused the woman above her to frown. It's not nice of you to accuse someone of lying, who had just confessed her love to you. After seeing no response from Rena, she continued, Well, then let me prove it to you. With that, the woman skillfully undressed Rena layer by layer until she was naked. Then with a swift movement, she spread Rena's legs and with an outstretched tongue moved closer to the now open groin. She is going to lick me down there. To Rena with more than 20 years experience of being a virgin, sex was more than just giving physical pleasure to each other. It's the act of showing the ugliest part of oneself to someone while accepting their entire existence. As someone who was starving for love. She was confident that she could accept anybody, be it her sister, a friend, a stranger, a thief, a rapist, a murderer, or even a man, as long as they would love her, she could manage somehow, but such a person does not exist, that was what she had thought, until now, that was why this situation was so special for her, that she stopped thinking straight, she closed her eyes, before she could feel physical pleasure, her heart was already filled with joy she was going to be loved, there was salvation for her after all, and her partner was an extremely hot woman, it was finally time for her to become happy, what would their future look like, she seemed to be an office worker who had high pay, but Rena thought that she should have some income too, maybe her old workplace would accept her again, after all, they knew that Rena was a very hard-working person who never shied away from overtime. And so, while imagining the future with her soon-to-be wife, she waited for the tongue to touch her pussy. One second elapsed. Then five. Then thirty. P F F F F F. Ha 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 ha. What is with that face? Ha 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 ha. Cough cough ah. I'm dying from too much laughing. You are too obvious, Piggy. You should do something about your delusions. As if I would have sex with someone. 
No, something like you. Ha 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 ha. Know your place. R. Yes, that's the face I wanted to see. There is nothing more delicious than the despair of someone who just thought they had won the jackpot. Now then, the woman stepped next to Rena, who lay motionlessly on the bed, pierced her torso with her arm, and pulled it out again. Maybe you have better luck in your next life, Piggy. With that, she left the dying Rena behind and left the room through the window. This should not be surprising anymore, should it? Rena was right all along. There was no one on the whole planet who had some love for her. That woman was just a honey trap to despair and to kill her. But why? Had her further commissioned it? Who knows? But it did not matter anymore. She was going to die soon. It's just death. Nothing to be sad about. Who was to blame? Nobody but herself. That's what she got for having expectations. That's what she got for hoping for something good to happen. That's what she got for longing for love. You should not wish for something that is out of reach. It will only disappoint you. As Rena felt her consciousness fading, she thought as if to convince herself for the very last time. It's not that I was hopeful anyway. 47. Chapter 8- We love you. Rena. With one last look at the dying Rena, the woman in the negligee jumped out of the window onto the roof of the neighboring building. After confirming that nobody was present to witness her, she deactivated her magic spell. Two black wings slowly sprouted out of her back and a long, thin tail with a heart-shaped end grew out of her ear, while the negligee she was wearing, transformed into a maid's outfit. Her name is Serena a loyal retainer and personal maid of the demon lord. To inform her master of the success of her mission, Serena formed a small seal with her index finger and held it to her right ear. After a few seconds, a child's voice came out of the seal. Serena, my lady, it's done. And, you will be highly satisfied, my lady. Kukakaku, laughter rang out from the seal. That's good to hear. Give me a moment. I'll summon you back to our world. Serena, if you want to say something, then do it. My lady, would you please wait a bit? Why? Serena clenched her left fist. There is someone I have to kill. Serena. Yes, my lady? You know, that it's mainly thanks to him? Yes. Serena could perceive a loud sigh coming out of the seal. Very well. You have my permission. I give you thirty minutes. After that, I'll summon you no questions asked. Are we clear? Serena? Yes, my lady. And thank you. Be careful. With that, the seal on Serena's finger disappeared and the connection to her master was cut. Immediately after, she activated her senses to locate her target and headed for it. Her destination, Rena's former home. Meanwhile in the Valkyria kingdom, Milia was kneeling before the king, surrounded by a bunch of high-ranking nobles. She knew her future was grim as all the nobles around her were grinning from ear to ear. Two days had passed since the incident during the ritual to retrieve the hero candidate from another world. A few minutes after night Commander Rick and the two intruders had entered the portal, it suddenly dispersed which caused High Priestess Fran to collapse and fall into a coma. As a result, the potential hero could no longer come to save this world. Since then the king and his ministers had gathered to discuss how to proceed and how to punish Milia. As one of the leading figures who had organized the security for the ritual, she had no doubt that she was one of the most responsible for the failure. As the political situation of the Valkyria kingdom was now, she would not come out of this unscathed. In this country, the king usually held all the power and had the last word in every decision, whether it was making laws, judging crimes, or commanding the military. However, after the failed ritual, the tide turned in favor of the aristocrats. As the two remaining protagonists, Vice Knight Commander Milia and High Priestess Fran, both commoners, only came to power through a law enforced by the king. He was also partly responsible for the failure. Thus, Milia concluded, the king was no longer able to protect her from the noble's ploy, who had undoubtedly forced their verdict concerning her on the king. She was sure the gallows awaited her. Vice Knight Commander Milia, I will announce your verdict. The king spoke up in a monotonous voice. Yes, your majesty. 
You have failed in your mission to fetch the hero candidate and thus made our chances to overcome the upcoming crisis considerably worse. You are hereby dismissed as the Vice Knight Commander. You are to go to the Royal Knight Academy to train our new recruits as a teacher. Redeem yourself by training our future soldiers. Shocked Milia looked up at the king. She was not the only one though. The surrounding nobles were quite surprised as well, probably not expecting him to ignore their suggestion. Your Majs. Furthermore, the king continued before any minister could object, High Priestess Fran will be not accounted for the failure whatsoever. I will take full responsibility. He paused and took a deep breath. Thus, I, King Thor Miracle and the 37th, hereby step down as the king and pass the throne to my son, Crown Prince Loki. At the same time as King Thor Miracle and the 37th denounced this throne, a new life was born in a small temple on the outskirts of the royal capital. A sister carried the newborn baby to its mother, who was breathing weakly on the bed and laid it on the pillow next to her. Madame, congratulations, it's a healthy girl, said the sister, who received a slight nod in return. Afterwards, she stepped back and waited quietly in a corner of the room. The fact that the baby was not crying, was strange, but since it was breathing, she did not mind. There were more pressing matters at hand after all. The woman, the baby's mother, was dying after giving birth, so she had to give them some time to communicate for the first and last time in the baby's life. The baby's mother slowly turned her head towards her child, with all the strength she had left in her body. She lifted her hand and gently poked the cheek of her daughter, while the tears welled up in her eyes. It broke her heart to think that this child would have to live without her parents, but she could no longer hold on to life. She had always had a weak body, but her condition worsened after her beloved husband died in a demon attack while protecting her and their child, who was already in her womb at that time. Nevertheless, she fought through the depression of her loss and the physical pain her body had caused, and held on to life to this day so she, their, baby could see the world but any longer was already impossible. So, with tears streaming from her eyes, the woman summoned all her strength for the last time in her life to tell her daughter everything that was on her mind. Dear, I'm so sorry that neither your father nor I are here to see you grow, please, dear. Eat well and sleep well. It's important for your health. Don't forget to study and train your body. You will need knowledge and strength to survive cough, she spat out blood, make lots of friends, cough, hold on them and protect them, because this seemingly gruesome world, is much, much more beautiful with them, cough cough cough, find a good boy, fall in love, find someone you can share your life together with, cough, but look out for bad guys, as you will be at least as beautiful as I am, he he he, a lot of them will flock around you, so be careful, cough. By the way, girls are fine too. He he he. Your mother appreciates love in all forms. Cough cough. Don't give in to bullies. You don't need to endure it. If you have to defend yourself, then do it. Please be happy. Laugh a lot. Cry a lot. Worry a lot. Experience all kinds of emotions. Cough. And dear, I'm sorry that I have to leave you alone. But always keep in mind. Your father and I. Cough cough cough. She caressed her daughter's cheek. We love you, Rena. 50. Chapter 9. After all, knowledge of the world is essential for survival. In a forest near to the village of Mauser on the outskirts of the royal capital, a small, thin, malnourished looking girl was hiding on a tree, with her blazing red eyes matching her shoulder length hair. She stared down at the boar on the ground, that had chased her just moments ago. She took out a small knife that she had struck off borrowed from a tool merchant in her home village, jumped down from her tree onto the boar, and stabbed it in the neck, killing it instantly. Opening her palm she gathered a small amount of mana which formed into a small black colored seal and slapped it on the boar. She then lifted the animal, which by the way looked like it would weigh about 100 kilograms, with both slender arms and headed for her home. Usually her actions were an impossible feat for a seven-year-old child like her. It was only possible because she possessed the memories of her past life in which she, funnily enough, was also called Rena. 
but it was not that she was particularly knowledgeable, skilled, strong, or overpowered in any other way in her previous life. Quite the opposite. She was a fat ass shut in who knew nothing about the world. It was her mature mind that allowed her to perceive the world around her much earlier than normal children, giving her a head start in practically everything. For example, from the sisters in the orphanage talking, she learned that magic existed, so from very early on she regularly sneaked into the local temple's library to learn as much as she could about this world called Yildos, such as the language, the history, and most importantly, the magic system. While she mastered the language very quickly, there was only one language in Yildos. It was the latter two that intrigued her more. Beginning with the magic system, it was divided into six different main elements, fire, water, wind, earth, light, and dark. Each of these could be further broken down into sub-elements such as thunder in wind or ice in water. Generally speaking, specialized magic was harder to cast than its basic counterpart so ice-based spells were harder to use than water-based spells. Activating a spell usually involved three steps. In Yildos, every living being has a certain amount of mana, which always restores itself after usage over time. The first step, also called loading phase, was to gather the mana inside the body and pour it out through a body part. While most could only use their hands, there were some special cases where they could use other parts of their body for that such as their mouths. There was a famous noble family of knights, all of whom could breathe fire with their mouths instead of shooting fireballs with their hands in the Valkyria kingdom. The second step was to imagine the spell and form its magic circle with the mana. Usually one would have to chant the spell because it helped tremendously in creating the seal, but thanks to the memories of her past life, Rena could easily skip this part in fights. It would prove beneficial for her, because chanting the spell would give the opponent information about the next attack. The fact that the scholars called this the chanting phase indicated that it was not yet known that the chanting itself was not essential at all. The third and last step was the activation phase. As the name suggests, this is where the magic is activated, and was generally considered the easiest of the three, as it required no further work from the user. However, while most spells don't require any mana input at this stage, some continuous spells do in order to remain active. As stated earlier, every creature had a mana source inside them. However, this did not automatically mean that everybody could cast all spells. The ability to activate a specific spell was tied to two conditions. Firstly, you had to have the right affinity to cast a particular spell. For example, a knight who only possessed the wind element would never be able to use fireball. Secondly, you had to be able to successfully process all three phases of the spell. If you did not possess the required amount of mana or did not know the exact formula of its magic circle, the cast would ultimately fail. So in the end, it all depended on whether one was born with the innate abilities needed and was willing enough to learn the magic formulas or not. What Rena also managed to learn during her early childhood, was that the element of a spell and the color of its magic seal seemed to correspond to each other. From what she had seen, she concluded that red circles belong to fire, blue to water, green to wind, brown to earth, yellow to light, and black to dark, as for their use. While the first four elements were obvious to her, and while she suspected that light probably had something to do with healing, she could not completely grasp the dark element, even though she was able to use it herself. The only thing she knew, for now, was that her magic had probably something to do with gravity manipulation since she had used it to reduce the boar's weight. After all, none of the records she had read, had mentioned anything about dark magic, except that it was an element exclusive to demon races and light element only to human races. But that did not mean that she was a demon. Immediately after learning about that, she had looked up her family tree in her parents' house and confirmed that she was, biologically speaking, a blooded human. And from what she had read in her mother's diary, it seemed unlikely that her mother had cheated on her father, as they were both deeply in love with each other. What it did mean, however, 
was that she had to refrain from using her dark magic in public at all costs. Only witch hunts and death would await her if anyone found out her affinity, as they would undoubtedly accuse her of being a demon in disguise. For now, she concluded, she needed other ways to defend herself in public. At first, she thought that magic might still be possible if she had an affinity for a second element, but later she learned that this was impossible because every living being can only use one element which was determined from birth. So at that time, she had left the decision making of how to defend herself in the presence of others to her future self. Apart from her self-taught magic lessons, she had also looked up the history of Yildos, or rather of the country she was currently in, the Valkyria Kingdom and could only groan at it. Seven years ago, around the same time of her birth, the policies of the Valkyria kingdom suddenly changed in every conceivable way, when King Loki Miraculan the 38th ascended the throne. He reversed every law that his father, King Thor, the wise man, had created to strengthen the commoners, and made the country once again centered on the nobility. Since then, the situation of the commoners gradually grew worse. Now it had reached the stage where young girls and women had to sell themselves for food, while boys and men had to work themselves to the bone for nothing worthwhile, not to mention the newborns and orphans who were killed as soon as food became scarce. Rena only survived because she was born a few years earlier and because she escaped from the orphanage some time ago when she saw her fellow orphans being murdered one by one. On the other hand most, of the aristocrats about 90% of them, had grown tremendously width-wise, especially the men. Rina had seen one once when he had visited the village of Mausa to collect taxes. It somehow reminded her of her old self, when she was still on earth. It was a horrible sight. While there might still be some decent nobles, it was apparent to her that most of them were corrupt and only thought of their own gain. She could only shake her head inwardly when she thought of the downfall of some of the western countries on earth during the Middle Ages. Back to the main topic. The root cause of King Loki's law reversal was probably the failed hero summoning ritual seven years ago. He and the nobles used the fact that the two main responsible for the failure, Milia and Fran, were commoners to propagate against the former king's laws. In the end, he succeeded. Even the common folk turned away from Thor at that time. It only showed how much the success of the ritual weighed on their mind and how much hope that potential solution gave them. Despair always comes after expectations. Well, it was not like this was a surefire way to avert the incoming doom. Rina could only roll her eyes at that development when she had read about it in the past. Continuing with the impending crisis, ancient records that she had looked through mentioned a demon lord, who would appear a thousand years after his death and gather all demon races and monsters under his banner to terrorize the human races like the high elves, dark elves, and humans once again. The last time such a being emerged was nearly a millennium ago. At that time a man named Gaius Miraculan killed the demon lord and founded the Valkyria kingdom next to the demon lord's domain as the first line of defense for the future. Thanks to this, he is now known as Hero King Gaius Miraculan I. As the threat approaches once again, King Thor developed several countermeasures to prepare for the incoming invasion. The most prominent and controversial of these was without any doubt the opening up of education and military training, which had previously been exclusive for the nobility, to all. Former King Thor's aim was to have as many competent people as possible available to stand against the demonic forces and indeed it worked. Countless capable people among the commoners graduated from the academies, among them, a high elf named Fran. With her extensive knowledge of magic and her enormous capabilities for it, she rose to the top of the temple in record time and devised a solution to the impending crisis. By bringing in a potential hero with the skills to kill the demon lord from another world. As already mentioned, unfortunately, that plan had failed miserably. Now under the new leadership, all nobles in the country were looking for those with magic affinities to take, or rather force, them under their tutelage as their own private force. The stronger they were, the greater the chances of their aristocratic family surviving after all. So over the last few years, nobles have raided orphanages to look for talented children, 
This left orphans with only two fates, to be used as sacrificial pawns for their noble caretaker or to starve on the streets. Luckily, Rena had been quick enough to learn about the circumstances of this country and had avoided the aristocrats before they discovered her and her abilities. Well, with her affinity for the dark element, they would kill her on the spot as soon as they found out about it. But still, she was happy that she had researched about the Valkyria kingdom and Yildos as soon as she could. After all, knowledge of the world is essential for survival. 52. Chapter 10. I'm going to the royal capital. After walking through the woods for what seemed like an eternity with the boar in her arms, Rena finally reached her home, a house left behind by her late parents just outside the village of Mousa, after running away from the orphanage at the age of four leaving them with one less mouth to feed, she made this her new home. Although it was a simple and small one-story house, it could have easily accommodated three people if her parents were still alive, it would have been more than enough for her. Had it not been for the villagers of Mousa, who burned down half the house a year after she moved in, now it was just a place for her to sleep and barely protected her from the rain, but even so, it was good enough for her, for now. Entering her home, she went into the kitchen, or what was left of it, set the boar down, and began to skin it, but as her arms were too weak to cut through its thick skin, she increased the weight of the knife with her dark magic in order to succeed. Once the hide was removed, the girl prepared the meat and threw a slice of it into a small pot, along with some herbs and vegetables she had gathered earlier. Then she lit the fire and cooked her meal. When it was finished, Rena placed the food in a small bowl and sat down on the floor, swallowing the saliva that had formed in her mouth from the fragrance of the cooked meat. The last time she ate proteinaceous food was several weeks ago after all. Even with the survival and hunting skills she had developed over the past three years in order to live through the day on the streets, she was still in the body of a small girl, and a malnourished one at that. So there was no way that she could eat nutritious food on a regular basis. In fact, it was quite normal for her to have only one meal consisting of fruits and salad per day. Hunting and gathering in the woods was a really dangerous affair after all, especially for a child. Well, maybe because it was to compensate for all the food she had stuffed herself with in her previous life, only to escape from bad thoughts and not to sate a hunger. That habit of hers, however, had changed with her new life. Now mealtime was one of the few moments in her current life that she cherished and enjoyed the most because it meant that she would not have to sleep with a grumbling stomach at night. Furthermore, only then was she calm enough to make plans for her future, as she usually had to be on her guard against dangers such as bandit, monster, or demon attacks. Not that it had ever happened, but you could never be too careful especially as a seven-year-old girl. With that being said, she enjoyed her meal and thought about what she would do from now on. It's somehow the same pattern as the day I died. Is this a sign? She couldn't help but joke about the deja vu first. Even death couldn't cure her tendency to self-mockery. Yildos is a dangerous place to live in, especially with the demon lord's invasion approaching. So the question was, what was her purpose in such a world? Her former life ended with a lot of regrets. She had led an insignificant life without being loved by anybody and more importantly without caring enough about anyone to change herself for them. There had even been a point where she had cursed the entire world and herself for what she had done, or rather not done. The face of her former twin, Nina, came to her mind. Now she had been given a second chance. So why not use it to redeem herself for the happy life she never had? With the lessons she had been forced to learn, she could do better this time. So instead of wanting to be loved or whatsoever, it was time to employ herself for the betterment of the world, for that she needed power. At first, the strength to defend herself would be enough. She couldn't do anything if she was dead after all. But how? Rena had already concluded that her dark magic was not an option. She needed an alternative. So what else was left to her except conventional means like a sword or some other weapon? Luckily the village of Mousa was very close to the royal capital of the Valkyria kingdom, Valhail, about 20 kilometers away. She could reach it on foot in two or three days, so why not go there and visit one of its military academies? Ah, 
I forgot that those are exclusive to the nobility again, she grumbled while once again cursing the stupid nobles for their actions. And so the red-haired girl sat in the corner of the kitchen, contemplating her future plans over the meal she had finished eating long ago. Only when it got dark and cold, she came to the conclusion, that sitting there and brooding would lead to nothing. It had already been a personal flaw back in her first life and she wanted to change that. So she decided that as soon as the next morning arrived, she would make her way to Valhale and see what she could do there. With that problem solved, she curled into a small ball to protect herself from the cold night, as she always did, and closed her eyes. Aku, a sneeze forcibly woke Rena up from her sleep the next morning. She rubbed her eyes and looked out of the non-existent, burnt-down wall to check if the weather was acceptable for her journey to the capital. And indeed, the sun was shining, so she grabbed a small worn-out canvas bag and prepared to leave her home, her village, and everything her parents had left her, behind, until her eyes roamed to the remaining slices of boar meat. At first, she was going to start the two to three day journey empty handed, thinking it would be better to find fruit along the way. But when she saw the meat, she began to second guess her decision, not because she wanted to eat it, but because she had killed the poor animal. She somehow felt discomfort, thinking that the boar's death had nearly no meaning except for a small meal for her. There was still well over 95% of the boar left. Maybe I can give the rest to the orphanage? After all, they raised me until I was four. With that, she went back in, pushed out a cart to place all the meat on it, and headed towards the orphanage at the other end of the village. She had considered whether or not to take the most direct route through the main square, where most of the villagers were present at this time, but decided it was not worth taking a detour. Although almost everyone in the village would curse and insult her on sight, it was only a matter of ignoring them which wasn't too difficult given her experiences in her previous life. And indeed, as soon as Rena entered the main square, the people present began to whisper to each other. While some were loud enough for the young girl to hear, others were not. Look it's that cursed child again. Damn it, why is she here? It's bad for our business. Two men tending their stalls murmured to each other. Mum, mum, look she has strange red hair. PSST, look away, or the demons will come and take you. A mother chided her child who pointed at the girl. Mar, that girl is here again. How is she still alive? Don't tell me. We have a traitor who feeds her. I don't think so. I once saw her walking around in the woods to gather berries when I was working on the field. Look how dirty she is. Four housewives gossiped. Damn, that bastards and that bitch's brat is wandering around again. TSK, seeing her somehow irks me, let's kill her. Ah, wait, before that, I've got a better idea. She's that bitch's daughter, remember her? She was hot as hell. Clean that brat up and she'll be as beautiful. Wah, idiot. It's a kid, poor. It's long since I had my last. I'll take anyone, as long as she's got a pussy. Dude, you're sick, better sick than frustrated. So, are you guys in? Hee <laughs> hee, of course, same. I'm also in. Then let's wait for the right moment. The village's drunkards were up to no good as usual, maybe this time crossing a line they shouldn't have. Still, ignoring all the noise around her, Rena pushed the cart full of meat through the village until she saw a familiar building, the orphanage where she had lived until the age of four. It was an old, run-down, but large house with a small front garden which was used to grow food for a small degree of self-sufficiency. In it, an elderly woman, who was dressed like a nun, was harvesting vegetables and putting them in a basket on her back. When she saw Rena approaching, the nun smiled softly and walked over to the girl. Dear, Rena, welcome. How are you? She motioned for the child to come over and gave her a quick hug. Good morning Sister Belle. Letting go of the elderly woman, named Belle, Rena returned the greeting. I'm fine, thank you for asking. You're as polite as ever, but that's good to hear. The nun's eyes clouded a bit. I'm sorry dear. I, unfortunately, can't invite you in. We don't have anything left, even though you might be hungry. Is the situation that bad? Yes, the old woman nodded. 
we will probably have to throw out to child in a few days, or else. Seeing the old woman almost crying, Rena couldn't help but feel sorry for her. She knew very well, that the lady in front of her loved all the children in the orphanage like her own. But because of the dire situation in the country, the directors of all such facilities ordered that the untalented children be thrown out on the streets to save money. Sister Bal could do nothing about these instructions. So in order to spare the nun from the grief of sending a child to its certain death, Rena had voluntarily left the orphanage, as if Bal could read the girl's mind, she continued, I'm sorry Rena, I know that you left so no other child would be abandoned. You're like your mother, always thinking of the well-being of the others first. Even though you're still so young, you are already so mature. No, it's not it. I have my own selfish reasons, Rena replied, receiving only a gentle smile in return. Not used to being praised, she quickly changed the subject. Sister Belle, look, I have brought you boar meat. With that nobody will be abandoned for a while, won't they? Why you? In tears, the elderly woman once again approached the girl and hugged her. Why yes, thank you, dear. I won't ask where you got it, but why are you giving it away? You look malnourished yourself. You've helped me a lot in the past and raised me. Escaping from the embrace by lightly pushing her away, Rena answered with a blushing face. I wanted to thank you for everything. For maybe the last time. What do you mean? The nun looked astonished. At that Rena smiled, radiating an aura that was usually impossible for a small girl of her age. I'm going to the royal capital. 51. Chapter 11 Dash Your daughter has grown into a fine girl. Sister Bal. Ha. Huh, are you there? On a bed inside a temple, which was also a hospital-like facility in Yildos, a young woman lay with her hand outstretched caressing the head of her newborn baby beside her. An elderly nun stepped out into the light from the corner of the room, having been called by the new becoming but dying mother. Yes? How can I help you? May I ask you? For a favor? The woman on the bed turned her head away from her sleeping child to look at the nun and continued, Would you please, look after Rena? Please, at least only, until she can take care of herself. Cough cough. Of course, I will look after her as best as I can. You've done a lot for us after all. The last part of Bal's response was barely audible, which prompted the mother to tilt her head in confusion. Don't mind it, as I said, I'll look after your child, at least for the first few years. Thank you. Cough the young woman smiled, that's enough, now I can go in peace, and closed her eyes, this time for the very last time in her life, you know. About your husband, he wasn't actually killed by a demon. He died because of a trap set by those good for nothing drunkards. Before the young mother died, the nun wanted her to know the truth about the death of the newborn's father, but unfortunately, by the time she looked up, the woman had already passed away, so she will never know if the message had got through. I'm going to the royal capital. The smile on Rena's face as she said this was so bright that Bal could not help but think back to her last conversation with the girl's mother, so she responded with a smile of her own and asked, Why do you want to go there? I want to learn how to fight. With the demon invasion coming soon I need means to defend my surroundings and myself. As for how, the girl looked down for a moment but continued nevertheless, I don't know yet, maybe I'll find someone who can teach me how to fight with the sword, I see, then why not come back, with the amount of meat you have brought with you, there should be no problem for a while, in a few days, some nobles from the capital, will come looking for children with magical abilities, if you appeal to them then, they might hire you, no, ah, sorry for getting loud, but that's not an option for me, Rena thought for a bit, looking for an excuse, before she went on, I don't have any magic abilities, there's no way they would take me, even without magic, the nun looked at the cart with boar meat behind the girl, you look capable enough to me, and even if they someone wanted to employ me, I don't want to work for some selfish, high-strung nobles, I see, but not all of them are bad people, even so, as someone who reached her old age, Belle had experienced much in the world, which also included countless human interactions, 
from an everyday dialogue to an audience between a king and his subjects. She had seen it all. Thus, over the years she had built up quite an amount of confidence in her ability to read people's hidden emotions. This, of course, incorporated the seven-year-old Rena, who had not even lived a fraction of her life. As a result, Bal came to a certain conclusion. She is hiding something. Maybe she does have a talent for magic. Even so, she did not mind that the redhead had some secrets. More important was that Rena did not seem to have ill intent with it, so the nun left the matter alone. It's time for me to leave. Goodbye, Sister Bal. Just as Rena turned around to leave, her hand was grabbed quickly by the nun. Wait, do you really want to enter the capital like... Eh? This? Bal inspected the little girl's get up. The child in front of her was wearing a grey-brown one-piece that ended well above her knees. That was it. The holes in the one-piece for both arms and neck were so large that, at a certain angle, one could see the girl's more important body parts, especially as she was still too young and malnourished to develop curves yet. Looking down at herself, Rena wondered what Belle had meant and tilted her head in confusion. Is there something strange about my appearance? Ah. Do you think my red hair will pose a problem? Ha the nun could only sigh in worry and rubbed her bridge of her nose with her index finger and her thumb. How can she be so clueless, even though she seems to be so mature? Well, she's still a kid after all. Listen, my child, the world is full of danger. You never know when bad men might attack you, especially if they see you in your skimpy outfit. Ae, hey, Sister Belle, pee please look at me. No matter how frustrated one is, no one will ever attack me. And I have no money, so there is nothing to steal from me. Ha! Huh? For the second time a sigh, this time a much louder one at that, escaped Bal's mouth. This girl is not aware of herself at all. Rena. Why yes. The nun's sudden loud yell caused the poor, confused little girl to twitch and to jump up. Come with me. With that Bal pulled her into the orphanage. There were some problems that had to be solved first before she could let Rena go to the capital alone. Is it really okay for you to give me this? After one hour, both Rena and Bal stood in front of the orphanage again. This time, however, the girl was cleaned up, her shoulder-length red hair smoothed out and shiny, and she wore another dress like one piece. This time its length easily covered her knees. Even though the top of the one piece was sleeveless, the holes were so small that only Rena's thin arms and small head could fit through. Inspecting the girl once again, the nun nodded in satisfaction at the color of this outfit, which matched the girl's hair well. Yes, think of it as my parting gift. And, the nun hesitated for a second, then bowed her head as low as her age allowed her to. Also consider it an apology for the past three years. Since no one had ever apologized to her in her life including the last one, let alone bowed their head. The girl didn't know how to react, so instead of saying anything meaningful, she just squeaked teeth thank you for everything, before bowing her head in embarrassment and sprinting away. How cute, seeing her blush like that, Bal thought as she waved at Rena's back, who was getting farther and farther away at an astonishing rate. Then, looking up at the clear sky, she murmured, even though no one was there to hear her. Your daughter has grown into a fine girl. At the edge of the village of Mausa near its exit towards the royal capital Valhale, a band of four grown men were hiding in the shade of some trees. Around them were several empty beer bottles, which indicated that they had been here since at least the day before, seemingly waiting for someone to leave the village. And indeed, Soon a certain girl with blazing red hair wearing a somewhat high-quality red one-piece appeared and left Mouser. He e tilde, look at that, told you. She's quite the looker for a brat hick. Yes, yes, you're right, hick I can't wait. How nice, hick, she even cleaned herself up for us. Damn it, she really resembles that bitch. Shit, I'm getting horny thinking about her. Idiot, why do you have to mention her? Hick now I'm popping a boner as well. Ha 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 ha. Hick well, her daughter has to work hard for it then. Don't go too hard, or else she'll die on the first round. She's still a child after all. Guys, it's still too early, so keep your pants down. Let's just follow her for now. 
All right, yes, yes. 43. Chapter 12. I feel sorry for him. HMM, with the remaining distance. I will need at least two hours until I reach Valhale. After staring at the way sign on the dirt road leading towards the royal capital, Rena looked up to the sky. The sun was already on its way to going down, causing the girl's surroundings to get dark. Because of it, she decided to stop for the rest of the day. So she walked several hundreds of meters off the road to a nearby tree at the edge of a forest and sat down, preparing to sleep. Thanks to her upbringing she was already used to camping outdoors and her experience of the last night, the first time she had camped outside of her village, proved that she wasn't having too much trouble resting in the wilderness. With her hand she formed a small black magic circle and stuck it on the ground, multiplying the gravitational force around her to protect her from monster attacks. She then lay down in the middle, where the force was not applied, and closed her eyes. However, even after lying still for almost half an hour, she couldn't fall asleep. The cause, her whole body, was itching from the two days worth of sweat from walking. I want to take a bath. Determined to get rid of the itch, the girl got up and set off in search of a water source. Fortunately, she didn't have to go too far. After walking several minutes into the forest she ended up in a clearing with a small lake in the middle reflecting the rising moon. After confirming with a quick glance that nobody was around, she took off her clothes, folded them, and slowly entered the water. Looking down, she perceived the reflected moon and beneath it the reflection of her own body. In contrast to the ball-like figure she had in her last life, this one was like an extra thin bean sprout. If you looked closer, you could even see traces of her ribs lurking out from her malnourishment. On top of her body, this time actually connected by a neck, was a head, that might even resemble that of a human being. Her new face might have looked better than her previous one, but in her opinion, she was still as ugly as she had been in her previous life. The main cause for that was without any doubt, her slightly upward slanting eyes, which gave her a very nasty look. Her well-shaped but thin nose certainly did not help her in that regard, but that was life. You have to live with what you are given after all. And don't forget my red hair and eyes, for some reason they're considered bad here, she muttered to no one in particular. Although she had mixed feelings about her appearance, she was quite content with her newfound fitness. She had never known that it was possible to do physical activities for an extended period without having problems breathing afterwards. In fact, except for when she was plagued by hunger, she quite liked running around and climbing trees very much. That might have even been the first time that she had enjoyed anything in her both lives combined. So, did it mean that she was changing? Maybe. To a better person? Not necessarily. Would her second life have a meaning? It depends. Can I find someone who might love me this time? Rena shook her head, swaying her wet hair left and right. No. She had already decided that she would not chase after an unattainable dream. Hope will always lead to despair. She had to learn that the hard way. After all, she had despaired enough, so she was done hoping. If you don't expect anything, you can't get hurt or sad. But it did not mean that she was done with the world. Quite the opposite. This time, instead of concentrating on her own happiness, she would like to see the people around her smile. By doing so, she would become happy as well a typical win-win situation. But for that she needed strength. That was why she was on her way to the royal capital to train. Perhaps that was why she was given a relatively fit and strong body, not to mention her unique magical abilities. The girl immersed her whole body, up to her neck, in the water and washed off the dirt. After relaxing for a while the girl left the water, and as she was about to pick up her clothes to put them on, Russell, a rustling from the bushes in the forest interrupted her. Because of that she let go of her clothes and focused her eyes on the direction of those noises. After a few seconds, a dark figure emerged from those bushes and approached the girl. With the distance between them shortening and with the moonlight reflecting Rena could soon see the shadow on that man retracting. Out of it stepped a middle-aged man, she might have seen before in the village of Mouser. You are from the village of Mouser, aren't you? The girl asked to confirm that thought. Eh? Ah. Yes. Ahem. Uh -huh. I have also hick seen you there before. So, 
What are you doing here alone and at night at that? I'm on my way to the capital, but as it's already dark, I was cleaning myself up before I rest for the night. He he he, I can see it, mumbles him. No hair? Well, of course, at that age. For a kid's body, this really looks good he ha ha he. This will be fun mumbles his eyes roamed all across Rena's body multiple times as if inspecting it for something while he muttered something inaudible to her. Although his questionable actions made her feel a little uncomfortable, she managed to ignore them. After all, she could have never guessed that her body would arouse anyone. Are you also on the way to the capital, mister? She asked, tilting her head which snapped him out of his daze. Yes, yes. We cough I'm also on my way there, what do you say, we could continue our journey there together, if you want I could even help you find a place to stay, he he he, eh are you sure about it, Rena pulled her wet hair from her back to the front to show it, you don't mind, I thought you were uncomfortable with my presence because of my appearance and my hair color, eh, why yes, of course, no problems, now put your clothes on, mumbles or else I might attack, the others won't be pleased by that mumbles at the part of the response Rena could understand, she smiled like a blooming flower, followed by a blush as she realized that she was still bare naked in front of a stranger, I am terribly sorry that you had to see that, the girl bowed her head, I will put them on now, CC can you turn around, I, I it's kind of hard to change when someone is watching, eh, yes of course, even though he was surprised for the third time already in this short period, this time by that girl's innocence and naivety, he still turned around, what the hell is going on, were all children as dumb as her, it'll be too easy to trick this brat, damn, I should tell the others that we should do this more often, unbeknownst to the mayhem in that man's mind, Rena was quite a bit confused herself, why was someone in her village suddenly so friendly to her? wasn't everyone, except for Sister Belle, supposed to hate her due to the color of her hair, she couldn't quite remember whether or not that man was one of those who had looked down on her, but since pretty much the whole village shunned her, it was very likely that he did too, so why did his attitude suddenly change, while the memories of her past life did indeed help her with survival on the streets, she unfortunately was a complete noob when it came to social interactions, so at that time, even though she felt uncomfortable with the man's presence, she tried not to let it bother her too much. So, without suspecting anything bad at all, she went to sleep in the spot she had chosen before, with that man tagging along. In the past, whenever she went to sleep, she had always set up a protective barrier around her consisting of gravity magic, that would pull assailants to the ground. This time, However, she refrained from doing so because of the man's presence, as she still had to hide her dark magic abilities. Besides, the man had been kind enough to offer to stay awake and guard her while she slept. So why should she refuse? After all, it wasn't very often that other people directed their goodwill towards her. So, satisfied, and even a little happy with the current development, the girl closed her eyes. But still, there was something about this man that worried her. More precisely, she was a bit worried about him. She did not know how to put it, but somehow, I feel sorry for him. 41. Chapter 13. All right. Do as you want. Wow. It's Big Tilda. Rena looked at the structure in front of her with sparkling eyes. On the next morning, after being woken up by the man from her village, they continued their journey to the royal capital Valhale. And indeed, as Rena had already estimated, it took them nearly two hours to reach it, now that the sun had reached its highest point in the sky, they stood before a large gate, the entrance to the capital, she couldn't help but get a little excited at the fantasy-like sight in front of her, ahem, so shitty bra cough little girl, the man spoke up slightly irritated by the girl's choice of words, Rena is my name, by the way, mister, are you okay? You've been coughing a lot since yesterday, the girl asked, tilting her head. Eh? Why yes I'm okay. Nothing to worry about. So, Rena, what's your plan? At this question, the girl raised her left hand to her chin and thought loudly. I don't know yet, but I'm thinking of looking for a place where you can do odd jobs for a little money. 
I'm confident in my endurance after all. She puffed out her non-existent chest, but soon after that, she turned red, because, grumble, her stomach grumbled, eh, I will look for something to eat first, so it's time to say goodbye, Mr. Ah wait, little lady, yes, I buy you something to eat and rent you a room in an inn for the night, in return, you accompany me for today, it's not like you have something to do, do you, why would you do that? I don't have any money to pay you back, eh? <clears throat> the man seemed to think for a moment. Ah, I'm waiting for my companions to arrive tonight, and thought you could help me pass the time. I see. Rena was convinced. Okay, I take you up on that offer, mister. It wasn't like she had any plans after all. Besides, there was something about this man that still bothered her so she might as well stick around and see what it was for the time being. With that, they entered Valhale bypassing, the knights who were guarding the gate, and headed for the nearest food stall they could find. After the man paid for the food, they found a place to sit and ate their lunch. Thanks for the food. I have eaten something that was actually prepared by a real cook. She said after she had finished eating. Until now, she had just mixed random ingredients together whenever she was hungry. So this was actually her first properly cooked meal in her new life. And no problem. You're welcome. Say, what is it, mister? Do you enjoy life with no parents and all? And even though you are still young, there's no way you didn't notice that the whole village hates you. Do you? Rena nodded. Yes, I know. Then how? The man jumped off the bench and faced the girl. How can you be so expressive? Shouldn't you hate the world for all that? Because it doesn't seem like it. Does it all not make you sad? Angry? Frustrated? Because I'm already used to it, was what her old self would have replied. But as she had already decided to change herself, she instead answered with a wide smile. No, it's nothing to be sad or whatsoever about it. So you don't care what happens around you? She shook her head. That's not the case. I do care about my surroundings. It's just, what people think about me is not important to me. You. TSK, then let's see what you're like when we're done with you. While the girl was confused as to why the man had suddenly become angry, his words made her wonder even more. What do you mean? Nothing. Let's look around the capital until nightfall. My friends still need time to prepare the place. Now come you shitty brat. At this point, the man didn't even bother to keep up appearances anymore as he judged that the girl was either too dumb or naive or whatever to see through his intentions. And indeed, she didn't even notice his incoherent statement about his companions and followed suit. With that, they let the time pass, wandering aimlessly, visiting the stalls in the market square, and eating dinner. As far as Rena was concerned, it was one of the most luxurious days she had ever experienced in Yildos, as she had never had two meals in one day before, though his attitude towards her had changed once again after lunch. Now he treated her like all the other villagers. He looked at her with a hateful glare, clicked his tongue every time they spoke, and even pushed or pulled her roughly when she couldn't keep up with his pace. But again, this was nothing new for the red-haired girl, so she didn't mind it. After all, he did pay for her two meals and even promised her a place to sleep at night, so in her eyes, he was still kinder than anyone else she had met, except for Sister Belle, of course. More important to her was the fact that even though Rena had been watching the man closely, she still couldn't put her finger on what has made her worry about him in the first place, but whatever, there was still time to figure out what it was. As dusk fell and the two of them walked silently down one of the main streets, the man spoke up, shitty brat, it's time to go to the lodging I promised you, but remember, it's only for tonight, are we clear? Yes. Once again, thank you for your help, I will definitely pay the money back, she smiled back at him brightly, TSK, mumbles let's see if you can still smile like that after seeing hell. Mumbles clicking his tongue the man ended the conversation and sped up. He didn't care that she nearly had to run to keep up with him. After a while, they left the main road and entered a dark alley. A few left and right turns later he stopped in front of a run-down house, opened the door, grabbed Rena's wrist, 
and literally threw the surprised girl inside. Thud. Ouch. The poor girl yelped reflexively as she landed on the floor. When she looked up at the man astonished, she saw that he had already closed and locked the door she had been thrown through. After getting up, she looked around to see three other men, apart from the one she had been with the entire day. It was only when she saw the four of them grouped together that she remembered who the man she was with and the others were. They had always occupied the main square in the village of Mousa Drunk, harassing passers-by and causing trouble. Their track record of criminal shenanigans was long. Thus, besides Rena, they were people the villagers shunned the most. Right after her birth, although her baby senses were quite restricted at that time, she had heard Sister Bal confess that some good-for-nothing drunkards were responsible for her father's death. She didn't need to be a genius to conclude that Sister Bal was referring to the men around her. While at it, she also knew that they were the ones who had burned down her parents' house. While Rena was busy sorting out her thoughts, three men closed into her, causing her to step back, causing her to step back and bump into a man standing behind her. It was the man she had spent the entire day with. He swiftly grabbed both of her arms and pulled them upwards, lifting the girl off her feet. What are you doing? Slight panic was written all over her face. While she was detained, one of the men in front of her approached and tore off the clothes, her only possession right now, apart. Her face is exactly like that of that bitch, though her body. What did you expect? She is still a child after all. Well child or not. As long as that beautiful face contorts in pain, I'm happy with it. Her eyes and hair are disgusting though. The men talked to each other, literally drooling. Why are you doing this? Please stop. The girl had managed to calm down a little from her initial panic and tried to reason with them. Hee he, hee, it's useless girly. The man behind her licked her cheeks. You're done for. Are you going to cake kill me? I've never done anything to you. Ha, huh? kill you? Ah ha ha ha. The man behind her was insane. Don't worry, you'll experience something much, much worse. He buried his face in her neck from behind and took a deep breath, as if to inhale her scent. Even though she was a little awkward in social interactions, she was not stupid. Of course, she knew what he meant. They really planned to up me? Strangely. It was neither fear nor panic nor any other emotion in that direction that Rena felt. It was admiration. Although she had changed herself in this life, one thing stayed the same. It was the disgust and hatred she felt for her own self. Her voice. Her body. Her personality. Her entire existence. In other words, her lack of self-confidence. So she could only admire the people in front of her who actually desired her body. Well, this time, apparently because she had the same face as her mother, but still, it was her body. And as she looked up into their faces to confirm her thoughts, another mystery that had been bothering her, was solved. Since the day before, there had been something about the man that had made her worry, and his three friends were the same. She was also worried about them. And now, she knows why. The resemblance between her old, fat, and disgusting self in her previous life and these men is apparent. Their eyes, they are the same. She knew them very well. She had seen them every day for years. Every time she had looked in a mirror in her past life, like dead fish, not reflecting any light, seeing nothing but despair. So, who was she to judge them? Despite her social ineptitude, Rena was still able to see into the darkest emotions of these men. They had probably made a mistake, causing them to be shunned in the village, which, again, prompted them to repeat their mistakes to fall into an even deeper hole, a typical downward spiral, the same had happened to her after all, and now, maybe because they saw no other way out, not caring about the consequences of their actions, they decided to relieve their stress, it was only unfortunate for Ina, that she was the stress relief, but it's okay, she already had plenty of experience in being a stress relief tool, after all, her father in her previous life had also used her as such by insulting, hitting, punching, and kicking her on a daily basis. So why not endure it now too? She already wanted to be helpful to her surroundings. 
so why not prove her determination for it now? Maybe these men might even become better people when they are done with her, so why not be the catalyst for that? Rena closed her eyes. She didn't have any love for her body anyway, so why not let them do her until they were satisfied? Like all girls, Rena had always dreamed of giving her purity to a person, preferably a girl, she loves. But does such someone exist? Will there ever be a person like that? Maybe. No, probably. No, certainly not. There is no such person, and there never will. So in the end, there was nothing to lose, right? The only problem was that there was no way her body could take in a grown man without getting seriously injured in the process. But that's fine. She could manage somehow. What is a bit of physical pain compared to the mental pain those men must have felt? She relaxed her body and looked deep into the man's lifeless, pitiful eyes. All right. Do as you want. 33. Chapter 14 Dash I have a bad feeling about this. Why father? I have already told you. I don't want to get engaged. I want to enter the Royal Knight Academy. Clara, I have already told you. We need their strength in order to survive the demon invasion. So I need you to marry their son. This is my final decision. In house, which was rather small for an aristocratic family, on the edge of the noble residential district two people were arguing after dinner. On one side was a blonde man in his prime who stood over 180 centimeters tall. His broad chest and shoulders, as well as his thick arms, indicated that he was not afraid of physical activities, and indeed, the uniform he was currently wearing showed that he served the Valkyria kingdom as a knight. Opposing him was his ten-year-old daughter Clara. Like her father, she was also quite tall for her age, as her height measurement was well over 140 centimeters. Her long, blue dress, adorned with accessories and her waist length, blonde, curled hair literally screamed to the world, that she was a young noble lady. Usually, she was someone full of pride, but her current appearance proved otherwise, as tears were forming in her eyes due to the fight with her father. It was not that she was particularly opposed to getting engaged. She was a noble, after all, it's her duty to marry and give birth to offspring at some point. The problem was the family she was supposed to marry into. Since the policy had changed as the new king Loki ascended the throne, many higher aristocrats had been taking in commoners with a magical talent to use them as sacrificial pawns during the coming demon invasion. This, however, rubbed Clara the wrong way. Nobles had to be proud and strong, and they had to be the ones doing the fighting and protecting, not the other way around so she did not like the idea of hiding behind commoners for safety at all. After all, that was her late grandfather's way of life, always fighting on the front lines and helping those in need. Although he had died when she was very young, she was still able to remember clearly, how her grandfather had taught her about noblesse oblige. Her belief only strengthened further when she found out about the cause of his death a few years ago. At the suggestion of some commoners, her grandfather, at that time the knight commander, was sent to another world to fetch some random guy to help defend the country against the demons. To make matters worse, it was even the fault of those commoners, who had risen to the top because of the former king's laws, that the plan had ended in a failure, resulting in her grandfather's death. Clara could no longer understand the world. Why would the king allow some plans made by weak? uneducated commoners to be carried out. Why was a commoner in charge of this plan? Why should they hope that some random guy from another world will become the savior of this one? Why did her grandfather participate in such a plan? Was he forced to? Why did he have to die for that? Why was her family also demoted for that failure? And why would her father insist on connecting with a family that has no pride as a noble at all and hides behind commoners? Isn't this the same as trampling on her grandfather's teachings? Clara can't let that happen. She was still very young when her beloved grandfather, whom she looked up to, who had taught her about noblesse oblige. So this is her only remaining memory of him. She had to protect it at all costs. So, she was determined to enter the Royal Knight Academy to become a knight, and eventually, a commander herself, to fight for those who couldn't. But at the thought that her feelings couldn't reach her father, all she could do was cry. I hate you, 
you are no longer my father. With tears dripping down her face she stormed out of the house. Not caring that her actions were completely unbecoming of a growing noble lady, she just kept running as far as her legs carried her. Only half an hour later she come to herself again to notice that she was in an area of the capital she had never been to before. It seemed to be a market square for the common folk. The stares she received from passers-by indicated that her dress, full of accessories, was sticking out like a sore thumb. Fortunately, or unfortunately, her mental state had more pressing matters than worrying about the commoners around her. So she walked over to a bench by the side of the main road and sat down to catch her breath and to calm herself. Looking around her, she noticed that there were already a few guards, disguised as civilians, in the vicinity to watch over her. Though her family was demoted, she was still the daughter of a Viscount. Of course, her father had sent guards to follow and protect her from the shadows. They would probably take her back home sooner or later, but for now, it seemed that her father had ordered them to let her calm herself down at first, but still, the anger at her parent did not subside. Stupid father. Sob I miss you, Grandfather Rick. Why did you have to die because of weak commoners? Although she was known to be especially wise for a ten-year-old child, she was, in the end of the day, still a child. There was no way she could understand what was going on in her father's mind, that he had to abandon his, and his father's way of life to protect his child and his family. That an alliance via marriage with a stronger family would increase his house's odds of survival. So, Clara could only inwardly reprimand her father for betraying her, and blame the commoners for failing the ritual and thus killing her grandfather as a result. There's no way a commoner can fight against demons. As expected, I don't like them at all. And her image of them certainly didn't improve, as she surveyed her surroundings. In her eyes, all the people passing by were so weak, that most of them would lose even against her. A ten-year-old girl, in a one-on-one -on -one fight. While some of them did indeed look physically strong, she doubted that they could fight properly with a sword or cast any powerful magic. After all, brute strength was not everything. Besides, their appearance and behavior also bothered her. While some of them wore dirty or too revealing clothes, others had bad manners like eating while walking, something that was considered vulgar in the noble ranks. The only exception was the little girl, probably two or three years younger than her, who just walked past Clara. Although the red, dress-like clothes were quite simple from an aristocrat's point of view, they still were of high quality when compared to the attire of the other commoners. The girl's clear, red eyes, which matched her red hair, and the well-formed, somewhat childish, yet nonetheless cute face literally drew the eyes of everyone around her. Clara was no exception. Foo -fa foo Her face literally screams, I'm a country bumpkin. Clara thought, delighted at the expression on the younger girl's face as she explored the town. Unfortunately, her joy didn't last long. Damn it, shitty brat, hurry up. The reason was a vulgar man, who was probably the girl's father. He had suddenly pushed her, causing her to fall to the ground, when she walked too slowly in front of him. I'm sorry. The red-haired girl stood up immediately, not losing the happy expression on her face. Is this how commoners treat their own? Clara couldn't help but be shocked at how commoners would treat their children. This thought only made her heart ache, for she had always been treated like a treasure by her father. The blonde was well aware, that her entire family and even the servants adored her. She was treated like a princess despite only being the daughter of a Viscount, so she couldn't help but feel a bit of sympathy for the child when she saw the difference in treatment they both received. I should return home soon and apologize to father, but before that, Clara got up and stealthily followed the further daughter Bear, Temp, curious about their relationship and why they behaved as they did, after stalking them at a safe distance for a while. As dusk fell, the man suddenly yanked at the red-haired girl's arm and dragged her roughly into a dark alley. The expression on his face, which Clara managed to catch, was very close to the greedy, lustful, selfish, and vulgar ones of some of the nobles she had met at social gatherings before. So, concerned for the younger girl's safety, she followed them into the alley. I have a bad feeling about this. 43. 
Chapter 15 Dash It's impossible. She's already done for. All right. Do as you want. Rena closed her eyes and relaxed her body as she muttered these words. He he he, putting up a brave face. Aren't we? You guys, go first. Don't be gentle. I love unmoving bodies the most. At the urging of the man behind her, the others closed on Rena, each one groping different parts of her body. Though she shuddered inwardly at each touch, it was nothing that she couldn't bear. The only problem was what they would do with her afterwards. It wasn't hard for her to reach the conclusion that they would probably try to get rid of her so that she couldn't tell the authorities about their crime. So while the men's hands were roaming all across her body, she mustered up all her mental strength to secretly place small magic circles infused with gravity magic through skin contact on them. That way, as soon as they tried to end her life, she could remotely activate the seals with her mana to increase the weight of the men, pulling them to the ground and rendering them immobile. Shit, this brat isn't moving at all. What's wrong with her? Is she really a child? After a while one of the men seemed to get fed up with Rena's lack of reaction. Forget it, just go for it. She'll start crying as soon as the pain gets too much for her. I. But before he could remove his pants, one of the others shouted, W what's that? A look at the door. At the surprised voice, even Rena couldn't help but open her eyes to look at the entrance, only to see the wooden door slowly burning down. After the fire had died down, a girl could be seen behind it. From the dress the girl was wearing, it was obvious that she belonged to the nobility. With a slightly haughty expression, full of an aristocrat's pride, the newcomer stepped into the house with her arms crossed. After she looked around the room, swaying her blonde, curly hair side to side, her face twisted at first in confusion, then in shock, and then in anger, when she saw the state Rena was in. Why you lowlifes? W what are you doing to that girl? Let her go. Right now. She pointed at the men, but it was apparent to the people present that she was frightened as she trembled slightly, noticing that one of the men grabbed a nearby knife and slowly approached the blonde with a nasty grin, hee hee, or what? If you want you can also join the fun, it may even lessen the brat's burden. Hee hee hee, no, run, they want to do terrible things, I can manage somehow but you must run. Overwhelmed by the sudden turn of events Rena shouted at the girl who didn't quite seem to understand the current situation. In contrast to her, the noble girl was a normal child without memories of a past life after all. Rena then turned to the men. Please, let her go. As I said, you can do what you want with me. Unfortunately, or fortunately, Rena's plea only calmed the blonde down, who looked back with strong-willed eyes. I am Clara Dragonhurts. Daughter of Viscount Eric Dragonhurts and granddaughter of Rick Dragonhurts. As a noble, I cannot permit what you lowlifes are doing to this poor child. Furthermore, Clara turned her head towards the man approaching her. I will see your words directed at me as a will against the nobility and will hereby execute you. With the declaration she then opened her mouth and formed a red magic circle with it. After a few seconds, fire breath. A red medium-sized flame came out of her mouth, setting the advancing man on fire. Ah, he yelled me. I t you at, he shouted as he writhed and turned on the ground in pain. The others and Rena were so shocked that they could only watch as the man burned to crisps. A few minutes later, after the fire had died down, leaving only the black remains of the burned body behind, they all turned their eyes back to Clara. Ha, ha, ha. The girl in question was breathing heavily from mana exhaustion after casting the spell. Oh no, she is out of mana. Coming to the same conclusion as Rena, the men let her down, each grabbing a knife and closing in on Clara. Damn you bitch, you killed our friend. I have to do something, they're going to kill her. Should I activate the magic seals I've put on the men? Activating them would mean that she had to show that she was capable of using dark magic. Rena wasn't entirely sure what would happen to her if that fact was revealed. Would the public condemn her as a demon and hunt her down? Or would she only be kicked out of town? After all, she didn't know what it meant for a human to be able to use dark magic. But on the other hand, was it worth risking the safety of an innocent girl, who had even risked her life to protect her? 
just to hide her own magic affinity. No. I have to stop them. And upon closer look. The girl is really cute. No 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 no. What are you thinking stupid Rena? This isn't the time for that. And besides, she looks 10 to 12 years old. That's too young for my over 30 year old mind. No, that's not it. It's not that I don't have any chance with her anyway. In contrast to the seriousness of the situation though, Rena's mind was in a state of mayhem. Nevertheless, she managed to calm down a split second later and stuck a large black magic seal on the floor. As a result, the black magic circles on the men, who were just were about to grab the blonde, started glowing and pulled them to the ground, rendering them immobile. WW what is that? I feel heavy. Damn it. What is happening? I can't move. Here H help. They cried out pathetically, unable to understand what was happening. Now, you, run, as long as they can't move. Before Rena could finish her sentence, however, several men in civilian clothes, but with swords hanging on their waists stormed into the house. Three of them stepped up to the men lying on the floor, unsheathed their swords, WWW wait please don't kill em, and stabbed them through their hearts. Afterwards, another man, this time in a knight's attire entered the house and kneeled before the blonde girl. Lady Clara, please, refrain from such actions in the future. Lord Eric is sick with worry. I am sorry. Thank you for your help. But I had to intervene. As a noble, I can't allow such atrocities to happen to her. The blonde responded in a calm tone and pointed towards the still naked Rena. I see. Then what should we do with her? Let's take her back at first. She has to recover from TH. WW what is this? Clara was interrupted by one of her guards who suddenly screamed as he pointed into the air in the middle of the room directly above the corpses of the men. Dark mist flowed from them and formed a cloud that was gradually growing. Calm down. It seems a demon is about to spawn. Everyone, get into battle formation. The man in the night uniform in front of Clara stood up and gave orders to the men around him. Protect Lady Clara at all costs. Rena, however, didn't notice the panic of her surroundings at all. Her eyes were drawn to the dark cloud that was forming. This is bad. I have to stop it. Her instincts were screaming to her to prevent the process from finishing at all costs. But how? What could she do? As she was about to get closer to inspect the mist, the knight grabbed her shoulder and dragged her back. What are you doing? Are you insane? Don't touch it. He shouted at her angrily. What do you mean? What will happen if I touch it? She looked at him into his eyes, waiting for him to answer, but he only returned her gaze without saying anything. Their staring contest was promptly interrupted when Rena's vision was suddenly obstructed by blonde, curly hair. Ahem. Captain, why are you staring at the naked girl? The young noble girl had placed herself between Rena and the knight. Give me your cape. R. Excuse me. At Clara's command, he cut his cape with his sword and handed it to her, who then turned around and wrapped it around Rena's naked body. Here you go. You should have a bit more modesty, especially in front of men. TT thank why why you, was all. The red-haired girl could mutter, blushing like a ripe tomato, as she saw the blonde's face only a few centimeters away from hers. Although she was able to speak normally to people in this life, it was the first time she had ever spoken to a girl of around her age, biologically seen, and a very cute one at that. Based on her experiences in her previous life, Rena thought that her taste lay in eastern-looking girls with long, straight, black hair, but now, she might have changed her mind. Western looking girls are nice too. Unbeknownst to Rena's inner problems, Clara's worry gradually grew. Are you alright? Don't worry. Those men are dead. They won't hurt you anymore. Fortunately for Rena, the blonde seemed to have misunderstood the stumbling. Why yes, I'm fine. A again thank you for saving me. Unfortunately, though, the fact that a girl was being nice to her didn't calm her down at all. So all sorts of fantasies were running wild in her mind. They didn't hold for long though, as the seriousness of the young noble's voice snapped the red-haired girl back. As for your question earlier, I've never seen it myself, 
but it seems that if you touch the dark cloud, you'll lose all your reason. You'll lose all your reason? Clara nodded. Yes, your behavior would suddenly change in another direction after touching the cloud. For example, kind people would become extremely violent. Others would get a mental breakdown and cry the entire day. There were even cases where some have committed suicide. Hearing the blonde's explanation, Rena shivered and couldn't help but be grateful to the knight who had stopped her. But when she looked up at the mist again, she still couldn't shake off the ominous feeling it gave her. So she turned back to Clara. So what are we going to do about this thing? We can't just leave it alone. This time, the blonde shook her head. We do nothing. Just leave it to the guards. After a while, the cloud will turn into a demon monster. Then they'll deal with it. It's not like you can help anyway. Now come. Let's leave this place. In fact, in Rena's mind, she could do a lot to help. For example, she could place her gravity magic on the ground to pull the beast down as soon as it spawns. That way the knights or guards or whatever they are would be able to kill it without taking any risks, just like they did with the men earlier. But unfortunately, this meant that her ability to cast dark magic would come to light. After all, it seemed to her, that neither the girl named Clara nor her guards, had seen her activating the magic seals on the now dead men, which suggested that her secret was still safe. So she nodded to Clara and prepared to leave the house with her. But before that, I should probably disable my magic on these men at first. Otherwise, the guards will be suspicious, as soon as they dispose of them. Under the cape, Rena formed a black magic seal with her hand to normalize the weight of the dead bodies. But at the same time, the black mist suddenly began to move. See Captain Dodge. The cloud is moving towards you. At the shout of one of the guards, the only man in the night uniform quickly jumped aside to avoid the rapidly approaching mist. But soon after his face paled as he realized that his lady and the commoner girl who had been behind him, were now defenseless. Lady Clara, dodge it quickly. Unfortunately, the girl in question was frozen in place due to the sudden turn of events. So without thinking, Rena stood up and pushed the blonde away. A split second later, the cloud clashed into the red-haired girl's body, causing her to scream in agony. Ah, what is this? It hurts. It's like my body is being torn apart from the inside. As if to fight off the pain, Rena crouched over with both arms on her stomach and threw up everything she had eaten today. WWW what's happening to her? Clara panicked upon seeing the younger girl crying out in pain and wanted to rush over but was held back by one of her guards. Lady Clara, it's dangerous. WW we have to help her. The guard closed his eyes and shook his head. It's impossible. She's already done for. 39. Chapter 16 Dash Will you serve me? Ouch. Where am I? A sharp, stinging pain in her head woke Rena from her sleep. This bed is so soft. Feeling the softness on her back, she concluded that she was currently lying in a bed, a really high quality one at that. Since her rebirth, she had always slept on either dirt ground in the forest or on the wooden floor of her old, half-burned house. This being her first time on a bed, she couldn't keep her comment about the softness of it to herself. Unfortunately for her, the experience was somewhat dampened by the pain she felt all over her body. So the girl mustered all her willpower to fight off the soreness and sat up to look around the room she was in. The size of the room, the decoration, the furniture, the canopy over the bed. All of these left Rena with only one conclusion. Is this a noble's home? The face of the blonde girl came to her mind. It was obvious that she stemmed from an aristocratic family. Hadn't she announced that she was the daughter of a Viscount? So was Rena in this girl's house right now? No. More importantly, did she, or rather they, see it when I activated the black magic circles back then? The thought made her face pale and she held her head in her hands. TTT this is bad. Really bad. Is that why they brought me here? To kill me? But it doesn't make sense. Because shouldn't I be in a prison cell instead of this luxurious room if that was the case? A eh, and what was that black mist? It came from those men. Was it because I have put my dark magic seals on them? B but this has never happened before. Is that what those nightlike people and the blonde girl think? The more she thought about how and why she had ended up here, 
the more she panicked because she couldn't come up with any answers at all. Then, as if to mock her confusion, the door of the room opened slightly and a head with blonde hair peeked through the crack as if to see if Rena was already awake, and indeed, upon eye contact, the newcomer opened the door completely and entered the room gracefully. It was the blonde girl, who had called herself Clara. She walked up to the side of Rena's bed and greeted her. Did you sleep well? Do you remember me? Why yes. T thank you for asking. You said you are Lady C.C. Clara D. Dragonhurts. That's right, so you remember. Ah. Ahem. Forgive me my rudeness. The blonde grabbed the hem of the long skirt of her blue dress, pulled it up a little, and gave a slight bow. Allow me to introduce myself again. My name is Clara Dragonhurts, daughter of Eric Dragonhurts and granddaughter of Rick Dragonhurts. Nice to meet you. Can you please tell me your name? S-S-S-S-S, sorry. M-M-M, my N-N-N-N name I I I's R R R R E N A. When the girl on the bed, who had been completely stunned by Clara's graceful introduction, was brought out of her daze, she could only revert to her old personality and stammer at every word. The combination of shock, the flowery scent of an expensive soap mixed with the natural odor of a girl, and the fact that Rena had no resistance at all to talk to kind girls, had completely turned her brain to mush. Clara, on the other other hand, mistook the stuttering for fear of the nobility and was dejected by the reaction as a result. After all, there were plenty of aristocrats who would feel offended by the slightest mistake made by a commoner. In fact, she had been one of them until she met the red-haired girl. No, she still is. It's just that the girl in front of her was an exception. For some reason, she felt that whatever happened, she would never be angry with the younger girl. She would even go further and want to be on friendly terms with her. You don't have to panic. I, no, the Dragonhurts family won't do anything to you. So please rest assured. To underline her words. Clara gave the friendliest smile she could muster, only for the redhead to look away. This only deepened the blonde's misunderstanding of the situation. As expected, she seemed to fear me. But since there currently were more pressing matters at hand, Clara shook off her dejection at being feared by the younger girl out of her head and motioned one of the maids standing outside of the room to bring her a chair. Once seated, she spoke. You said your name is Rena? Why yes. Where are your parents? At this point, it was clear to Clara, that the man who had accompanied the girl was not Rena's father, and if he was, then he would have deserved a much, much more painful death, than a single stab to the heart. T they are dead. I see. I am sorry about that. Rena shook her head, to show that she didn't mind it. Where do you live? I w was living in a village. Three days walk away from here. Was this time? Rena nodded. Why yes, I came to the sea capital to earn money and tea to train myself for the eye invasion. That's very noble of you. Hearing that from a girl who looked younger than she was, Clara couldn't help but feel a little conflicted. As the daughter of an aristocrat, she led a very luxurious life, and as the only princess of her parents, she was naturally spoiled to death by them so she can't imagine, what it must be like to be on your own at such a young age. The girl in front of her had even left her village to earn money and train, and was attacked by some men as a result. Question mark. At sudden realization Clara jumped out of her chair and slammed her fists on the bed. Her face pale like a ghost. Why 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 you? DDD don't tell me you SSS sold your BBB body to those men for MMMM money? No wait, was this even her first time? Maybe she has already done it multiple times before? N no. The further the blonde thought about this, the more color left her face. But when she looked at Rena's face, she was met with a really confused expression. W what do you mean? A eh, a. Eh? after a few seconds of silence, a now bright red Clara sat back down on her chair, visibly relieved. F forget what I asked. Um. Lady D. Dragon hurts? This time, Rena interrupted the awkward silence. Just call me Clara. Lady C. Clara? Well, I guess that's fine for now. Yes? How can I help? The blonde replied, once again slightly dejected. W. What happened to me? 
I see can remember that the black mist was suddenly floating towards us. Ah yes, but before it could reach us, you pushed me aside. I'm TT terribly sorry for that. Before Clara could finish her sentence Rena had slammed her head on the bed, ignoring the fact that her body was still hurting. Eh? No, that's not what I meant, when I mentioned it. The blonde waved her hand and shook her head frantically as if to show that Rena had misunderstood her. I'm grateful for what you did. You saved me back then. This time Clara bowed her head. Excuse me for the delay. Thank you for saving me from the mist. Without you, I might not be here right now. And no need to tea thank me. My bee body just moved as you are reflex. Unused to being thanked at, Rena's voice faded with each word she muttered. I think it's admirable that your body moves reflexly in a situation like that. The young noble straightened her back again, now back at the topic at hand. After you pushed me aside, the cloud collided with you and was sucked into your body. Afterwards, you suddenly screamed out, like you were really in pain. Why yes, that was the last thing I can remember. The guard captain, from whom the cape I gave you came, expected you to turn violent afterwards. But you didn't. You just fainted after a few minutes, and now you're talking to me with your mind intact. Normally it should be impossible after touching the dark cloud. Now let me ask. What did you do? Why are you still able to talk to me normally? Why did the cloud get sucked into your body? I did don't know. Rena wasn't lying as she was as clueless as everyone else. After all, it was the first time that she had seen such an ominous cloud. Ha. Huh. Okay. Fine, after you fainted, I had my guards carry you back to my home to help you recover. T thank you, L Lady Clara. Rena smiled at her and bowed her head. And no need to thank me for that. I only did what was expected of a noble. Blushing slightly, the blonde turned away. H how long was I unconscious? Not long. For about twelve hours I would say. I S C. Once again. T thank you for saving me. And not only did you nurse me back, why you also saved me from the men. At Rena's words, Clara couldn't help but feel conflicted, once again. In noble society, it was quite common for family heads to marry off their daughters for the sake of connection and influence as soon as they reached the age when they could bear children, as the daughter of a Viscount herself. Clara had been taught a few years ago, what her duties as a nobleman's wife would entail, so she could understand what those men wanted to do with Rena back then. But for some reason, the thought irritated her so much that she felt her blood boil. She glanced at the red-haired girl's face, only to instantly look away again. The irritation had disappeared as if it had never been there in the first place. Instead, she could now feel her face heating up. I can't let her go back alone again, but what can I do? After a few minutes of silence, Clara nodded at herself as if she was convinced of something, and turned to Rena, with her kindest smile on her face. The blonde held out her hand and asked, Will you serve me? 39. Chapter 17. Yes, allow me to be by your side. While Clara was talking to Rena, two men were also having a discussion in the office of Eric Dragonhurts. Clara's father, looking at how the two were situated, even an outsider would be able to recognize this scene as a conversation between an employer and an employee. Once again, thank you for escorting my dear daughter back. The employer, and owner of this mansion, who was sitting in a chair behind his work desk, spoke up, and sorry for the delay, it was already late yesterday when you came back. No, Lord Eric, I was just doing my job. On the other side of the desk was a man of about the same age as his employer in a night uniform. Looking at him closely, one could see that the cape that was usually part of the outfit was missing. After all, at the behest of his lady Clara, he had to cut it off to give it to the commoner girl, who was naked at that time. You're stiff as usual, Arland. Didn't I ask you to talk to me as usual when we're alone? Well, then Eric. Wasn't it you who just greeted me politely? The man in night uniform, Arland, smiled wryly. Ahem. Well, how is she? Eric coughed and forcefully changed the topic. The girl has just woken up. Lady Clara is currently talking to her. Arland didn't mind it and answered his employer's question. 
And how is the state of her mind? The knight brought his right hand to his chin, trying to recall the bits of dialogue he had managed to hear through the door when he had passed the room where the girls were. As far as I could tell, she seemed to be sane, but also quite confused by her current situation. She stumbled over her own words quite a bit when she spoke the Lady Clara. Oh, that commoner girl has potential. After all, she was instantly charmed by my cute princess. Ha 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 ha. Stupid dotant father. We all know that that's not the case. H. Hey Ireland, you just said it out loud. I'm still practically your boss. At those words, the knight gave a deep bow. Oh my, excuse. It was on purpose. P.F.F.F. Bwahahaha. After both had a good laugh for a while, they calmed down and the mood turned more serious. Now Arland, is what you said yesterday true? Yes, there is no doubt. Hearing the answer Eric leaned back on his chair and massaged the bridge of his nose with his fingers. Dark magic, huh? Yes, I saw her forming a large black magic circle on the ground. When those men were about to attack the young lady, what happened to them? Eric had been informed the day before that his daughter had almost been attacked by commoners, otherwise, he would probably have exploded in anger. They were suddenly pulled to the ground and couldn't move anymore, as if their bodies couldn't support their weight. You say she can change people's weight inside that magic cells? Not only that, when we stepped into that magic circle, nothing happened to us. Her magic only affected those men. So that means that either she can precisely pinpoint the targets of her area of effect spells or, or the magic seal she placed on the floor was only to activate the seals on their bodies she had placed before when they had groped her. Arland finished the sentence that Eric began. Either way, she must be a genius to cast such spells. What should we do? I'm thinking of offering that girl to Duke Lumiere in exchange for an engagement between his eldest son and Clara. They do collect people with a magic talent after all. The young lady will be crestfallen by that. Have you already forgotten that she ran away because of that yesterday? Not only that, the young lady seems to have taken quite a liking to that commoner girl. Eric, I have a suggestion. <clears throat> Let me hear it. The Viscount perked up his ears. How about making her Lady Clara's servant and bodyguard? Eric's eyes widened at those words. If we train her, she could become very strong. At least strong enough to protect the young lady during the demon invasion. After all, she has already protected Lady Clara twice. Then you won't have to marry your daughter off against her will for her happiness. And don't forget, you wouldn't have to give up Lord Rick's way of life. That's enough Ireland. What is going on with you? You seem to be quite in favor of that girl. That's unusual for you. So, why? After some hesitation, the knight answered the question. That girl, she looks much younger than Lady Clara, but still, she didn't even show any fear when she was about to be raped. Maybe she just didn't know what was about to happen to her. Ireland shook his head. No. When the young lady intervened, the girl had shouted that those lowlifes were about to do terrible things, so Lady Clara had to run away as quickly as possible. I see. And when I later looked into her eyes, they didn't reflect any fear or panic or whatsoever at all. Those eyes are usually on people that had seen the pits of hell. They said that she would never despair, no matter what. I can't imagine what had happened to her still young life. But I think a person with that mindset around Lady Clara will be very valuable in the future. And I don't want to imagine what the Lumiers would do to such a strong-willed girl like her. They are known for their sadistic and perv. That's enough, Ireland. Don't talk like that about a ducal family that even holds the Prime Minister's seat. I don't want to see you hanged for this if they hear you. Excuse me. The knight bowed deeply once again this time more sincerely. I understand your standpoint. Let me think about it. At a later point, I'll talk to her myself later and decide afterwards. You can go for now. All right, see you later. Clack. As soon as Ireland had left the room, Eric relaxed in his chair. On the one hand, he wanted to live out his family's greedo and follow the rule of noblesse oblige. Those who have power and strength should use it and take responsibility for those who don't. On the other hand, as the head of a traditional aristocratic house, he had to protect his subjects, his family, 
and first and foremost his beloved daughter. Even if she ended up hating him, unable to find an answer, he looked up to the ceiling, or rather through the ceiling, to the heavens where the soul of his idol and hero rested. What should I do, father, will you serve me? I want you to be my personal maid, helping me in my daily life. Then, in a few years, I want you to accompany me to the Royal Knight Academy and assist me there. In return, I offer you, besides a maid's salary, a place to sleep, an education that is usually reserved for nobles, and my protection from any danger. Incidents like that from yesterday will never happen to you again, and I promise that I will never mistreat you. So, what do you say? I think it's a good offer for you. At first, Rena was doubtful, as the offer was too good to be true. After all, in both lives combined, especially with yesterday's events, she had gathered more than enough experience of getting into too good to be true situations and getting hurt by them as a result. But didn't she already decide that she wouldn't mind getting hurt, abused, or whatsoever anymore? After all, she was about to let those men do whatever they wanted, so why not direct that attitude towards the cute, blonde girl instead? That way she could even be at the girl's side, something that she had never experienced, even in her previous life. Wasn't this the epitome of a win-win situation? When Rena looked up at Clara, she was met with a gentle smile, crystal clear, blue eyes, that brimmed with honesty, and an outstretched hand as if to signal to her to take it. An angel. Rena muttered unconsciously. The fact that Clara was standing between her and the window, through which the morning sun was shining, created the illusion that Clara had just descended from heaven to reach out to her, especially when her blonde hair reflected the sunlight, giving the impression that she was embraced by a holy hue. Thinking back to the day before, it was Clara who had appeared out of nowhere and saved Rena from being raped, although it was bearable. Rena did feel disgusted by the hands that were groping her body at that time. No, that was putting it too lightly. Back then, she had to be careful not to throw up every time one of those men's fingers crawled across her skin. Wouldn't that mean that only hell awaited her, once those men entered her? Was it really possible for her to endure that? Maybe, maybe not. In the end, she was glad that she didn't have to find that out. So she was very grateful to the noble girl. And now, the girl had stretched out her hand and asked Rena to serve her. Looking at the blonde and her angel-like illusion, Rena could feel her face heating up. Of course, she knew what it meant. I'm already in love with her, aren't I? She was too familiar with this situation. In her previous life, there were several girls at school who had directed their goodwill at her. When Rena had dropped a pen once, the girl sitting next to her picked it up for her. When she was carrying a heavy trash bin, a girl passing by offered to help her lift it. When she was on class duty and had to clean the classroom, a girl who was also on duty helped her. When she was talked to by a girl. When she was smiled at by a girl. Every time, without any exception, Rena fell in love with them, imagined being together with them, got hurt when she realized that there was no way her fantasies would come true and cried herself into sleep. She hated that she was able to fall for multiple girls at once. She hated that she could fall in love so easily. She hated how cheap she was. She hated that she was so starving for love. That's why she had distanced herself from all the girls in her past life. To protect herself from getting disappointed, from getting hurt, and from despairing that no one had ever returned her feelings. This time, too. Rena was already in love with the girl called Clara. Isn't everything repeating itself again? No, things had changed. Rena's mindset had changed. She no longer wished for her feelings to be reciprocated. So this time, she wouldn't run away from girls anymore. Instead, she wanted to see the girls she had fallen in love with to be happy. So Rena looked back at Clara and grabbed the outstretched hand that was patiently waiting. Yes. Allow me to be by your side. 41. Chapter 18. Interlude 2. The Birth of the Voice. Um, com, um, com, um. After leaving the room Rena was resting in, Clara skipped to the room, while humming happily to herself. Although it took her a moment to recover from the initial surprise, caused by Rena's ambiguous words, she was very pleased that the younger girl would be her personal maid from now on. Oh my Clara, my dear. 
You seem to be in a good mood. R. Yes, greetings mother. I actually am. The person who just talked to Clara, was her mother, Lauren Dragonhurts. Looking at her it seemed clear why Clara was already over 140 centimeters tall at the age of 10, because Lauren's height was well over 170 centimeters, which was quite unusual for women, like Clara, or rather the other way round. Lauren had blonde, waist-length, curly hair. It was obvious to those around them that Clara adored her mother and thus wanted to copy her appearance. Even though Lauren was already in her mid-twenties, due to her youthful look, if both of them stood side by side, one couldn't be sure whether they were sisters or mother and daughter. Does that mean that Eric has decided to drop his idea of the engagement? Mother, I don't know anyone with that name. Who is that? Unfortunately, Clara's good mood was ruined when her mother mentioned her father. Ha, Clara, dear, you shouldn't be too hard on him. Well, enough about that. So, why are you in such a good mood? The girl's face frowned at that question. Mother, you mean why were you in such a good mood? Don't you? Ha. Lawrence sighed loudly again. Let's go with that. So, do you remember the red-haired girl I mentioned yesterday? I asked her to be my personal maid and she accepted. Clara smiled brightly, forgetting that she was supposed to be in sour mood moments ago. Have you already talked to Eric about this? Now the young girl suddenly remembered her sour mood again. No, dear. You can't just decide such things without your father. Didn't I teach you that? Lauren looked sternly at her daughter, who flinched slightly. B but he doesn't think about my wishes at all. In the end, he will just ignore them. Clara, you will go to your father's office and talk to him about this matter. This time her facial expression was much more severe than before. In the past, every time she looked at her daughter like that, Clara would become obedient. This time, however, to her surprise, Clara didn't follow her order at all. She just stood there motionlessly and looked at the ground, seeing for the first time, that her usual approach to her princess stubbornness wasn't working, Lauren crouched down, so that she and Clara were at the same eye level, then she put her hands on her daughter's shoulders and looked her in the eyes, dear, let's go to your father's office and tell him about your wish, I will accompany you, if your reasoning is right, he will undoubtedly grant your wish, and if he doesn't, then I'll help you to convince him. Is that okay? After thinking for a bit, Clara looked up at her mother and nodded. Then they both walked towards Eric's office. Knock knock. Enter. Hearing Eric's voice, mother and daughter opened the door and entered the office. Upon seeing them, Eric's face morphed into a wide smile. Oh, welcome both of you. It's unusual for you to come here together. He walked over to his wife and gave her a light peck on her lips. Then, when he moved to hug his daughter, he was met with a cold shoulder. HMPF. The girl in question turned her grumpy face away, showing her father that she was still mad at him. Oh, my Tilda, Clara, is this how you treat someone from whom you want a favor? Ah, it's fine, Lauren. I probably deserve it for forcing my will on her. The head of the family walked back to the chair behind his word desk and sat down. So? Even though I say I deserved it, if this is about the engagement, I won't change my mind. Only after a few seconds of hesitation, Clara finally faced her father and spoke up. What is your plan with Rena? <laughs> Rena? Eric was slightly confused at first but soon started to connect the dots. Ah. You mean that commoner girl? Clara nodded. First of all, do you know what that girl is capable of? Arland has told me about it. He saw that girl forming black magic circles. She can use dark magic. Clara clenched her fists at those words. She already suspected that Rena could use dark magic. After all, she had seen it in front of her eyes. A large black magic circle had appeared under the feet of the men who were about to attack her. Not even that. The seal had even pulled those men to the ground, something she had never heard that magic could do. From that moment on, Clara knew that Reno was someone special who could cast very powerful magic, but that was exactly why she had hidden Reno's magic affinity from her father. 
hoping that neither Arlen nor the rest of her guards, who were present at that time had noticed it, but unfortunately, they did. They even reported it to her father that fact alone makes that girl special, but not only that. According to Arland, she even touched the demon spawning cloud while staying sane and completely dispersed it. I have never heard that such a feat is possible, but Rena said, she doesn't know how she did it. Even so, with the current situation, all nobles would be eager to get their hands on her. Eric quickly countered Clara's words and continued, I will offer that girl to Duke Lumere in exchange for him accepting our engagement proposal. You mean your proposal? Clara glared at her father with teary eyes. That decision is final. I will not accept any disagreement. Clara was aware that her father wanted to connect with the powerful Ducal Lumiere family. The reason for this was that the Lumiere family had built up a considerable private army in the years since King Thor's abdication, in the entire Valkyria kingdom. They were the most famous for collecting commoners with magical talents, to train and use as pawns in the demon invasion. Thus, their survival chance was considered to be among the highest. So, for several months, her father had been begging them to accept his proposal of engagement between Clara and Lumiere's firstborn son. Fortunately for Clara, they had always refused, seeing no reason to do otherwise. But things might change in the future. It does not take a genius to predict Eric's next steps. Of course, now that he had a child with a powerful dark magic affinity in his hands, he would propose the engagement once more. This time, with said child, Rena, on the negotiation table, the Lumiers would surely accept. Thinking about this, Clara felt tears welling up in her eyes, as that would be the worst possible outcome for her. After all, she did neither want to marry into the Lumiere family, which she hated to the core nor did she want to give away the girl she was so fond of. Seeing no way to persuade her father, she turned to her mother for help who just shook her head in silence. This only meant that Clara had to come up with a solution on her own, one that would produce the best results for her. So, for herself and the girl with the red hair and bright, red eyes, she suppressed her tears, clenched her fist even tighter and racked up her brain to think of a way to convince her further to abandon his initial plans and to accept Rena as her servant. After all, didn't she promise Rena that she would protect her? Who knows what the Lumiers, who were also known for their perverted and sadistic nature, would do to a cute girl like Rena. Clara closed her eyes and took a deep breath to think. Seeing this, Eric felt proud of his little girl's growth, as he had expected her to throw a tantrum. Now his daughter was trying to calm herself down to think of convincing arguments, but unfortunately, he had made his decision. He had to protect his family, especially his daughter, even if he would be scorned by them in the end. Nevertheless, he waited patiently until his daughter finished thinking. After a while, when she had probably found a way to persuade him, she opened her eyes and looked at him. Even Eric, a seasoned noble and politician, all nobles could be seen as politicians, who was very used to the social antics and tricks of aristocrats couldn't help but shudder under Clara's gaze. The charisma and pressure she emitted, was not something a normal ten-year-old girl could do. At that time, he couldn't possibly know, that he just witnessed the first baby steps of a being, who would be feared and avoided by the enemies, and admired and loved by the allies as the voice later on. 35. Chapter 19. Have I done something strange? Knock knock. Rena, are you already awake? Lady Clara? Yes. I'm awake. Please wait a moment, I'll open the door. With that Rena was about to jump out of the bed and head for the door, but was stopped by the voice on the other side. No need. Coming in, the door opened and the girl with the blonde, curly hair entered the room. Good morning Rena. Did you sleep well? Good morning Lady Clara. Yes, thank you. Does your body still hurt? At the question, Rena stood up and moved her body to check whether her body was still sore from touching the dark cloud four days ago. No Lady Clara, the pain is almost gone. Once again, thank you for your help. From now on I will serve you as best as I can. Rena bowed to Clara and pumped her fists in determination. Good to hear. The blonde gestured to the maids who then promptly pushed a cart with food inside into the room and left it afterwards again. Well then, 
Let's eat breakfast together. Please get ready, Rena. In the meantime I'll set the table. The day after Rena had touched the black cloud, she had agreed to become Clara's maid and assistant, so she was reluctant at first to let her master prepare the table, but as she was still recovering, Clara insisted on doing it instead, so Rena didn't say anything further. Since then, Clara visited the red-haired girl every day and they had all their meals together. After Rena had finished washing herself up, she walked over to the prepare table, sat down across from Clara, and enjoyed her breakfast with her. Usually, it was unheard of for a commoner and a noble to eat together at the same table. Even Rena, who had never had any contact with aristocrats before, knew that, but since the blonde had visited her practically every day over the last three days, they had spent about 90% of their time together, apart from sleeping. Of course, from an outsider's point of view, these girls already seemed to be like friends, although it would still take a while for Rena to agree with that. So, at Clara's behest, Rena didn't mind their difference in social standings when they were alone. Of course, in the presence of others, she still had to behave like a maid, what that entailed she would learn later. When they had both finished eating, Clara spoke up. Rena, are you nervous? Of course. They didn't spend their time together in silence. During Clara's visits, Rena had told Clara everything about herself, well except for the fact that she was reincarnated and capable of casting dark magic. She had told her about how she had lived in an orphanage until the age of four, how she had left it to protect herself from harm, how she had lived alone in the house of her deceased parents afterwards how she had left the village of Mouser and how she had met the men who were going to rape her when Clara appeared. On the other hand, Clara had also disclosed her information to Rena. After all, at that time, she was hell-bent on keeping the redhead on her side for as long as possible. Was there any better method than to tell the other party about herself, too? So she had explained to Rena how she admired her grandfather how her family had been demoted as a result of the failed hero summoning ritual, and how her father wanted her to marry into the Lumiere family. When she had mentioned the last point, Clara could have sworn she saw the younger girl's face twitch for a split second, but she quickly dismissed it as a hallucination. Surely it was just her hopeful mind playing a trick on her. Anyway, for her father to accept Rena as her maid, she had agreed to certain terms during her negotiation with him on the first day after Rena was brought to the mansion. One of those terms was that her father wanted to talk to Rena first, though. He hadn't told his daughter what this talk would entail. Clara feared that the girl in front of her, who didn't seem to be used to nobles, was nervous about talking to Eric today. But contrary to her concern, Rena shook her head and smiled. No, I'm not nervous. Lady Clara, I see. Well, it's not like he's going to bite you. The blonde hesitated for a few seconds before continuing. I've already talked to him, so I'm pretty sure that he will accept you as my maid as long as you're yourself, but still. She looked at Rena with serious eyes. Please answer my father's questions honestly later. Seeing the gentle Clara with those eyes, Rena couldn't help but feel a little complicated. She still didn't know whether she should tell them about her dark magic affinity or not. Even though she had told herself over and over again that she wouldn't hope or expect her love for Clara to bear fruit, she was still afraid of being discarded especially when she had become so attached to the blonde over the past few days. So all she could do was nod weakly with her eyes downcast at the words of her would-be master. Unaware of Rena's inner turmoil, Clara just took the weak nod as confirmation, she continued, and also, I'm sorry for the other condition. The blonde's words, however, made Rena look at her again. What do you mean? I've promised you that I would protect, but... I know, it's fine Lady Clara. Rena shook her head and waved her hands frantically in front of her. Please don't mind it. In fact, I'm quite happy with that condition. Another term for Clara's father to accept Rena as a maid was for her to learn how to protect her mistress from harm, especially with the impending demon invasion. Although it seemed to her that the blonde was rather unhappy with that, considering that Clara had promised the other way around, Rena welcomed it. After all, 
Her original goal in going to the capital was to learn weapon masteries to be useful during the invasion. And now, the opportunity for that had presented itself. I see. Now then, I'll come back in half an hour to fetch you. Then we'll go to father's office. Is that all right with you? After receiving a nod from Rena, Clara left the room, as the blonde had announced. Exactly thirty minutes later Clara came to the guest room where Rena had been staying over the last few days and they both went to Eric's study. After knocking on the door, a voice from the other side told them to come in, so they did. Upon entering the office Rena saw a blonde man in his mid to late twenties sitting in a chair behind a desk and a blonde woman of about the same age, Clara's mother, standing next to him. Clack. Hearing the door close behind her, Rena turned around to see a man in a night uniform standing behind them. On a closer look, she recognized him as the one who had given Clara the cape to cover her four days ago. Apparently, he was some sort of captain of the Dragon Hurt's private army. Rena couldn't help but chuckle inside her head at the scene in front of her as it seemed to be very similar to a hiring process of a company in her former life. Well, that thought wasn't wrong though as it was technically a hiring process. So, under the mustering glare of the blonde man who was Clara's father, Rena stepped forward, grabbed the hem of the skirt of the dress Clara had lent her, pulled it up slightly, and bowed deeply. I am grateful for the opportunity to meet Viscount Dragonhurts. My name is Rena. Please forgive me that I can't tell you my surname as both of my parents were commoners. At the sight of Rena's actions Clara nearly opened her mouth in shock. At first, she had intended to teach the red-haired girl noble manners and etiquette when she had learned that her father wanted to talk to Rena. After all, first impressions on manners and graceful movements were very important to aristocrats, including her father, but she had changed her mind as it had taken her years of practice to reach her level of noble etiquette, so it was impossible to drill its basics into a girl, who had previously lived on the streets in just three days, and now said girl had performed a greeting expected from a noble woman. It was clear to Clara that Rena had copied her movements when she had introduced herself three days ago, but was it possible to recreate it, just by seeing it once? Not to mention, it all happened while Rena was being glared at by an intimidating noble like her father. She herself would even flinch under such pressure. Nevertheless, Clara was very pleased with the positive surprise. Meanwhile, Eric's mind wasn't in an any better shape than that of his daughter's. He had not expected the greeting and did not know how to react to a commoner introducing herself like a noblewoman who had the noble etiquette down to the T. She spoke in a soft voice as if she was singing a lullaby. Her bow was deep enough to show that she was of a much lower status than the other party. Her bright red and crystal clear eyes showed that she was not to be underestimated, and her gestures were without any wasted movements. In his eyes, the girl, no, the child in front of him carried out everything perfectly. All that resulted in him staring at the girl unconsciously until his wife next to him pulled him out of his daze. Dear, I know what is happening to you right now. I'm also quite surprised, but can we move on? Your gaze can still be intimidating after all. Eh? Ah, cough yes. Of course, I don't know what just happened. Hearing such an answer from her father, which was quite usual for him. Clara couldn't help but chuckle slightly. Seeing how the family reacted, Rena could only look up and tilt her head in confusion. The blonde man, who had been staring at her, was somehow scolded by his wife, which prompted Clara to chuckle. When she turned around, she saw the knight with his mouth wide open as if he was waiting for birds to build a nest in it. It didn't seem that he would close it soon. Why, have I done something strange? 44. Chapter 20 dash is there anything else we need to know? Have I done something strange? Seeing how the entire Dragon Hurts family reacted, Rena could feel sweat forming on her forehead. She knew from the few job interviews she had visited in her previous life that first impressions are very important. Of course, she couldn't just apply the rules of general etiquette from her former life here. Fortunately, Rena had been a loner on earth. 
That was why she had developed the habit of observing people's gestures in every possible detail and became very good at it. So she had used that skill, memorizing Clara's every move and practicing it as much as she could when the blonde was not with her. It certainly helped that Clara was proud of being a noblewoman and, thus, had already perfected the manners expected of a noblewoman. But now, seeing the couple's strange behavior, Rena thought that her introduction copying Clara was a mistake. So, just as she was about to bow her head in apology, Clara's further suddenly cleared his throat after being scolded by his wife and spoke up. Excuse me for the display earlier. As you've already said, I am Viscount Eric Dragonhurts. Next to me is my dear wife Lauren Dragonhurts. You already know my daughter? Behind you is our guard Captain Arland. Thank you for the introduction Viscount Dragonhurts. Rena repeated her gesture of grabbing the hem of the dress and bowing. You seem to have already mastered the manners necessary to serve an aristocratic house. I'm not one to brag, but were it not for my daughter, you would be the child with the most graceful movements I've ever met so far. You have my compliments. Ignoring Clara, who was smugly puffing out her chest at his praise, Eric smiled at Rena. Your parents have taught you well. He had expected the red-haired girl to be bashful, or at least to smile at his praise. After all, not every commoner had the chance to be complimented by a Viscount, but the reaction he received instead shocked him so much that his brain stopped working for a moment. Tears dripped down Rena's face for the first time since her rebirth in this world. Seeing that Clara first panicked and then angrily turned to her father. F father, she is an orphan. I didn't know that. Eric didn't know how to react to that, which earned him a reproachful glare from his wife next to him. Dear, I don't think this is the right reaction after hurting a child. Fortunately for Rena, the Dragon Hurts family had mistaken her tears for those of grief for having no parents after Eric had mentioned them. In fact, Rena herself didn't even know why she was crying. Perhaps these were the famous tears of joy that Rena had heard about in her past life. After all, in front of her were people, even though they were still strangers, who had seen the effort Rena had put in to achieve something. It had never happened before. Even in both lives combined, she had never ever been praised for anything she had done. It was even the opposite. In her previous life, every time she did or tried to do something, people got angry with her. When she brought snacks and tea to her father in order to help him relax, who asked you to that? Damn, now my day is ruined after seeing your ugly face. She was kicked and punched out of the room. When she reported to her parents that she had graduated from high school as the top student in her year, did you take all the intelligence from Nina when you were both in the fetus? You shouldn't have existed in the first place. She was only met with disdain in the later years. When Rena gave her twin a hand-knitted scarf. What do you want me to do with this shit? It was torn up and dumped into the trash bin instead. At work, when she put in extra hours to exceed her targets. Oh, nice. Then can you help me with this project, too? On second thought, you can do this alone. See you later. Her colleagues only gave her more to do. Even in her new life, during her time in the orphanage, when she had given away her share of food to the other starving kids. Those eyes and hair are disgusting. She was bullied and isolated in return. So it was the first time she had ever been complimented. It was not that she wanted to be praised or the like for her action. No. She had already discarded the hope and expectation to get something since her rebirth. All Rena wanted was to prove to herself that she existed and that the pain and horror she had gone through in her past life was not for naught. Over the last few days, Rena had found it hard to process what was happening, with Clara's goodwill suddenly directed at her. In the end, she just chalked it up to good luck and the fact that Clara was an especially nice and kind girl, who helped Rena in her time of need. All of that already made Rena unbelievingly happy, but now, with the sudden praise from Merrick, and with Clara and Lauren chastising Eric for seemingly hurting her. Her emotions exploded, causing her to cry. She had never felt anything so warm and fuzzy before. Arena, please stop crying. My father didn't know about your situation. Clara took out a handkerchief and wiped away Rena's tears. Afterwards she led the crying girl to a chair and sat her down. 
Only when the tears had finally stopped after five minutes, Rena got up from her seat and bowed to the people around her. I apologize for my unsightly behavior earlier. I hope you can overlook it and forgive me. At first, even after Rena had calmed down, Eric wanted to comfort her and postpone the talks. She was still a seven-year-old child, after all, he couldn't imagine the sadness a child must feel after being forced to remember her dead parents. But after her words, he discarded his idea. It would be unbecoming of him to wave off the girl's determination and maybe even hurt her pride in the process. All right, I won't mind it. Then, shall we begin our talks? Receiving a nod of confirmation from Rena, all of those who were still standing except for Arland, Lauren, Clara, and Rena, took their seats. Eric then asked Rena all sorts of questions about her life up to the present day, all of which she answered truthfully. Luckily, none of his questions were about magic, so Rena didn't even have to lie. To her surprise, the Q&A session even went very smoothly. It seemed that her crying earlier had a very considerable impact on Eric. Fine. I'm willing to let you work as my daughter's maid. But I have one condition. He spoke up when he had finished asking. Father. That's not what we have agreed on. Instead of Rena, Clara complained to her father, jumping out of her seat. You didn't mention any more conditions. Of course. After all, I just came up with it. Then you're breaking our deal, Clara. I'm talking to the girl right now. Don't interrupt. Under her father's intense gaze, Clara flinched and sat back down in silence. What is your condition, Viscount Dragonhurts? I will implore you, for now. But I want you and Clara to take a test together in two years when Clara is twelve and you are nine. If you fail, you will be let go. Eric had shot a Clara at his daughter before she could interfere again. So Rena asked the question both girls had on their minds instead. What kind of test will it be? It will be a test to see if you can work together to solve problems. That's all I can say for now. At these words, Rena glanced at Clara, who nodded her head in return. Afterwards she faced Eric again and answered, I would like to agree to your terms. Ooh, ooh. She wasn't sure how to react, so she confided it with her future mistress first. Not bad. Eric was, once again, impressed by Rena's actions. With a satisfied look on his face, he took a sheet of paper out of his desk drawer and handed it to Rena. This is the contract. Sign it if the conditions are fine for you. Normally, he wouldn't give a seven-year-old a contract to read, because they usually, who would have thought, couldn't read. However, during their conversation, Rena mentioned that she had read many books to learn about the world when she was younger. Eric suspected that Rena might be even more intelligent than his cute princess, but immediately shook the thought out of his head. Impossible things were impossible. After all, Rena took the paper, checked it, signed it with a quill on the desk, and gave the contract back to her new employer. I have received it. Accepting the signed contract. He smiled at the girl and held out his hand. Please take care of my daughter in the future. Also, call me Eric from now on. Shaking Eric's hand, Rena smiled back at him. Yes, Master Eric. I will also be in your care from now on. She decided that it would be appropriate to call her employer as Master instead of his title. And indeed, a nod from the person in question confirmed her thought. Your sword training will begin next week, Arland. The man behind you will be your instructor. As for your maid training, let's see. I will assign you a teacher in the next few days. Thank you very much. Your etiquette and manners already seem to be passable for a maid, but I think it's a good idea to have someone oversee it first. He conveniently ignored the muttering of his wife next to him, which sounded like, passable he says. If that was passable, then 99% of the noble's manners are catastrophic at best. Yes, Master Eric. To be honest, I think I also need a teacher for that front, as I only copied Lady Clara's behavior. I don't think it is sufficient that I wouldn't embarrass her in the future. Rena, not hearing Lauren's words, agreed to Eric's assessment. Oh, I see. That's why all of your movements seem to be so graceful, after all. You had a perfect example right in front of you to observe. Eric nodded in satisfaction. At that reaction, 
Lauren and Arland have the same thought. Stupid dotant father. Now that the conversation seemed to be over, Rena was visibly relieved that the subject of magic hadn't come up. After all, there was no way that she could hide her affinity for dark magic from them, her benefactors. On the other hand, she had no way of knowing how they would react if they knew she could cast dark magic. So, in the end, this was the possible outcome for her. However, as if to mock her thoughts, Eric sharpened his eyes and looked at the red-haired girl before she left the room. I have one last question. Yes? Suddenly Rena had a bad feeling creeping up her spine. Is there anything else we need to know? 36. Chapter 21. I wonder how they're doing. Is there still anything we have to know? Rena looked at Eric, who had asked the question. His blue eyes emitted an eerie feeling, that seemed to say no lies are allowed. But what would happen if she lied either way? After all, they both had already signed the contract. At least for the next two years, she would have a place to live and be by the side of the person she loved. Secretly, Rena glanced at the blonde girl sitting next to her. But if she answered with the truth and told them about her dark magic affinity, wouldn't she be risking those two years? After all, who would care about her signed contracts if she was to be branded as a demon or worse? She shook her head to clear her thoughts. No. Didn't I decide that Clara's happiness comes first? Why am I thinking of myself again? It would be terrible if something happened to her because I hid my abilities from her and her parents. But wait, why didn't he ask me this question before we signed the contract? She looked at Eric again, and as soon as her eyes met his, Rena got her answer. His accepting her as a maid for two years was his sign of trust. Trust that had to be repaid with trust on her part. If not, probably even if Clara and she passed their test in two years, Rena would probably still be dismissed. Apart from that, Rena was also quite sure that Clara's opinion on this matter played an important role. Otherwise, she couldn't understand why a loving father like Eric would accept a random commoner girl to be his daughter's maid. But, loving father, huh? For a split second, Another blonde man who never treated Rena like a daughter came to her mind. A man, who had always punched, kicked, and insulted her on sight. Again, she shook her head to get her last thought from her mind and to concentrate on the matter at hand. She had to answer Eric's question honestly. He had put his trust in her, so it was now her turn to repay it. With no other choice, the red-haired girl spoke up. Yes. There is actually something you need to know, but at first. Rena glanced visibly towards Arland. Would you please make sure that nothing leaves this room? Understanding the meaning of the girl's words, Eric replied, Nothing spoken here will ever leave this room. In the name of Dragonhurts, I will guarantee you that Arland is loyal to me and me alone. You don't need to worry about him. Convinced by his words, Rena warned those around her, Please don't be surprised. I'm going to use magic now, and formed a black magic circle on her palm to pull the quill on the table to her hand. As you can see, I can use the dark element. Then she closed her eyes tightly and clenched her free hand as if to prepare herself for the worst and waited for a reaction. One second passed. Five. Ten. Only after what seemed like an eternity, but in reality, was only about fifteen seconds, Rena slowly opened her eyes, to see two confused faces and a shocked one looking back at her. The mother-daughter pair were the confused ones, while the father was the latter. Seeing them like this, Rena timidly opened her mouth. Is there a problem? Eric was the first one to return his facial expression to normal. What did you just do? Didn't Ireland say that she could change the weight of things? And what about the chant? He then looked at the guard captain standing at the door, who also seemed to be confused. He turned his gaze back to the red-haired girl, who replied nervously, Elle like I said, I use the dark element. Yes, I could see the black magic seal you formed, but what did you do? Why was the quill floating towards you? Before Rena could answer, Lauren interfered with the conversation in a stern, but gentle tone. Dear, don't you think it's inappropriate to ask about her magic secrets? She will be Clara's servant. Of course, we have to know exactly what she is capable of. No, you're wrong. She will be Clara's servant for only two years. 
For now, Eric had no response to his wife's words. After all, for magic users, their magic abilities were their lifeline in dangerous situations. Only those who were bound to each other for life, or trusted each other completely, would reveal the full extent of their magic abilities. What he had just done was to ask a girl, who was currently contracted to the Dragon Hurts family only for two years, to tell them what she was capable of. To make matters worse, the girl in question seemed to be clueless about the norm and even wanted to answer his question. If his wife hadn't stopped him, the child might have endangered herself gravely by revealing her secrets to still strangers. In fact, when he had asked her, if there was anything she wanted them to know, he had only expected her to say that she had an affinity for dark magic. He had never thought that she would even demonstrate her power. Even if it wasn't to its full extent, it was as if he had just tricked a small, unsuspecting girl, who was younger than his child. Feeling ashamed, he calmed down and faced the currently confused girl. I'm sorry, what I just did was unbecoming of me. I hope you can forgive me. Eh? N no, I don't mind it, were all the words Rena managed to say. She didn't even have the brain capacity to realize how rare it was for a noble to apologize to a commoner, as she currently couldn't understand the world around her anymore. At first, she had prepared herself for the worst, such as being kicked out, imprisoned, or even killed on the spot, when she showed her dark magic, but nothing the like happened. Instead, Eric wanted the details of her power, and when she was about to answer, his wife interfered. And now Eric was apologizing for some faux pas she didn't know about. Ha ha ha, you seem to get confused very easily. Is it the already the second or the third time already? Eric said in a good mood, when he saw the state Rena was in. Even though she didn't know about the norm, the girl in front of him was still willing to share her information. It was clear to him, that she was afraid of isolation if people knew about her abnormality. Besides, although she seemed to be very wise for her age, she still lacked general knowledge. So it was possible to teach it to her, which would undoubtedly end in her being loyal to Clara and the Dragon Hurts family. Someone like her would become very powerful in the future, so his daughter would be safe with Rena by her side. Meanwhile, the girl in question blushed at Derek's words. After all, Everyone would react like that if they were seen through and had their feelings pointed out. Rena was no exception. Luckily for her, Lauren came to her rescue once again. Dear, I never knew that you were such an ass. I'm slightly disappointed. WWW what do you mean? Eric's good mood was now replaced by panic. Well, you seem to like putting this poor girl in your shame play. Ha huh? sh shame play. You say? Don't say things like that in front of children. Then how do you explain your behavior towards her? First, you leered at her like a pervert when she introduced herself. Then you questioned her about her deepest secrets, and now laugh at her, telling her how you can read her like an open book. I don't have to tell you how embarrassing it could be, do I? Lawrence smiled sweetly at him, but her eyes didn't match her smile at all. So with sweat running down his forehead, Eric backed away a little. D don't say such scandalous things. A and for the last one, I didn't say it like that. Nothing but excuses. If you read between the lines, that was exactly what you said. You laughed at her, saying she was easy to read. At Lauren's words, both Clara and Rena nodded their heads vehemently, as if they couldn't agree more. Besides, how many times have I told you that you need more tact towards young ladies? While Lauren was scolding Eric, Clara approached the red-haired girl, brought her face close to Rena's ear, and whispered, It's a good sign, that my parents are. However, before she could even finish her sentence, Kaya, the girl who was whispered to, Rena, jumped up squealing in surprise like there was no tomorrow, and looked at the girl who had caused it, dumbfounded. Then, a split second later, her face turned bright red matching her hair color and she stammered, WWWWWW what? In her defense, Rena was already aware of her feelings for Clara. Combine it with the fact that said girl had just breathed, whispered, in her obviously sensitive ears, it was a natural reaction, perhaps, unfortunately for Rena. 
Her loud squeal had interrupted the dragon hurts couple in whatever they were doing, so the attention of the entire room was focused on her. Fortunately, Clara's mother, Lauren, now also known as Rena's savior, once again, deflected the awkward situation. This father-daughter pair, you two have joined forces to embarrass this poor girl at all costs, haven't you? N no, mother, P please, wait, it wasn't my intention. Clara desperately denied her mother's claim, in vain, no, excuses. With that, the daughter voluntarily joined her father in being scolded by Lauren, looking at the scene in front of her, with Eric and Clara being chided, cowering in fear, Rena couldn't help but chuckle in her head. After all, what she was witnessing was the epitome of a happy, harmonious family, something she had never experienced before and maybe would never experience for herself. Still, the scene made her think of the only family she ever had on earth, even if they had never treated her like one. I wonder how they're doing. 33. Chapter 22-Send Lady Fran a message. I'm sorry, that both my husband and daughter lack delicacy. I hope you can look past them. With these words, after Lauren had finished scolding father and daughter, the girls left the office. Now that Rena was officially accepted as a staff member of the Dragon Hertz household, Clara had offered to give her a tour around the mansion, which Rena accepted. Still, Rena had always thought from novels in her previous life that nobles were full of pride and would never apologize, even if they were in the wrong. But during the past hour, both the head of a noble family and his wife had asked for forgiveness from a commoner child like her to make matters worse. Their reason for doing so was that they had embarrassed Trina. So, she couldn't help but suspect that the act of apologizing was no big deal in this world. But as if Clara, who was walking in front of her, could read Rena's mind, she looked back around and smiled brightly. You did a really good job, talking to father. I think you made a very good impression on my parents. Eh? Really, Lady Clara? I initially thought that I made a lot of mistakes. I mean... Master Eric did give me a two-year-long trial period. I think that it was meant more for me than for you, but that's not my point. What I wanted to say was about my parents' display earlier. At that, Rena held her hand in front of her mouth and smiled mischievously. Are you mean when Mistress Lauren scolded you until you almost cried? N no. Clara shook her head, blushing like a tomato. Why you? Ahem, I meant when my mother scolded my father. That's something you wouldn't normally show a stranger. For you to be able to see something like that just means that they trust you. Hearing these words, Rena felt her heart warming up. It would be nice if it's really the case. It is. I guarantee you that. The blonde stopped walking and turned her entire body towards Rena, causing her to stop as well. Once again, welcome to the Dragon Hurts household. I'm in your care from now on. When Rena looked up at the girl, who was at least a head taller than her, she perceived a happy smile. Seeing this, her mouth unconsciously and naturally copied Clara's expression, forming a wide smile as well. Yes, I'm also in your hands, Lady Clara. After Rena and Clara had left the office, Arland closed the door and sat down on the couch across the Dragon Hurts couple, where the girls had been sitting before. Afterwards, Eric spoke up, Lauren, why did you interrupt us? Rena was about to explain her powers. So you really wanted to exploit her? Seeing her husband keeping silent, Lawrence sighed. She may be acting like that, but she is still a little child at heart. Child? No child behaves like her. Even Clara, who is much more intelligent than her peers, can't compare to that commoner girl, who is two years younger. She just had to grow up early in order to survive. That's the environment she lived in. So, you actually believe her story? That she left the orphanage at the age of four and has been living on the streets alone ever since? Yes, those weren't the eyes of a liar. What if she was trained for this? What if she was a spy working for the new king keeping an eye on all the nobles or an assassin sent by the empire? Dear, your mind is already too accustomed to noble intrigues. Rena is. In my eyes, a child who just happens to be more intelligent than others, you don't have to worry about such things with her. I'm sure of it. Why are you so sure of it? Call it a mother's intuition. 
trust in your daughter's character judgment Lauren puffed up her ample chest in pride, returning to her normal posture. Lawrence smiled affectionately at her husband. Just let Rena get used to this place and she will open herself up naturally without you having to force her. Is that all right? Ha, huh, fine, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you Tilda. Lauren leaned over her husband and gave him a light peck on the cheek, completely ignoring the peanut gallery, Arland. Well then, I'm sure you both have still things to discuss about Rena, so I'll leave you alone. With that, she stood up and left the room elegantly, leaving an awkward silence behind. Eric, what is it? Why do I have to watch my employer and his wife flirting around? Arland asked, somewhat annoyed. Arland, what do you think of the girl's magic powers? Eric asked with a serious look on his face, forcibly changing the subject. Huh? Well, that's fine, too. The guard captain's expression also turned serious. Do you want me to be frank or to put it nicely? Let's go with a nice version first. Arlen thought for a few seconds before continuing. After what I've seen today, I can't understand her powers anymore. Just like Madame Lauren just said, gain her trust, train and educate her, and wait for her to give us the details of her powers herself. But, to be honest, I don't know if it's wise to keep her here. Why? Eric raised his eyebrows. I suspect that what we've seen today was only a fraction of her powers. I didn't see her building up her mana at all. So if the full extent of her power comes to light, people will be raiding this place to get their hands on her. At these words, Eric brought his fingers to the bridge of his nose and massaged it. Arland, I asked for the nice version first. That was the nice version. Then let me hear the other version. Arland closed his eyes and thought again for a few seconds. When he opened them again, there was a heavy glint in them. She's an absolute monster. If she hadn't warned us beforehand, I wouldn't have even noticed that she was about to cast a spell. Zero time to build up mana, no chant, and instant activation. If she wanted to, she could have killed us and we would have been none the wiser. In a fight, she might be unbeatable. But I agree with Madame Lauren. Arland continued when no word left Eric's mouth. I think that the girl told us the truth. That would then mean that she had taught herself the magic knowledge. I cannot imagine where she would be today if she had someone to teach her the theories. We might be biting off more than he can chew if we keep her. Does it mean you're going to hand her over Lumiere's? Eric shook his head at Arland's question. No, they would aim for the world if they held such power. That's out of the question. Seeing how his friend and guard captain breathed out in relief at his answer, Eric went on, Well, we need more information about her first, and don't forget that she's still sane after touching the demon spawning cloud, we also need to find out how she did it. So what is your next step? Eric leaned back on the sofa and looked up at the ceiling, a gesture he seemed to repeat quite often lately. After almost thirty seconds he straightened his back and looked at Ireland again. Clara won't like it, but it's better than the alternatives I guess. Hearing these mysterious words, Ireland could only tilt his head in confusion. Ireland, the serious vibe of Eric's voice stiffened him up. Yes? Send Lady Fran a message. 32, Chapter 23, Interlude 3, Back Then on Earth. It's already dark. Nina, can we do it at your place? To be honest, cash is running low for me this month. Illuminated by street lamps, a couple walked along a pavement with their arms linked. The couple consisted of a rather tall, slender woman with long, black, shoulder-length hair and an even taller, somewhat handsome-looking man. An outsider would agree that they were a good match in terms of the laws of natural selection. At her boyfriend's question, the woman, Nina, thought for a few seconds, then shook her head. I'd rather not. Let's go to a love hotel again. But your parents reacted really positively yesterday when you introduced me to them. I don't think that they will even care if we get loud. In the past, Nina had always convinced her current and all her ex-boyfriends to go to a love hotel for their deed after a date. One reason for this, of course was that she didn't know how her parents, especially her father, would react. After all, despite already being in her mid-twenties, 
she still relied on her father for money, so she would rather not have her father angry with her. Luckily, it seemed that her parents took the introduction of her boyfriend very well, but there was still a second reason why Nina didn't want to return home for sex. That reason was called Rina, her twin. Nina wanted to prevent her lover from seeing such an abomination at all costs. She was quite sure that even a thousand years worth of love would die out immediately if her boyfriend found out that she had a twin who looked like that. So, in order to stop her lover from meeting Rena, she refused his request. After all, at the time, she didn't know that her sister had already been thrown out of the house by her father. Thus, Nina led him to a nearby love hotel, but when she was about to check in, she froze up. The reason was a lesbian couple standing next to them at the reception desk. It incorporated a black-haired, beautiful woman dressed like an office lady and a, nicely put, fat woman with missing front teeth and a swollen face. If this were a world with fantasy-like life forms, one could argue that the latter could be a female orc, a particularly ugly one at that. Why the hell is Rena here? Fortunately, her twin seemed to be in some sort of daze, so Nina was able to check in unrecognized and led her lover to the room she had booked. Is something wrong? You were shaking quite a bit back then? When asked by her boyfriend, Nina reflexively answered, My twin was standing next to us, and instantly regretted it. She could only curse at the fact that her mouth was faster than her mind. Oh, as I've already expected, your sister is also hot as hell, eh? Nina looked at him confused. Hot, that? Your twin was that office lady, right? I didn't see her face, but her hair and figure match. Nina just kept quiet and let her boyfriend keep this assumption. Once they arrived at their room, they went straight to business. When they were finished, the man sat up on the double bed and spoke up. For the next time, why not invite your sister for a threesome? At these words, Nina's mood which was already at a low point as she, once again, couldn't climax, got even worse, it's impossible, ha, huh? why, because you'll run away as soon as you see her, you dumbass, were the words she wanted to say, but couldn't, so, uninterested in correcting her lover's misunderstanding, she replied, we have a really bad relationship with each other, <laughs> care to explain, maybe I can help, he was hell-bent on getting that threesome with the hot sisters. Not caring how her lover was thinking with his genitals, Nina continued, To me, she is just a stranger. What do you mean? I haven't told you yet, but I don't have any childhood memories. I have memories from when I was about twelve, but not before. Amnesia? Did you get into a cliched accident or the like? Nina shook her head. Nope. My parents were confused as well as my behavior suddenly changed completely overnight without any incident. Even the doctors were baffled. They said it was as if a new person inhabited this body. Well, no one could know if I was the original owner of this body or just an intruder, but as long as I could keep it, I don't really care. He e, that shit is deep. He was completely disinterested in her story. What does it have to do with you having a bad relationship with your sister? Well, whereas my parents bonded with me since I came to, my sister avoided me. As time went on, I learned to hate her to the core. Mumbles and don't forget her ugliness. Mumbles, I see, so it's beyond a repairable state. Seeing how her boyfriend was disappointed, Nina looked at him and smiled. That's right. So if you want to plug her, you're free to do so but never show your face in front of me afterwards again. With these words, she called it a day and went to sleep. On the next morning, after they parted ways, Nina headed home in a very ill mood, not caring about the little commotion at the hotel. After all, she had been forced to think about the person she couldn't stand the most the day before. Rena's lifeless eyes, combined with the fact that Nina was often stared at by them for some reason, made her uncomfortable feelings towards her twin even worse. Fortunately, her parents seemed to hate her twin as well and made Rena's life a living hell. To be honest, Nina was hoping Rena would finally despair from the abuse and kill herself so that she wouldn't have to deal with her ugly sister anymore. Arriving at her home, she was pulled out of her thoughts by the sight of several police cars and an ambulance parked outside her house. On the trunk of one of the police cars sat her mother, 
crying while being interrogated by an officer as she closed in on the scene. Another officer noticed her and approached, Are you Nina Hinezuki? Not knowing what was going on, she just nodded, I see, then please go to your mother and talk to her. He motioned for her to pass through the tape that had been put up to keep out strangers. After arriving at her mother's, Najiza's side, Nina spoke up. Mum, what happened? Why are these people here? When the crying woman looked up to see Nina, she jumped up to her feet and hugged her daughter, Soben Nina. It's terrible. W. When I woke up today, why your father was lying D dead on the bed, Sob. What? Nina had problems understanding her mother's words. Ignoring the confusion of her daughter, Najiza continued, Sob W. What are we going to do now? H. How are we going to live from now on? The house isn't pee paid off yet, sob. Her mother's words left Nina speechless, not because her mother didn't seem to mind her father's death at all, but because Nina completely agreed with her mother's words. Truth be told, even though Nina was quite fond of her father, she didn't quite mind his death all that much. The only value she saw in him was that he had a very well-paid job, as she was his favorite among the twins. She was given a very large amount of pocket money much more than a full-time worker would earn. It was obvious that her mother was also completely dependent on him. And therein lay their problem. Now that their source of money was gone, how were they going to maintain their extravagant lifestyle? At that moment an idea struck Nina and she spoke up. Doesn't Rina also have a good job? How about we ask her to take care of our expenses? After all, we are her family. There is no way she would abandon us. Hearing these words, Najiza calmed down a bit and shook her head afterwards. No, that's impossible. Yesterday, your father kicked her out of the house, so, we don't know where she went. Ha! Huh? Nina couldn't believe her ears. Were her father still alive, she would be dancing with joy hearing that. But now it was nothing but bad news, as her only remaining possible source of income had disappeared. And even if we found her location, I don't know if she'd be willing to support us. We weren't very nice to her after all. At least, Najiza was aware of how she had treated her daughter Rina. No, mum, that's easy. She was starving for acceptance and our love, so let's show her how sorry we are and she'll be kissing our feet. But before Najiza could agree to Nina's shameless suggestion, another police car arrived at the scene. A cop who looked like a senior inspector stepped out of the car and spoke to some of the officers who were already there. One of them somehow pointed in Nina's direction during their conversation, which prompted the newly arrived policeman to approach her. Are you Nina Hinezuki? Hearing the question for already the second time today, Nina nodded. The officer then took a picture out of one of his pockets and showed it to her. It depicted a fat, unsightly woman with black hair and a naked crotch, who had a big hole in her chest. Do you know her? Seeing this gory image, Nina could feel the blood draining from her face. Why yes, she's my twin sister Arena. That's right. We found her like that in the same hotel where you stayed last night. Please come with us to the police station. The officer's eyes glowed with anger. We were able to identify several of your fingerprints at the crime scene. You are the main suspect in this murder. Before Nina could even comprehend what was happening, she fell to her knees, knowing that the extravagant life she had been leading had come to an end. 36. Chapter 24 As expected, elves are truly beautiful. One month had passed since Rina was accepted as Clara's maid. During that time she had been training under Ireland how to fight with a sword and a hidden blade. The sword was for official fights when she had to defeat her opponents with the honor of her benefactors, the Dragon Hurts family, on her back. The hidden blade, on the other hand, was for the quick killing of enemies when her mistress's life was in danger. From the family's head maid, Rena learned the ins and outs of being Clara's personal maid. Her duties ranged from waking her mistress up in the morning and combing her hair, to keeping Clara's room clean, to simply accompanying her throughout the entire day. In other words, Rena had to stick to Clara like glue. In noble society, it was very common for aristocrats to have a person at their side to help them with everything. For example, 
What Ireland was to Eric, was Rena to Clara. This kind of relationship made the red-haired girl really happy, especially when she could serve a kind and cute girl like Clara. Normally the duties of a personal servant would also include assisting their master or mistress with more personal matters such as dressing and bathing. Fortunately, or unfortunately, Clara had for some reason insisted on doing these types of things without her maid. Although it hurt Rena to see how vehement Clara was, she could still understand her mistress. After all, who would want to be seen naked by someone they didn't like, even if they were of the same gender? Apart from her guard and maid training, Rena was also taught the etiquette and manners of the nobility so that she, so she wouldn't embarrass Clara in social gatherings. Luckily, Having already grasped the basics, it took Rena only two weeks of training to master the ideal of noble behavior. So, at present, Rena's maid and etiquette training had already been completed. Only the sword and hidden blade training were still ongoing. In fact, her combat training was progressing a little too slowly, as Rena still lacked a considerable amount of strength and speed. But it couldn't be helped because she was still only seven years old and had been malnourished until a month ago. Well, even if her body was finished growing, she still had to keep up her combat training to not lose her fighting sense. All in all, the teachers, instructors, the Dragon Hurts couple and Clara were quite impressed with the speed of Rena's growth. Of course, the redhead couldn't have pulled it off if her motivation wasn't unusually high. Rena looked at Clara, the source of her motivation, who was sitting across from her with her cheeks puffed out, pouting, and chuckled as a result. A little annoyed, the person, who had just been snickered at, glared at her maid. Clara's mood couldn't be any worse right now, so having someone laughing at her didn't help at all. What? No. I was just thinking how cute you are, Clara, Rena responded nonchalantly, thinking of Clara's sulking face. Why why you dare to mock me? Have you ever looked in a mirror? At this question, the red-haired girl tilted her head in confusion. What do you mean? Nothing. Clara crossed her arms and looked away. Seeing this gesture, Rena concluded that her teasing had gone too far. After all, this was the second time that she was so close to another girl, with the first time being her twin Nina during her preteen childhood, so had problems containing her good mood, which ended up in her being mischievous towards her target of affection. So, in order to restore the mood of her mistress, Rena apologized, I'm sorry Lady Clara, my words went too far. The honest apology came so suddenly that Clara didn't know how to react for a few seconds. Eh no, you just misunderstood me. I wasn't angry with you if that's what you think. During their time together Clara had noticed how the younger girl often put herself down and apologized for no apparent reason. She didn't like it when Rena became like that and looked like an abandoned puppy, so Clara quickly explained her bad mood. Our magic instructor comes today, right? Yes, Master Eric told me that she will come today. I think she will arrive in a few minutes. Has further told you who it will be? No. He didn't. Rena shook her head. I see. Our instructor will be that wretch Fran. Mistress Lauren would faint if she heard you saying such words. But you said Fran? As in former high priestess Fran? Yes. At Clara's confirmation, Rena faced inside her mind. Master Eric, why would you have one of the two people your daughter hates most enter your home? Of course. She knew that the blonde girl hated former High Priestess Fran and former Vice Commander Milia because they were the main reason for the death of Clara's grandfather. So Rena couldn't understand Derek's decision to employ one of them as their magic instructor. But as if Clara could read her maid's mind, she continued, Do you remember when I told you that I negotiated with my father whether you could be my maid or not? Rena nodded. At that time I also agreed that he could choose my magic instructor and that I would have to accept this person without any complaints. The blonde said dejectedly, but I had no idea that he would choose that wretch. Having her inner question answered, Rena sighed again at her mistress's choice of words. As I already said, Lady Clara, please refrain from using such words. Who cares? We're alone, so I can stay true to myself and I trust you that you won't sell me out. Hearing this, Rena was at a loss for words, and could only look away from her crush while trying to keep herself from blushing. 
which, by the way, failed miserably if one might add. So, to cover it up, she spoke her mind. So, you voluntarily swallowed a bitter pill to have me as your maid? In her previous life, Rena had distanced herself from her sister Nina, when she had found out about her sexual preference. Now, looking back, she could see that it had been a mistake. Not only had she hurt herself, but she had also wronged her beloved twin, who had been so kind to Rena back then. The fear of her being rejected, the fear that her body would act on impulse and do something irreversible to her twin, and the inability to accept her abnormality. All these combined had led her to the irrational decision to avoid everyone, including her sister, and to isolate herself. But now, things had changed. Rena herself had changed. She didn't have to accept herself anymore. In fact, nobody had to accept her existence. After all, it wouldn't change anything. She wasn't afraid of doing irreversible things anymore, because this time Rena would bury her desires and wishes deep inside her heart, not letting them out, but still keeping them dear. She didn't fear being rejected anymore, as she didn't wish for acceptance in the first place. So, Rena couldn't get hurt by rejection anymore. And even if she did, would it even matter? Not one would care, not even herself if she was in pain. As long as her loved ones and those around her smiled, everything would be fine. She would do everything to keep them happy. Even though she no longer wished anything for herself, the feeling of being trusted and needed still made her incredibly happy, so much so that a natural smile appeared on her face. That you trust and need me so much makes me very happy, Lady Clara. Hearing these words and seeing that expression, Clara couldn't help but be mesmerized by Rena and felt her face heating up. After staring at the younger girl for a few seconds, the blonde remembered what she was doing and stammered in panic. DD don't misunderstand me. I I I it's not TTT that I DD did it for you. He he he, I know, Lady Clara, but I just wanted to let you know that I'm grateful to you anyway. The red-haired girl giggled and stood up. I think our magic instructor will be arriving soon we have to greet her. At the thought of one of the two people who she hated the most coming, Clara's face immediately cooled down again. The mood was so nice just now. Why do you have to mention that wretch again? She stood up and headed to the mansion's entrance, closely followed by her maid. <clears throat> Clara, my tongue might slip when I talk to Mistress Lauren and tell her about your choice of words if you keep talking like that. Rena spoke up, while they were waiting for their teacher to arrive. Okay, okay, I'll stop. The Viscount's daughter gave in to her servant's threat. Still you are the only one I allow to treat me like this. I know, Clara. H-H-M-P-F. The blonde crossed her arms and looked away from Rena, only to smile in delight afterwards. So they stood there for a few minutes, enjoying the pleasant silence and there, once again, good atmosphere between them until a carriage arrived at the entrance. When it stopped in front of them, its door opened and a woman stepped out. If Rena had to guess the woman's age by her standards, that woman looked in her late teens or early twenties, but her long ears, peeking out from her blonde, waist-length, open hair, indicated that this estimate was surely wrong, for elves had long lifespans and looked youthful for a very long time. In addition to that, the newcomer's symmetrically built face and deep green eyes made sure that Rena couldn't look away. True, the blonde, ten-year-old girl standing next to Rena was a cutie, but still, Clara couldn't hold a candle compared to the mature beauty standing in front of her. As expected, elves are truly beautiful. 36. Chapter 25 Dash They are way too obvious. Stepping out of the carriage, the woman approached Clara and Rena and bowed briefly with a gentle smile. Hello, my name is Fran. At the behest of Viscount Dragonhurts, I will be your magic tutor. At the greeting, Clara took a step forward with her arms crossed, radiating an aura of haughtiness. Clara Dragonhurts, even if my father hired you to teach us, I will throw you out at the slightest mistake. So know your place, commoner. Seeing her mistress act like that, Rena couldn't help but be a little surprised. 
Of course, she already knew that Clara hated the former high priestess for suggesting the hero summoning ritual seven years ago, but she had never imagined that her sweet and kind mistress could show her hatred so openly and even insult their teacher for being a commoner. Rena was also aware that Clara had a low opinion of commoners and thought of them as weak and stupid people who needed to be protected. At the question of why the blonde girl treated Rena differently, she just blushed and said, you're special. At that time Rena had thought that Clara was just shy and would treat everybody, including commoners, the same way. But when Rena saw Clara's words towards Fran, she had to rethink the testament back to the situation at hand. A little curious and also a bit fearful of how the former high priestess, one of the most powerful beings in the Valkyria kingdom, would react to Clara's obvious but cheap provocation. Rena stealthily glanced at Fran, only to feel the color drain from her face. After all, the smile on Fran's face was already crumbling, as it began to twitch. Oi ah, oi ah. Young Lady Dragonhurts, I have already heard from Lord Eric that you harbor unfavorable feelings towards me because of the death of the old knight commander, but let me tell you something. Fran grinned mockingly at Clara. He is the maker of his own death because he was too weak. These words shocked not only Clara but also Rena. How could a mature adult use the death of a child's loved one to respond to a provocation? Fearing that the situation would escalate even further, Rena quickly grabbed Clara's trembling hand and turned her around so that she could look into her mistress's eyes. Seeing tears already forming in those eyes, Rena faced back at Fran and spoke up. Lady Fran, this is not a good place to talk, so please follow us to the reception room. At a nod from Fran. The three of them made their way to the reception room. When they arrived, the seven-year-old maid opened the door and motioned for the instructor to enter. Please wait here for a moment. I will bring tea. All right. After Fran had entered the room, Rena closed the door from the outside and turned to Clara. Lady Clara, please pull yourself together. She is here to teach us. Have you forgotten your agreement with Lord Eric? Please don't provoke her and please don't let her provoke you, Clara who successfully suppressed her whirling tears, murmured in response, I know, I just lost control back then, thank you, Rena, it's my job, Rena puffed out her non-existent chest at the appreciation but then turned serious again, can you be alone with there for a few minutes while I prepare tea, seeing how worried the younger girl was, Clara could feel her heart warming up once again, she confirmed that she was very fond of her maid in front of her. So, in order to ease up Rena's mind, Clara's haughty, self-confident smile returned to her face. Of course, who do you think I am? What you saw was just one of the very few moments of weakness that I had. Relieved by these words, Rena opened the door for her mistress and then left to make tea. Five minutes later, she was back in the reception room, pushing a wagon with the tea and snacks. Inside the room, who would have expected otherwise? There was a cold atmosphere between the adult Fran and the ten-year-old Clara. It made Rena somehow wonder how someone like that could become the head of the temple. Still, Rena was glad that the situation had not escalated further. So, the red-haired girl pushed the wagon to the table and placed a cup of tea each in front of Clara and Fran, who were sitting across from each other. Afterwards, she returned to her mistress's side and stood behind her. You, little maid. The former high priestess spoke up, after taking a sip of tea. Come here for a moment. Rena briefly glanced at Clara. After receiving a nod, she walked over to Fran, who was sitting comfortably on the sofa. Um. Rena felt a little uncomfortable at the stare she received from the elf. After all, she had only had very bad experiences with being stared at in her previous life. The eyes that had been directed at her, had always been full of either mockery, contempt, hatred, or disgust. So, as a reflex, Rena put her arms in front of her body, as if she tried to hide her ugly and disgusting self from being seen. Lady Fran, could you please stop staring at my maid? Can't you see that you're making her uncomfortable? Noticing the state Rena was in. Clara spoke up in annoyance. Truth be told, she wanted to add that's why I can't stand commoners, but had to stop herself so as not to make the situation worse. Ahem, I'm sorry about that. 
Fran cleared her throat at Clara's words but still kept her eyes on Rena. This time, however, she stopped her mustering gaze. What's your name? How old are you? Oh. Excuse me for the late introduction. Rena grabbed the hem of her maid uniform's skirt, pulled it up slightly, and bowed. My name is Rena. I am Lady Clara's personal maid and will be studying magic together with her under you. I will become mate in a few months. See you, Sue. Rena tilted her head at Fran's strange word and looked perplexed at Clara, who was smiling smugly. See you, Ud. Suddenly a strange scream came from the direction where Fran was sitting and Rena was lifted into the air, with her whole body pressed against something. What is with this incredibly adorable creature? Where did you find her? The person responsible was none other than the former High Priestess. Somehow, she had suddenly teleported from her seat next to Rena, took the girl in an embrace, and rubbed her cheeks against Trina's. Seeing how the elf had suddenly gone mad, Clara instantly lost her smug expression and cried out, red-faced, WH what are you doing to my maid? She got up from the sofa and literally stormed towards them, grabbing Rena's arm in an attempt to get her maid out of this predicament. Let go of my maid this instant. Unfortunately, Clara's actions caused Fran to tighten her embrace even more, slowly developing it into a bear hug. No. Give her to me. I want to take her home and make her my servant, and then... He ha 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 he. At this point, the elf had a very perverted grin on her face and even started drooling. Why you? Of course. It's rejected. And why if your drool off? It's disgusting. Weren't you supposed to be a high priestess? The leader of the temple? What's with this behavior? Clara strengthened her grip on her maid's arm and pulled harder resulting in Rena's body leaning towards her. As the high priestess I had to act prim and proper all the time. Now that I'm free of that burden, I can be myself again. In response, Fran wrapped both arms around Rena's small body, completely preventing Clara from freeing the girl. Consider your age, you hag. Your age difference is too large. Clara pulled even harder. Ha, huh? I'm not even in my thirty yet. And as an elf, I'll stay like this for several centuries, so no problem on that front. What are you even saying? You don't make any sense. Now let go of my maid. Slowly but surely reaching the end of her patience, the blonde girl used all of her strength in her arms to pull Rena out of Fran's grip. Okay, but to the girl's surprise, Fran finally obeyed Clara's command and let go of the red-haired girl, as Clara pulled on Rena with all her might. Both girls lost their balance and fell over. Thud. Needless to say, they were both in a pretty precarious position after the fall. Clara was lying on her back on the floor with Rena directly above her. Their faces were so close to each other that their noses were almost touching and they could clearly feel each other's breathing. Not realizing what had happened, they just stayed in that position and stared at each other. Who knows, maybe they would just stay like that for hours. Enjoying this arrangement, were it not for a distinct cough that had interrupted them. Ahem. Of course, the cough came from the elf, I know what I said earlier, of course, it was all a joke to lighten up the mood. So, seeing this scene now, I can't help but think that an illicit sexual relationship between two young children, moreover between master and servant, is something that neither I nor Lord Eric can approve of. Only then did Clara and Rena really realize the state they were in. So Rena got off of her mistresses with swift movements and they both straightened up, each of them looking in the opposite direction. Naturally, the mistresses and the servants' faces were beat red. After observing the whole situation after arriving here, and seeing how Clara and Rena behaved, Fran felt a headache creeping up on her. She had no idea how she would report their condition to Lord Eric, who had also commissioned her to monitor the girls. At this point, Fran already knew how their master-servant relationship would end. After all, they are way too obvious. 36. Chapter 26 Dash Well then, prepare to say goodbye to your precious maid forever. Half an hour later, after Clara and Rena had regained their respective composure after almost accidentally kissing each other, all three of them, including Fran, 
returned to their positions before the whole fiasco. Fran and Clara were sitting opposite each other and Rena, as a servant, was standing behind her mistress. Compared to the scene from over thirty minutes ago, it could be seen that the blonde girl was very wary of the elf. Clara had positioned herself the way so that her maid stood directly behind her. This was rather uncommon as a servant's usual position would be diagonally behind their master or mistress. It was as if Clara was a tiger who wanted to protect her cub from a predator. Seeing the blonde's caution, Fran couldn't help but chuckle in amusement. Foo -fa foo you don't need to be so wary. I won't take her away from you. For now. Why you, ha? Huh? Fortunately, Clara had learned from her mistakes a few minutes ago and calmed herself down not falling for another provocation. Seriously, I don't know how someone like you could reach the temple's top position. I'm strong and know a lot about magic, that's all. The elf answered nonchalantly. I know. That's why I further chose you to be our magic instructor. But before that, Clara glinted her eyes and stared directly at her conversation partner. I'll have you explain your circumstances of the hero summoning ritual from seven years ago first. All right. After a short silence, Fran gave in to the ten-year-old girl's tensora. But first tell me what you know. Then I can explain how things went in my eyes. Fine. Seven years ago, out of nowhere, you told to the former king that you have found a way to increase our chances of surviving the impending demon invasion. That was the hero summoning ritual. You hoped that a random strong man from another world would come to our world to help us fight the demons. You and your dark elf friend then somehow got the lead roles in the ritual. You were in charge of opening the portal and your friend was responsible for security. Clara clenched her fists tightly and bit her lip, before continuing. Then you dared to choose my grandfather to be the one to cross the portal to the other world to get that random guy. Fran kept her eyes closed, waiting for the blonde girl to finish. But because of your dark elf friend, the security on site was very poor. So you had intruders sabotaging the ritual. And to make matters worse, you even failed to keep the portal open for long enough for grandfather to return. At this point, tears were already streaming from Clara's eyes. Sob why you have killed grandfather Rick. Sob. Seeing her mistress, the girl she had a crush on, crying from behind, Rena could feel her heart aching. She wanted to take the older girl in her arms and comfort her. But Rena didn't have the confidence that she would succeed with it. No, that wasn't the problem in the first place. If Rena were to embrace and comfort Clara, she would be overstepping her bounds. Clara is my mistress, and I'm her maid. I must not forget that. I must know my place. So all Rena could do was stand there and wait for Clara to calm down. A few minutes later, when Clara's A's had dried up, she finally spoke up. Excuse me for my shameful display. Please forget it. MHM. It's okay. Fran answered. You lost a person dear to you, after all. But now I know how you see it, and I must say, it's a pretty convenient version for you nobles, isn't it? What do you mean? It's completely different from what really happened. Now let me correct your false version. These words made Clara's blood boil. You dare to. But before the young girl could finish her sentence, the elf interrupted her. Lady Dragonhurts, I have been silent while listening to your absurd side of the story. Now it's your turn to let me speak, isn't it? Without a counter-argument, Clara calmed down and nodded, even though she still very was dissatisfied. Now then, let me start with your first misunderstanding. The Ritual you seem to think that I just invented the hero summoning ritual. Yes, because you did. No, I didn't. In fact, I only found out about it after I became the High Priestess. This position gave me access to the most hidden documents of the temple. When I read through them, they revealed that the first king, Hero King Gaius Miraculan I, had a companion from another world to help him defeat the Demon Lord back then. That's how I learned about the ritual. The first king himself had used it. What? That's impossible. I've never heard or read anything like that. Clara jumped out of her seat, looking very shocked. Of course, you didn't. Nobody knew about it until I found out. 
Didn't you say it was written in the records of the church? Why didn't the last high priest suggest that method before you? The young lady was somewhat skeptical about Fran's statements. What can I say? None of my predecessors had bothered to dig through the old scrolls in the temple library. That was why nobody knew about it, not even the king, until I discovered that possibility. That was why I only told King Thor about the ritual at first. Afterwards, he had insisted on revealing this information to the kingdom. No, to the whole world, in order to spread hope. And therein lay your second misunderstanding. It was King Thor who suggested sending Knight Commander Rick, your grandfather, to the other world to get the hero candidate. Not me. In fact, it was your grandfather himself who even insisted on going through the portal. When he heard about it, ask Lord Eric if you don't believe me. N no. Why grandfather? Crestfallen, Clara fell back onto the sofa. Why would you do that? Ha. Huh? Annoyed, Fran let out a loud sigh. Don't you get it little girl? He had a family to protect. That's why he did it. But why didn't further tell me the truth? Why should I know that? Ask him yourself. Going on. Your statement about the security is only half true. It was the Knight Commander who had primarily organized the security for the ritual. My friend Milia, the Voice Knight Commander at that time, only assisted your grandfather in it. How should it work? My grandfather went through the portal. Milia was also supposed to go through the portal. But as you already said, some intruders interrupted her just as she was about to cross it. And you think I will believe you? Your commoner friend probably just got scared and is actually glad that she didn't have to do it. In the end, isn't she? At Clara's words, the mood in the room suddenly turned grim. As the former high priestess's eyes flashed with obvious anger. Let me tell you something, little girl. Milia was determined to sacrifice herself by going through that portal and even staying on the other side for the rest of her life, to bring hope to our world. But after failing in that duty, she never forgave herself for it. Even now she blames herself for the failure. So, little girl, if you say one more bad word about my friend, who I am very proud of, well, what if I insult your cowardly friend anyway? Clara still dared to slander Fran's friend in the face of the threat, even though she was already trembling under the pressure the elf was exerting. Stupid little girl. With these words, Fran swiftly pulled a dagger out of nowhere and threw it at Clara. Lady Clara. Seeing this, Rena shouted out in panic and quickly formed a black magic circle on her hand to alter the dagger's trajectory with her gravity magic. Thanks to her swift action the dagger narrowly missed her mistress, but unfortunately, because she was standing right behind Clara, the dagger hit Rena in the chest area instead. Rena, With a ghost-like face, Clara jumped out of her seat to check on her maid. When she saw out of the corner of her eye that the dagger had struck the younger girl in the chest, she had prepared herself for the worst. But when she got a closer look at Rena, there was no wound to be found. Eh, hey, Lady Clara. It seemed to be a toy dagger, made out of cheap materials with a dull blade, Rena explained after picking up the dagger. Although the impact was quite painful due to its fast speed, the dagger still was very light. So, fortunately, Rena had no visible injuries. After confirming that her maid was unharmed, Clara breathed a sigh of relief. A few seconds later, however, she turned angrily to the person who had thrown the dagger. You care to explain why you just did it? But instead of answering the question, Fran just stared at Trina once again for a few moments. So this is dark magic. Interesting. Is her insane activation speed a boon of dark magic? Or is this girl especially talented? Either way, she will play an important role in saving the world. Not amused, to put it mildly, by the elven commoner's behavior since her arrival. Clara finally ran out of patience and grabbed her maid's hands, before heading for the door. I've had enough. You can go home and never come back here again. I will never accept you as our tutor. I will definitely see you hanged for this. Now, now, young lady, sit down and hear me out. It'll benefit you, Fran spoke up again, as the girls were about to leave the room. Not interested. Now farewell former high priestess, Clara replied with a sarcastic undertone, I see, 
Fran was playing with the toy dagger that Rena had returned to her earlier. She threw it in the air, where it spun around its own axis three times, before she caught it again, only to repeat the process. Only after the fifth cycle, did she stop throwing the dagger again and look at Clara, who still hadn't left the room. It showed Fran, that the young girl was at least curious about what she had to say. Seeing that, the elf smirked at Clara and said nonchalantly, Well then, prepare to say goodbye to your precious maid forever. 32, Chapter 27, Interlude 4, The Biggest Mistake of the Brain Demon Spawning Cloud. This was the name of a black mist from which, as the name implied, demons emerged. It was made out of mana. The more mana it contained, the bigger the cloud was. The bigger the cloud was, the more demons would crawl out of it and the stronger they would be. And if somebody from a human race, such as humans, elves, or the beast folk, touched the cloud, they would lose their reason and, thus, cause harm to themselves and those around them. Sadly, up to this day, there was no way to cure someone who was in this state. So anyone, who had touched a demon spawning cloud, would end up dead a few days later, be it from suicide, an accident, or because they were killed to be freed from their suffering. To make matters worse, even though the oldest records describe the existence of these clouds, no one knew why, when, or under what conditions they appeared. Only one thing was certain. Each time such a cloud appeared, deaths in the double or even triple digits would follow because the demons that emerged from it were so powerful that it would take more than ten veteran knights to subdue just one of those monsters. Fortunately, such incidents only happened once every few years. Unfortunately, however, they seemed to happen more often as the demon invasion approached. Well, all that was, what the human forces knew, but that knowledge about the cloud was not enough for Fran. It was clear as day to her, that the demon spawning cloud and the impending demon invasion were directly connected to each other. So uncovering the mechanics of the clouds could give the human forces a significant advantage in the invasion. It might even provide a solution to preventing the attack in its entirety. So, since childhood, Fran had devoted herself to studying magic and learning as much as possible about the demon spawning cloud, but instead, as she dug through the documents left by her ancestors, she learned about the hero summoning ritual. Not what she had initially hoped for, but still, it was better than nothing. After all, it presented a considerable increase in their chances of winning the battle against the demons. Unfortunately, no one knew about the ritual, and as a commoner, there was no way she could just nilly willy walk up to the king and suggest it. So, with King Thor's laws, she attended the Royal Knight Academy, showed off her magical talents to get famous, and eventually became the High Priestess. This position gave her the power to suggest the ritual and see it through. However, the ritual had failed catastrophically. Not only had the forces of humanity lost one of the most powerful individuals in the world with Knight Commander Rick's death, but Fran had also fallen into a coma for several years. When she woke up, she had already lost her ability to cast magic, and with it her position, as the high priestess and her political power to change the world in the direction, where everyone could survive the demon invasion. Not only the most privileged nobles, basically, it meant, that Fran had sacrificed her whole life up to this point for the world. She had spent her entire childhood learning about magic, eating only the most basic food to save time and money for research, not pursuing any personal dreams or hobbies, and forsaking the possibility of finding love. But all of it was for naught. Still, Fran had not lost hope yet. While her friend Milia was now training new knights at the Royal Knight Academy to strengthen the human forces, Fran continued her research after recovering from her coma, and finally, her efforts bore fruit. Having studied the previous appearances of the demon spawning clouds and the circumstances of the areas where they occurred, she was able to formulate a theory as to how they worked, such as why they existed and why they appeared in the first place. But unfortunately, knowing how the mist might function and having a solution to it were two different things. Then, a few days ago, she received a letter from Viscount Terek, whom she knew well. 
The letter stated that he wanted her to teach his daughter Clara and a talented servant the ways of magic and to supervise their relationship. Even though Fran had lost her magic powers, she was still famous as the most knowledgeable scholar in the Valkyria kingdom when it came to magic. Thus, even as a commoner who was responsible for the failure of the ritual, she was naturally sought after by nobles as a magic teacher from their children. But of course, she had better things to do, such as continuing her research concerning the demons spawning clouds and how to prevent them. She also had still to uncover how they could be connected to the impending demon invasion. So. Even though she was on good terms with the previous and even the current head of the Dragon Hertz family, she would have definitely refused this request. But she didn't. The reason was the servant, Rena, who had apparently touched a demon spawning cloud while keeping her reason intact. Furthermore, if Fran believed the contents of the letter, the cloud had disappeared after that girl had sucked it into her body. No demon had emerged from the cloud. If this was true, then observing Rena could help her research tremendously. Therefore, she agreed to Viscount Eric's request to instruct Clara and Rena in magic and watch their relationship. Then, at the present, when Fran finally saw the girl in front of her, she couldn't help but feel a bit disappointed. True, in her eyes, Rena was a cute, small, huggable girl with graceful movements, who would surely grow into a beauty in the future. But she was not what Fran had expected. Fran theorized that the demon spawning cloud was a mass of dark energy. She thought that places where negative emotions such as anger, envy, hatred, fear, despair, and so on were accumulated, were more susceptible to a demon spawning cloud appearing. That was also why everyone would become mad after touching the mist. After all, no human being could possibly endure negative sentiment that lay dormant in the mist. For that reason, Fran had expected to see someone who was mentally hardened by the cruelty of the word. After all, only those who had seen hell had the chance to face despair without going insane. But the little child in front of her didn't seem like that at all. Rena's eyes were brimming with life and she seemed to be very happy to be beside her mistress Clara. There was no way such a seemingly innocent and pure girl could endure horrors of touching the cloud. Those facts left Fran with only two possible conclusions. First, Rena was already mentally broken. After all, if one wasn't capable of feeling anything, then despair wouldn't be an issue. So, to test this theory, Fran had tried all sorts of things like teasing and provoking the mistress-servant pair to see how they, especially Rena, would react. Unfortunately, in the end, it showed that Rena did have emotions. It was obvious to Fran that Rena was very fond of Clara. So, this guess was out. Only the second conclusion remained for Fran. Her theories about the demon spawning cloud being a mass of negative emotions were wrong. But then she had to wonder, why didn't Rena get crazy like all the others? Why is she still able to talk happily to her mistress? Does Rena's affinity for dark magic play a role in this? Was she able to keep her sanity? because she has a talent for magic. After all, when Fran had impulsively thrown the toy dagger at Clara when her friend Milia had been insulted, Rena reacted in a flash, activating a seemingly complicated spell in a split second. Usually, it would take no less than a genius to gather the necessary amount of mana, pour it out of the body, form a magic seal, and activate it so quickly. So Fran racked up her brain. She had to keep a close eye on Rena. In doing so, she might one day truly uncover the truth about the secrets behind the demon spawning cloud and the demon invasion, in order to save the world. After all, should a dark mist appear again, all she had to do was get Trina to touch it and watch what happened with her own eyes, and while at it, she could teach Rena the best she can. Fran knew that a girl with such talent at such a young age would become very powerful in the future. Rena was someone the human forces needed on the front line against the demons. Either way, one thing was certain for the elf. Rena was the key to defeating the demons. That was why she had to make sure that Rena would devote her everything to the world, that Rena would touch every demon spawning cloud around the world to prevent demons from crawling out and wreaking havoc wherever they were. It pained Fran in her heart, that such a young, sweet, and innocent girl had to live like that, 
but the life of one individual was no comparison to the survival of the human races. After all, Fran herself had also sacrificed her happiness for the world, so Rena had to do the same. So, the elf steeled her heart and spoke up to the girls, who were about to leave the reception room. Now, now, young lady, sit down and hear me out, it'll benefit you. Or else I will have to take Rena from you forcefully, Fran thought afterwards. Not interested. Now farewell, former high priestess. Even though Clara said this, it was apparent to Fran that the young blonde was interested. So, with a mocking smile on her face, Fran gave Clara the final push in the form of a threat. Well then, prepare to say goodbye to your precious maid forever. She had to stay as close to Rena as possible to observe her. For now, becoming the girl's magic tutor was the best way to achieve that. The first step was to convince Clara to accept her. Looking back on that moment much, much later, Fran, who would be called the brain by then, could only wail in despair. After all, it was all her fault, because she had misunderstood the situation at that time. Because she had failed to see, how broken the girl named Rena already was back then. 31. Chapter 28 Should I take off my clothes again? Clara, I have finished tying up your hair. MHM Thank you, Rena. Clara replied to her maid and looked in the mirror. As expected, you're getting better at this. At the praise, Rena smiled brightly like a blooming flower. He 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 even though I am untalented, I have to get better at this eventually after doing it every day for almost a year now. I can't stay useless all the time. After all, so this is the least I can do, eh? No, I didn't mean it like that. Hearing her maid's words, Clara panicked a little and spoke up loudly. She hated this part of Rena. Every time she complimented her on something over the past year, her maid would always add some negative nuance to the words to talk herself down. At first, she thought that Rena was just being humble, but as they spent more time together, Clara understood that these were Rena's true thoughts. Her maid was incapable of taking praise at face value. She would always find a way to interpret them in a negative way for herself. It was as if Rena thought that there was no good in her existence. That was why Clara instantly regretted denying Rena's words in panic. She was sure that the younger girl would interpret them in a bad way once again. And indeed, Rena's next words confirmed it. S sorry, Clara. I've just misunderstood your words as praise. I will practice preparing your hair more until you are satisfied. When Clara looked in the mirror, she saw her maid looking down, blushing from having misunderstood her words as praise. Although she found it incredibly cute how Rena squirmed in embarrassment, she couldn't enjoy that expression at all. After all, her words Drina were a genuine compliment. But once again, they failed to get through. So, frustrated and crestfallen, Clara got up, went to her bed, and lay down. Seeing her mistress's actions, Rena stored away the tools she had used to comb Clara's hair and prepare to leave the room. Then, good night Clara. But before she reached the door, she was interrupted. Wait, Rena, why don't you stay here for a while so we can talk a bit? Yes? At the suggestion, Rena blinked thrice and tilted her head in confusion. In her mind, she couldn't imagine what the blonde wanted to talk about. Is there a problem? No. It's just. Since Fran became our teacher almost a year ago, our days have been filled with lessons. And when we didn't have magic lessons, you were always training with Ireland or doing maid's work. Hearing these words, Rena thought initially that Clara wanted to spend more time with her. But she instantly abandoned that speculation. After all, in her mind, she could not imagine why the blonde would want to do that. It must have been a misunderstanding because of her feelings for Clara. So, shaking her head, the now eight-year-old girl tried to put her fantasies out of her mind and racked up her brain for the true meaning behind her mistress's words. Meanwhile, Clara sighed in frustration as she watched her maid's reaction. It was obvious that the red-haired girl had twisted Clara's words in a strange direction to interpret them in a negative way, once again. So, to interrupt the younger girl's self-harming thoughts, she spoke up. Never mind what I said. Thank you for helping me. You can rest now. Now, when Clara thought more deeply about it, 
Her wish to spend more time with her maid alone was a very bad one. After all, it was already past 11 p.m. Her usual routine was to be woken up at around 7 a.m. in the morning, which meant that Rena would have to be up much earlier, maybe 6 a.m. or even 5. Either way, the younger girl had to get up very early in the morning, so wishing her to stay up any longer would be extremely selfish. Okay then, Clara, good night. MHM, good night, Rena. So Clara was relieved when it looked like her maid was going to sleep. Stepping out of Clara's room and closing the door behind her, Rena made her way to Fran's room. After the rough first meeting between her mistress and the former high priestess nearly a year ago, Fran somehow managed to convince Clara to accept her as their magic instructor. Well, to put it bluntly, Fran had threatened that she would reveal Rena's existence to the world otherwise. Although the girl in question didn't understand why that was a threat in the first place, Clara gave into it. To this day, this was a mystery that Rena failed to solve. After all, why would it be a threat? At first, Rena thought it was because of her ability to cast dark magic. After all, she still feared that her affinity for dark magic would be seen as something evil in the eyes of the public. So, wouldn't that mean? that the Dragon Hurt's family would risk being hunted for protecting her. True, she was very happy that she could be beside her crush, but not if said crush's life was in danger. When Rena brought it up and suggested that she would leave for the safety of the Dragon Hurt's family, who were very kind to her, she was slapped by a crying Clara. Even now, she couldn't help but feel that her mistress had overreacted. Why would her suggestion that she leave the family hurt Clara so much, that she cried? Rena couldn't understand it. It was only later, when the magic lessons with Fran began, that she learned that having an affinity for dark magic was not a bad thing at all. According to Fran, there were records, albeit very few, that had documented cases of individuals being capable of dark magic. And not only that, Fran had even stressed multiple times during the lessons, too often in fact, that Trina's powers were very important to win against the demons. Hearing that had made the young girl incredibly happy. After all, it wasn't often, that she was needed for something, that she had a purpose in the world. So when Fran, who had moved into the Dragon Hurt's mansion, offered her extra lessons, Rena accepted, that was why she was currently on her way to her instructor's room. But because the time suggested by Fran for the extra lesson was so late and would last into the next day, Rena hadn't bothered to inform her mistress about this. After all, she couldn't imagine that Clara would be interested in what Rena would do after bedtime. After walking for a while through the dark corridors of the mansion, Rena eventually arrived at Fran's bedroom, the location for those extra lessons. She then knocked on the door and entered the room after hearing a come in from inside. Welcome Rena. please sit on the bed as usual. You're a bit late tonight, aren't you? Fran spoke as she sat in a chair, writing something in a document on the table. I'm sorry, Lady Fran. I know it's rude. You even take the time to give me extra lessons. Seeing the little girl's reaction, Fran had mixed emotions building up inside her, because she felt like she was tricking a clueless, unsuspecting child. Well, in fact, she was, as she was actually trying to get Trina to dedicate herself to the world, but still, the end justified the means, even if it would cost the happiness and the freedom of an innocent girl. At first, after Fran had just moved into the Dragon Hurt's mansion to tutor the mistress servant bear, she tried several times to talk to the red-haired girl. Unfortunately, Rena and Clara were stuck together like glue, so each time she talked to Rena, she could always feel a pair of blue eyes from the blonde girl staring at her. It was as if Clara was saying, I'm watching you, so be careful what you do with my maid. After the incident at their first meeting, Clara was extra cautious. Hence, Fran had to separate them so she could imprint her ideas on Rena and research the dark magic. Therefore she had offered to give Rena private magic lessons, which the girl accepted. Then Fran had deliberately suggested those lessons at night time, hoping that Clara would be too tired to follow Rena, 
and it worked. Clara had been never present at those lessons. To the elf's surprise, it even seemed that Rena didn't tell her mistress about these private lessons. From what Fran had observed of the red-haired girl's personality, she concluded that Rena had assumed that Clara wasn't interested in how Rena spent her free time. Although, in Fran's eyes, the opposite was true. But that was another thing the elf had managed to learn about the maid. Rena lacked self-confidence. The girl always thought that bad happenings were her fault, even if that was definitely not the case. Just like earlier when Fran had commented that Rena was late, the girl immediately apologized, without giving any reason or excuse, as if she was aware of her mistake. But from past experiences Fran knew that Rena was really really to blame for anything. This time was no different. It was obvious that Clara was the reason why Rena was late. Still, it was a good thing for Fran that the little girl had this personality trait. That way, she could use Rena's guilty thoughts to push her even harder to devote herself to the world. That's why she put a soft smile on her face and answered, Well fine, if you give your best later I'll forgive you. Hearing the elf's words, Rena smiled happily and pumped her fists in front of her chest in determination. Yes, thank you. I will do my best. Then she walked over to her teacher's bed and sat down as she was instructed. Once again, thank you for your time Lady Fran. What are we going to do today? You don't get bored thanking me for this at all, do you? You have been doing it every day since we started the extra lessons nearly a year ago. Well, fine, let's see. How about practicing the loading phase for other parts of your body besides your hands again? Okay, Lady Fran. At her instructor's suggestion, Rena stood up from the bed again and guided her hands to the maid uniform she was wearing. After removing the ribbon around her neck that held the top of the uniform together, she stopped and looked at the elf to confirm her actions. Should I take off my clothes again? 27. Chapter 29- Is your trust in me that low? Should I take off my clothes again? Rena asked Fran after removing the ribbon that held the blouse of the maid uniform together. It had been almost a year since Rena had taken private magic lessons from the former high priestess. They usually lasted two to four hours and took place every day after her mistress had gone to bed. Since Rena usually accompanied Clara before bedtime at 11 p.m. and woke her up at 6 or 7 a.m., this, unfortunately, meant that she only got a maximum of five hours of sleep a day. But this was nothing she couldn't push through with willpower. After all, Fran had offered her the answers to her innate dark magic abilities. So, since the beginning of the nightly lessons, Rena had told the elf everything about her magic, that not even Clara knew. By doing so, she learned that it was not only her elemental affinity that was abnormal. The facts that she did not need to chant and that she could draw mana from any part of her body made her special, too. Before coming to the capital, Rena hadn't known that each person was only supposed to be able to pour mana out of only one place of their body. So, although she had noticed very early on that she could drain mana from every body part through her skin, it felt more than uncomfortable to do it anywhere other than her palms. So she didn't mind it, but during the lessons, Fran had insisted that she practiced the other areas as well. So, when Rena had told her teacher that she felt uneasy doing so, she had been advised to exercise it without clothes first. Guiding the mana to leave the body through naked skin was much easier than with clothes on. And indeed, Fran was right. Although Rena still felt unwell, it was much more bearable than before. So, for a few weeks now, her daily routine during the night training was to strip down to her underwear and practice the loading phase with Fran observing her and pointing out tips when necessary. That was why, Rena almost reflexively undressed herself when she heard the suggestion to continue practicing the loading phase. Fortunately, she was fast enough to stop herself and ask Fran for confirmation. At the question, the elf seemed to be thinking for a few seconds with her hands on her chin which was then followed by a subtle grin. Seeing her teacher's behavior, Rena had bad feelings creeping up her spine. Over the past months, she had learned that Fran could be very mischievous. The elf somehow loved to be very touchy-feely with Rena, especially when Clara was present. At those times, 
The blonde girl would always get angry at Fran. To make matters worse, Rena would also be yelled at afterwards for some reason. You must always be on your guard, especially with that wretch nearby, she would be told. Unfortunately, it confused her even more, as she was always watching her surroundings to protect her mistress. Especially after Fran had once thrown a toy dagger at Clara when they first met. Ignoring Rena's inner distress, Fran stood up from her chair and walked over to the bed. Then she hugged the small girl from behind and pulled her down so that Rena was sitting on her lap. L Lady Fran? Even though it wasn't the first time that Rena had been in very close contact with her teacher, it still caused her panic. After all, she was hugged from behind by a beautiful woman, in her previous life, when she had still wished for a wonderful love life. She had often imagined what it would feel like to be embraced from behind. So, when a fantasy from her past life came true, she couldn't help but feel very distressed. W what are you doing? While the redhead was still struggling to understand the situation, the person, who was hugging the little girl, raised her voice and spoke up loudly. Stay still, Rena. You're tired from today's maid work, aren't you? No wonder, you're still eight. Leave your body to me and let me undress you today. Just relax for a moment. You still have to sweat a lot later, after all. These words made Rena's head spin extremely fast. She didn't know why, but she could feel her body heating up at an alarming rate. She knew very well from her experiences in her past life that she was rather weak when it came to sexual pleasure. After all, were it not for the fact that she had relieved herself several times a day in her previous life, she wouldn't have been able to endure hell back then. She knew that her urges would one day reappear in this life, but as she was still in the body of a child, there was no problem on that front yet. So, why did she feel so strange now? Was it because the elf's hands were roaming all over her body, tickling her? It was by far no comparison to the disgust she had felt when the men had touched her body a year ago. Was it Fran's strange choice of words, that made her mind imagine all sorts of things? Or was it Fran's voice, which for some reason sounded overly seductive, albeit loud? Either way, Rena's fantasies were running wild again, which caused her to stop struggling, involuntarily, if one might add, and let Fran do as she pleased. Fortunately, or unfortunately, the elf was interrupted, as, bam, a loud noise echoed through the room. The cause was the door being slammed open. When the elf looked at the entrance to the room, she saw a blonde girl in a pink nightgown standing there, glaring at her. WWW what are you doing with my maid? Comma the newcomer shouted while pointing at Fran. Seeing how Clara was boiling with rage, Fran grinned even more mockingly and tightened her arms around the girl on her lap, who was still in some sort of daze, to provoke the young lady even further. Lady Clara, can't you see that you are disturbing us? Unfortunately for Fran, Clara had experienced enough teasing over the past year, so the 11-year-old girl managed to calm down a bit, or so it seemed because her voice was still shaking. H -hoo -hoo -s. So what am I disturbing you with if I may ask? At the question, the elf brought her hand to the cheek of the girl in her lap, who, by the way, was still motionless, and caressed it. Don't you see it? Witnessing Fran's actions, Clara nearly exploded again, but, fortunately, she managed to stop herself. So she turned to her maid, as talking to the perverted elf didn't seem to be going anywhere at all. Rena. When Rena heard Clara's loud and clear voice calling her name, she immediately snapped out of her trance and panicked as she saw a pair of crystal blue eyes glaring at her. L Lady Clara, W what are you doing here? The blonde crossed her arms at her maid's bewilderment. Are you seriously asking me that? The question is why are you here? I'm here to take extra lessons from Lady Fran. She told me that she could help me get better at casting dark magic. I see. But what does your current state have something to do with you learning magic? Clara asked calmly. But a closer look at her revealed that she was on the verge of blowing up in anger, for her face was twitching uncontrollably. Only then did Rena look down and see that her clothes were disheveled. Were it not for her immature body, and were she actually a beautiful person, she might have argued that her own state could be considered somewhat erotic. To make matters worse, 
She was currently sitting on Fran's lap while being held by her from behind. It was then that it dawned on Rena that the blonde girl had misunderstood the situation tremendously. So, she quickly explained in order to ease Clara's anger. R, Lady Clara, you seem to have misunderstood it. For my usual training session, I have to take off my clothes, but as I seem to be tired to Lady Fran, she was kind enough to offer to undress me instead. Unfortunately, Rena only achieved the opposite, as... Throughout her sentence, Clara nearly coughed up blood several times. W what? Undress? Usual training session? Is Rena always alone with that wretch at this time? Naked? How long have these sessions been going on? Since when? The longer the blonde girl thought about this, the more color drained from her face as despair slowly but surely formed inside her. Eventually, unable to bear the horrible scenario that was building up in her mind, Tears welled up in her eyes until pfffffffft. Ha 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 ha. This is too good. Cough cough cough. Ha ha ha. A loud laugh echoed through the room. The source, of course, was the former high priestess who had already let go of Rena. She was currently rolling on her bed laughing, occasionally choking on her own saliva. Seeing Fran's reaction, Clara's face regained its color. She closed the door so that the naughty elf's loud laughter wouldn't wake anyone in the mansion in the middle of the night, went in, and sat down on the chair where Fran had been sitting before. It was clear that Fran had just messed with her, but instead of getting angry again, this time Clara was visibly relieved because it meant that all her earlier imaginations regarding Rena were just that, imaginations. So, while Fran was still busy laughing herself to death, Clara took a closer look at her maid, only to immediately blush and avert her face again. The state Rena was currently in, was somewhat too dangerous for her. Arena would you mind fixing your clothes? The girl in question, who was confused by the strange behavior of her mistress and her teacher, did as she was told. I'm ready, Lady Clara. I'm sorry that you have to see something unsightly because of me. Usually, the blonde girl would have chastised Rena for those remarks again, but as her mind was somewhat preoccupied with trying to calm down, she just nodded on autopilot. So the awkward situation continued for a while, with Fran still rolling around on the bed laughing, Clara blushing and avoiding eye contact with her maid, and said maid standing in the corner observing the situation that clearly went over her head. It was only five minutes later that Fran managed to calm herself and spoke up, still chuckling. Ah, that was the best laugh I've had in a while. Torn from her fantasies, Clara regained her composure and glared back. I can imagine. So, can you explain in all seriousness what you have been doing with my maid all the time? Didn't your maid already tell you? She is here, so I can teach her how to handle her dark magic. At these words Clara looked at Rena who nodded in return, confirming Fran's words. Rena, why didn't you tell me, but instead of Rena, it was Fran who answered the question. She is not your lifelong servant, so why should she tell you about her magic powers? She is here to train and cast her dark magic spells. Your presence here is tantamount to her revealing the details of her powers to you. Don't you see it? But upon hearing this, Rena was quick to deny it as Fran's words might convey that Rena didn't trust Clara enough to reveal her magic powers. No, that's not it, it's just. The time for the training is this late. Usually, you would be asleep by now, and I thought you wouldn't be interested in what I do when I'm not with you. Unfortunately, Rena's words hurt Clara even more. Since when have you been doing this behind my back? A around ten months ago? I see so practically from the beginning. Say, Rena? Why yes? When Rena met Clara's eyes, she could see those blue eyes getting wetter and wetter. Then, after a few seconds, the first tears dripped from the blonde girl's face. Is your trust in me that low? 26. Chapter 30 Dash You're a tough nut to crack, aren't you? Is your trust in me that low? Hearing her mistress say those words with tears welling in her eyes, Rena was so shocked that her mind stopped working. In her mind, she had said nothing that should have made Clara sad. But now, she stood there motionless, watching her crush trying to hold back her tears. 
Rena really wanted to take out a handkerchief to give it to the older girl, but refrained from doing so. Although she couldn't quite understand why Clara was sad, she did know that it was her fault. So, it was definitely not her place to comfort her mistress. That was why Rena just stood there and waited patiently for Clara to calm down. Tell me, Rena, what is our relationship like? Clara asked, noticing that her maid was just staring at her. But before Rena could answer the question, the blonde girl continued in a low voice, Is it a master-servant relationship? Is it a relationship where you do what I want and where you protect me with your body when I'm in any danger? This time, Clara was actually waiting for an answer, so Rena nodded. I see. Then what will you do when my father rejects you next year? At the question, Rena clenched her fists. Until now, she had tried not to think about the fact that her time at Clara's side was only temporary. Next year she would still have to pass a test that would decide whether she could stay here or not. But she knew that it was not only the test that could prevent her from being employed further. Her time until then surely also served as some sort of probationary period, during which the Dragon Hurts couple would observe her. She even suspected that Fran had been assigned to watch her as well. So, one mistake could be enough to separate her from her crush. And now, she had seemingly hurt Clara. Rena didn't know why, but it was clear that Clara was disappointed in her. Looking at the older girl's facial expression, she was sure that her happy days had come to an end. One word from Clara to Eric was enough for Rena to be dismissed. Once again, before Rena could finish her thoughts to reply to her mistress's question, Clara interrupted with a lonely smile. Hey, Rena. Let me guess your current thoughts. You are probably thinking that I will convince further to fire you, aren't you? Exclamation mark that's. This time Clara put her hands over Rena's mouth, preventing her from finishing that sentence. No need to answer. It was a rhetorical question. Looking at your face, I can already imagine your answer. I've been watching you very closely for the past year, after all. Well then, Clara took her hands from her maid's mouth, walked over to the door, and opened it. I will not disturb you any longer in your training. But before she left... She turned round and bowed to the elf. I leave her in your hands, but please, don't undress her again. Then, she left the room. Clack. As the door closed again, Fran finally spoke up. Having watched the situation unfold in silence the whole time. There you have it, Rena. From now on you have to practice the loading phase with your clothes on. No 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 no. I think there are more pressing matters to comment on than that. Rena couldn't help but retort to her instructor's statement. Well, then what do you want me to comment on? That you don't have to teach me any more from tomorrow onwards? Wow, the young lady really can read your mind. Is that what you really think? That you will be fired tomorrow? Well, if it's not tomorrow or on one of the following days, I'm sure that I won't be able to pass the test next year. Because you hurt the young lady? The red-haired girl nodded at the question. I'm speechless. You're really dumb for being such a mature girl, eh he? At first, Rena blushed at the praise for her maturity, but then she realized that she was actually being insulted. De dumb? Yeah, your reaction pretty much confirms it. Do you know why that girl was hurt? Rena just remained silent, avoiding eye contact. Ha. Huh? Well, fine. Let's just end today's lesson here. I don't think you can concentrate today. Go back and rest. Think about your mistress's words. Figure out her feelings, and talk to her tomorrow. I understand. I'm sorry for the inconvenience I have caused you tonight. With those words, Rena bid farewell to Fran for the night, stepped out, and went to her room. As Clara's personal maid, it was situated right next to her mistress's room. In noble society, this arrangement was quite common, so that in emergencies the personal assistants could rush to their master's side as quickly as possible. This was especially important when the assistant also acted as a guard, like in Rena's case. Once arrived in her private space, she changed out of her maid outfit into her sleepwear, which, incidentally, had been handed down to her by Clara. Of course, this was usually unheard of as it would damage their esteem if nobles started giving their servants old, 
worn clothes. For some reason, however, the blonde had really insisted on Rena wearing her old clothes except for the maid uniform. At first, it seemed to Rena that her mistress wanted to be a bit more intimate with her. After all, from what she had heard in conversations, girls in her former life often swapped clothes with their best friends or lovers. She even did it with her twin several times during childhood, but it was clear to her that this wasn't Clara's intention. Rena suspected that the blonde was just kind enough to give her those clothes so that Rena wouldn't have to waste money buying new ones. Still, regardless of Clara's motives, Rena was just glad to be able to wear her crush's old wardrobe for her. This was still a symbol of intimacy. There was only one problem. Rena's pride took a big hit, as the sleepwear had just changed into had been worn by her mistress when she was five years old. The following next morning, Rena opened her eyes as usual at 5 a.m., prepared herself for the day, changed into her uniform, and walked over to the door leading to Clara's room to collect her mistress's laundry. Luckily, the blonde had a very deep sleep which was why her actions had never woken Clara up before, but strangely, when Rena entered Clara's room, its owner was already up, sitting on the bed as if she waited for her. Good morning Rena. You are already up? Why yes, good morning, Lady Clara. My day usually starts at this time. Normally, when they were alone like right now, Rena would call Clara by her name without the lady prefix. However, because of what had happened the night before, she wasn't sure if it was still appropriate. But as if Clara could sense the thoughts that were swirling in her maid's head, she spoke up. Won't you call me as usual when we're alone? Those words instantly cleared Rena's inner anxiety, resulting in her blossoming like a flower. Yes, if that's what you wish, Clara. Unfortunately, her smile was only met with the weak one from Clara. Seeing that, Rena's mood soured again and she remembered the question from the day before. Is your trust in me that low? She had been asked. Following Fran's advice, the red-haired girl had spent half of the night thinking about these words and whether they had any deeper meaning. Sadly, she couldn't reach any certain conclusions. She only suspected that Clara was disappointed for not being told about the secrets concerning her dark magic. That's why she could only hope that their relationship could be repaired with her next words. Clara. Would you like to join me for the private magic sessions with Lady Fran at night? Hearing that, a bit of happiness could be seen gleaming in the blonde's eyes. Are you sure, Rena? It would mean that I might learn every detail of your magic. Yes, I don't mind it. W.Y. all of a sudden? Give me your reason. Clara couldn't help but be a bit hopeful, that her maid would finally understand her. I trust you, Clara. Hearing this. The blonde was about to jump out of her bed and hug her maid, but then the next words stripped her of her strength again. I trust that you won't go around telling people about my powers even if I failed the test next year. Clara, D did I say something wrong again? Seeing how her mistress suddenly stopped in whatever she wanted to do, Rena grew anxious. Ha, huh, I don't know what I was expecting. W what do you mean? It's just, just? Rena tilted her head as she repeated Clara's words. You're a tough nut to crack, aren't you? 29. Chapter 31. Why is your dress red? R-I-N-A. It was early in the morning, just a couple of minutes after the Dragon Hurts family's usual breakfast time. Rena was currently in the courtyard of the manor, hanging the freshly hand-washed dresses of her beloved mistress up to dry, when she was interrupted by a clear bell-like voice calling her name from behind. Of course, she knew who the voice belonged to. After all, it was the voice of her crush. She would recognize it at any time of the day, but before she could turn around to greet the newcomer, who had probably just finished breakfast, Rena was tackled and hugged from behind. What are you doing? asked the person responsible. Clara, I've already told you multiple times. Your esteemed parents, especially Madame Lauren will get angry with you if they see you behaving like this. I don't care. Cuddling with you is more important. As if to prove these words with her actions, Clara rubbed her face against Rena's red, shoulder-length hair. Of course, this made Rena blush. Even though it was not the first time that Clara did something like this, no matter how often Rena experienced it, 
She couldn't get used to it, for some reason, after Clara had discovered that Trina had been taking extra classes to train in her dark magic a year ago. The blonde's behavior had suddenly changed by 180 degrees. Before that, they had had a fairly normal master-servant relationship with clear boundaries. True, they had teased each other on a few occasions before, but it had still been within normal limits for that kind of relationship afterwards. However, Clara became extremely physical, imitating their teacher Fran when it came to skinship with Rena, hugging her or sitting close to her whenever the situation allowed. Unfortunately for Rena, her crush's hugs always caused her heart to race. This time was no exception, so she couldn't concentrate on her current task of hanging up clothes anymore. Seeing how her maid reddened with embarrassment, Clara smiled in delight. After all, this implied that her tactic worked. So, taking advantage, she grabbed Rena's hand and pulled the girl along with her. Only then, Rena realized what was currently happening and spoke up. Clara, where are we going? I still need to hang up your clothes to dry. Eh? Oh, I'm sorry, Rena. I got a little excited. Now it was Clara's turn to blush as she let go of her maid's hand. He e, e no problem. Clara, please wait for me. I'll be done in five minutes. Seeing her mistress's facial expression, Rena couldn't help but let out a small chuckle. Afterwards, she turned back to continue her current work, as she had declared, but that didn't stop her from making small talk to distract her mistress from the boredom of waiting. By the way, Clara, why were you so excited? Ah, the dress for my birthday and social debut party just arrived half an hour ago. Oh. That is good news, then your reaction means that it is as you have imagined? Yes, I especially like its color. Well, then congratulations, but why were you so intent on keeping its design a secret, Clara? To surprise you, of course. At this response, Rena stopped her work for a few seconds and turned to Clara. To surprise me? Why, foo fa foo. You will see. <laughs> Rena eyed her mistress suspiciously. Don't tell me. You also want to hand it down to me in the future, eh? Well, yes, that too. Two? What do you mean by two? Now, now, hurry up and finish your work, so I can show you the dress. Even though Rena really wanted to interrogate Clary about those words, she still followed the order and continued hanging up the laundry. When she was finished a few minutes later, they both went to Clara's room. As soon as they reached it, Clara turned to her maid. Wait here for a moment, I will try it on, so I can show you. Have you already worn the dress in front of Lord Eric and Madame Lauren? In Eldos, regardless of country or culture, one was considered an adult as soon as they reached the age of twelve. Therefore, everyone celebrated their twelfth birthday as a coming-of-age ceremony. In aristocratic circles, these ceremonies were called social debut parties. It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience for every aristocrat, on par with a wedding or childbirth. Therefore, the attire that the children wore on that day would be as important as a wedding dress. So, a child would usually show his or her appearance in these clothes first to those closest to them, such as their parents. That was why Clara's next words were so surprising. No, I want you to be the first to see me in it. Of course, Rena knew about the norms of this world, as they had been taught to her at the beginning of her stay in the Dragonheart's mansion, but because she also had the common sense of her previous world, she didn't really mind her mistress's declaration further and just acknowledged it. If you really wish for it, it's fine by me. That response, however, was very much to Clara's dismay in the past. Whenever she had hinted in any way or another that Rena was very dear to her, the red-haired girl had never failed to get red and squirm in embarrassment. Clara very much enjoyed seeing her maid in that state. Unfortunately, it was not meant to be this time. Clara, can you put the dress on by yourself? Do you want me to help you? No. Absolutely not. With a flushed face, Clara rejected Rena's offer instantly and vehemently. Do you want me to get another maid to help you then? Didn't I already say I wanted to show it to you first? Just wait here. With that Clara went into her room, leaving Rena to wait in the corridor. Approximately ten minutes later, Clara's voice rang from inside. Rena, 
You can go in now. At this prompt, Rena opened the door and entered her mistress's room. Only when she had closed the door behind her again, she turned towards Clara. Naturally, she instantly became speechless upon perceiving her mistress's appearance in the dress. In the beginning, Rena didn't think much of the whole social debut business. First, there was nothing like that on earth. Second, Rena was not a noble herself. Even if she could theoretically celebrate her coming of age when she became twelve, she would never have to concern herself with a social debut. And lastly, Rena had never liked celebrations in general in the first place, because they always reminded her that there was no one else in the world to share the festivities with. Now, however, seeing her beautiful crush in front of her, wearing a custom-made dress, Rena couldn't help but change her entire opinion of these celebrations. After all, it was thanks to them, that she could enjoy the sight in front of her. It just showed Rena once again how much she liked the blonde. Clara would turn 12 in a few days. In Yildos it meant that she would officially reach adulthood and could legally get married. In fact, in noble society, it was not uncommon for girls to marry before the age of 15. In a world full of danger, especially where demons existed, it was important to have an heir as early as possible to ensure the survival of the bloodline. That was why the dress that Clara was wearing, had, in Rena's eyes, a little too much emphasis on sex appeal. As the shoulders were wide open, it certainly didn't help that Clara was physically very mature and had a very large chest for her age. To make matters worse, the dress was fitted very tightly, accentuating Clara's figure even more. So, even without intending to, Rena stood there and stared at her mistress, enjoying the view. On the other hand, Clara was delighted upon seeing her maid's reaction. Even she could perceive, that Trina's eyes were literally drawn to her, but that was her goal. It was certainly worth it, sacrificing hours of sleep to practice putting on a difficult dress herself. So, with her self-confidence at an all-time high, Clara decided to even put on a little show, grabbing the hem of the skirt and twirling around. When Rena saw her mistress's actions, she felt even more mesmerized. Once again, it showed her how hard she fell for her mistress. So, even though she had decided to not pursue love, dark emotions still built up inside her when she thought about Clara's social debut. After all, it would mean that the blonde would be looking for a husband in the future. Would Rena still have a place beside Clara when the time came? Rena shook her head frantically to get the depressing thoughts out of her head. Then, she looked at her mistress again. This time, however, without any hint of shyness or the like from before, there were currently more pressing matters at hand, after all. So, Rena took a deep breath. There were some comments about the dress she wanted to give since she first entered the room a few minutes ago. Clara? Yes? If I remember correctly, it is very important to wear suitable clothes for noble parties. Yes, that's right and that goes double for important parties like your social debut, that's also correct, and the norm for those dresses is that if you have an escort partner, then the color of your dress has to match with your partner's hair or eye color, exactly, but for your social debut and birthday party next week, you don't have an escort partner, so your dress should usually have your hair or eye color, in your case that would be yellow or blue. Yes, then, I really have to ask, why is your dress red? 27, chapter 32-B but please, be gentle. Why is your dress red? At Rena's question, Clara tapped her chin with her index finger to show that she was thinking. I wonder why, because I asked for a red dress. Of course, Clara, please don't dodge my question. You know that's not what I meant. Why did you order a red dress? Shouldn't it be yellow or blue in your case? It is, look. Clara pointed to the ornaments and the small stripes on her dress that were in the colors mentioned. They only make up 5 to 10 percent of your dress. Shouldn't those colors be their majority on it instead of red? Usually yes, but I like red. Red is my favorite color. Eh? Rena was genuinely surprised at her mistress's explanation. I remember you saying once that you liked blue the best. Tastes change over time, and so do mine. Now, it's red, Clara said as she slowly approached Trina. Rena, on the other hand, seeing her mistress closing in with a mysterious smile, 
unconsciously stepped back as if to gain some distance from the blonde. But it was to no avail, as Clara continued to close the gap between them again. Therefore, Rena kept going back as if she wanted to escape. For every step Rena took backwards, Clara responded with a step forward. This continued for a few seconds until Rena reached the wall behind her, preventing her from retreating any further. As a result, her mistress was now so close to her, that she could even see Clara's eyelashes clearly. So, as if to distract herself from getting embarrassed by the sight of the blonde's beautiful, well-formed face at point-blank range, Rena resumed her questions. WWYD did its seat change? Unfortunately, her nervousness was at its peak at the moment. Thus, she could only stammer out those words. I wonder why. Still smiling mysteriously, Clara looked down at her maid, who was over 30 centimeters shorter than her. She then slammed her left hand on the wall next to Rena's head and took several strands of the smaller girl's hair with her right hand, stroking them. I really wonder why I suddenly like red so much. Unfortunately, Rena didn't get Clara's implications at all, as her eyes were spinning from the blonde's actions. Or even worse, as it seemed that Rena had fallen into a kind of daze from overheating. Seeing her maid in this state, Clara wasn't quite sure whether she should be happy, or not. On the one hand, it was obvious that Rena appeared to be somewhat conscious of her. On the other hand, the fact that her maid's brain had switched off, meant that Clara had to stop her approaches for the time being. So she grabbed the still-stunned girl's hand, guided her to the sofa, and sat her down. Then Clara settled into a chair across from her maid. Now all she had to do was wait for Rena to come out of her daze. Luckily, it only took a few seconds for Rena to regain her awareness. Awa-wa-wa-wa-wa. Sadly for Rena, just because her brain had turned off from experiencing things that were too spicy for her, it didn't mean that she didn't notice Clara's actions. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Because of her mistress's behavior, her mind was more in shambles than ever before, as she couldn't understand the blonde's actions at all. Why did Clara order a dress with red as the main color? Why did Clara stroke just my hair? Was it because she now likes red? Is she only so kind to me, because my hair and eyes are also red? DDD don't TT tell me. She DD developed her FF fondness for our red BBB because of MMME. Rena glanced at her crush, who was sitting across from her, smiling back in silence. If Rena's meager brain power hadn't been occupied with something else right now, she could have lost herself in that charming smile. NNN no, stupid Rena. You know that's impossible. Save your dreams for when you're asleep. Rena shook her head frantically, trying to clear her mind of her latest thoughts. Then, when she couldn't find an answer to her questions and as if she wanted to divert her thoughts in another direction, she turned to Clara to ask something that had been on her mind for a while now, while pretending to be calm. CCCCCC Clara, I H H H have a QQ question for you. Needless to say, she failed miserably, even biting her tongue. Foo fa foo, no need to be so nervous Tilda. What do you want to ask me? My cute little maid. Pee pee please stop teasing me. Fine, fine. I'll stop, for now. So, what's your question? Seeing how her mistress was still smirking at her, Rena couldn't help but be still somewhat suspicious if Claire genuinely meant it. For quite some time now. Rena had been wondering if her mistress was really going to be 12 soon. After all, if Clara was actually that young, Rena had some explaining to do, like how she, someone who was supposed to be mentally in her 30s, was regularly being played by a girl in her early teens. From an outsider's perspective, it might even look extremely easy for Clara, like taking candy from a baby. So, while Rena felt her pride as a grown woman, in mind, being crushed, she pushed the thought away and continued with the conversation. Clara, are you sure you want me to accompany you to the party venue? Yes, I'm absolutely sure. And I won't allow a refusal. Hearing her mistress's serious tone, Rena couldn't help but feel a little uneasy. But isn't it normally for your lifelong servant? I haven't passed Lord Eric's test yet. It's fine, you will. No, we will definitely pass that test. 
so you don't have to worry about it. B. But wouldn't it be bad if we failed nonetheless? As far as I remember, when a personal servant accompanies a noble in public, it's supposed to be for life, right? S. So if I'm not allowed to stay by your side further, won't it then damage your reputation? Yes, but I still want you to accompany me to my social debut and birthday party. Mumbles so that you being with me forever is finally a fait accompli. Mumbles. Could you repeat that sentence, please? I didn't quite catch the second part. Nothing. I just said that I want you to come with me, no matter what. Understood? Although Rena was a little startled by Clara's suddenly loud voice, she nodded in acknowledgement of her mistress's wish. Okay, now with this out of the way, let's go to your extra lessons. Actually, for Rena. This subject was anything but out of the way. There were still many questions to be answered. However, it was Clara's wish not to continue this topic, so who was Rena to refuse it? Therefore, Rena pushed her remaining uneasiness to the back of her mind and joined Clara on the new topic. As for my magic training, are you sure that you don't get bored watching me practice my magic all the time? You already know how my gravity magic works, so why do you still insist on accompanying me? Ah, if you are worried about me not doing my maid work, I can ask Lady Fran to train me at night again. No, it's not boring and I'm going with you, no matter what. You never know what that perverted elf will do to you if I'm not watching. At these words, Rena tilted her head in confusion. What do you mean? Lady Fran is very good to me, and I thought you don't hate her anymore? Ha! Huh? If you don't understand, then fine. Now wait for me outside the room for five minutes until I change out of this dress. Then, Clara approached Trina, grabbed the smaller girl by her shoulders, and looked intently into her deep red eyes. And absolutely don't go to the elf until I come out. Do you understand? Why yes, Lady Clara. Feeling the pressure oozing out of her mistress, Rena tensed up and could only stutter her confirmation politely in return. Good girl. Now wait outside. It was only when the pressure had disappeared as suddenly as it had appeared that Trina was able to relax and headed for the door. But then, she remembered how vehemently the blonde had refused her assistance in getting dressed. It was obvious to her that Clara didn't like being seen naked and in underwear by other people. So the red-haired girl had an idea of how she could get back at Clara for all the teasing she had received today. Therefore, Rena stopped halfway to the door, turned around, and looked at her mistress with a smirk. Clara, do you want me to help you change after all? Of course, Rena expected her offer to be rejected. If not, she would be in trouble herself as seeing her crush in underwear, or even naked, was definitely too much for Rena. She was sure that her head would explode from embarrassment in that case. And indeed, as Rena had already guessed, the blonde immediately turned red. Unfortunately, however, Clara had seen the smirk on Rena's face and, thus, was able to guess her intention. So, Rena suddenly had a very bad feeling when she noticed that her mistress returned her smile with an evil grin. Rena, I never knew that you were such a pervert. Clara exclaimed theatrically while putting her arms in front of her as if to protect her body from something. Eh? But it's fine. If you really want to see me naked, then come. I will strip. It's my precious maid's desire after all. Eh? It went without saying that the person spoken to, Rena, was as red as a tomato because she had not expected such an answer. To make matters worse, her mistress's adorable gestures and suggestive words made her imagine all sorts of things. Of course, Clara was not the kind of person to let her maid get away with just that. So she started trembling, moistened her eyes, and looked with them upturned at Rena to go for the kill. Be but please. Be gentle. 28. Chapter 33, A. Are you getting married, Clara? Ah ha 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 ha. In the Dragon Hurts mansion, two people were currently walking down the corridor towards the room where the former high priestess was staying. One of them, Clara, was laughing out loud like there was no tomorrow. The reason for this was the girl with a beet red face and eyes filled with tears behind Clara. CC Clara, I'm going to tell Madame Lauren about your unladylike behavior. 
after being utterly destroyed by her mistress, this was all Rena could muster as a last attempt at damage control. It went without saying, that Rena's mind had stopped working after Clara had pulled the bee but please. Be gentle stunt a few minutes prior. He he he. So what are you going to tell my mother? Of course, it was just an empty threat. There was no way Rena could tell Lauren what had just happened in Clara's room, that Rena had wanted to tease the blonde, only to be done in, instead. So, with no counter to Clara's question, Rena just kept silent, while puffing out her cheeks. Unfortunately, this expression triggered Clara's hidden switch even more. But luckily for Rena, they arrived at Fran's room just as the blonde was about to strike again, so Rena was safe, for now. Knock knock come in. Hearing these words, Clara opened the door and entered the room, dragging the girl behind her with her. Hello Fran, I will be intruding on your lessons again. Fine, fine. I've already given up on being alone with Rena. Speaking of whom, where is she? At that question, Clara stepped aside, revealing the red-haired girl behind her. Here, HMPF. The person in question turned her head away from Clara with her arms crossed, still pouting. Of course, Rena wasn't actually angry with her crush. She never could be. She was confident that her fondness for the blonde would still remain even if she was betrayed, hurt, or even killed by Clara. Rena was only sulking because she still couldn't cope with the fact that she was no match for a soon-to-be twelve-year-old girl. What's up with her? Obviously, there was no way Fran could know what the redhead was thinking or what had happened. In truth, Rena really wanted to answer the question so that they could finally move on from there, mainly for Rena. Embarrassing situation. However, she was currently supposed to be sulking, and people who sulk usually ignored their surroundings. So she just kept silent while hoping that her mistress would answer the elf's question as ambiguously as possible. Unfortunately, the world was a cruel place, as five minutes later. ha cough cough ha ha cough bleag. Oh shit. I'm dying cough cough he he he. The former high priestess was rolling around in her bed, laughing, coughing, and what not, after Clara had explained what had happened earlier in every possible detail. You don't have to laugh so much, that you start coughing. Rena couldn't help but grumpily comment on Fran's behavior. Ahaha, I'm sorry, but watching you two is really funny. I have the feeling that it's mostly at my costs. But real talk, Rena, you shouldn't challenge your sadistic mistress anymore in the future. Sadistic? The person in question couldn't let that statement slide but it was unfortunately royally ignored by both Rena and Fran. Why? What? Why? Your mistress is scary in the beginning. I have managed to tease her quite a bit, but lately, I can't do that anymore. She will return the teasing to me instead. And even if you ignore the more light-hearted situations, I don't think that I could even win a serious debate against her. She will be really scary to reckon with when she grows even further, so you need to stay on her good side or you'll regret it. I see. Now that you mention it, even Lord Eric has a fair share of difficulties arguing with her. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, so you'd better never try anything funny with your mistress again. Yes, thank you for your advice, I will keep it in mind. Rena and Fran seem to be on agreeable terms regarding this topic. Um, you both do realize that I'm standing next to you, right? Eh, CC Clara? Of course, I know that you can hear us. However, their reactions to Clara's awkward interjection couldn't have been more different. While Rena seemed to have completely forgotten Clara's presence and panicked, Fran was well aware that Clara was here to hear the compliments, insults, and simply acknowledged it. Ha! Huh. Rena, do you understand that you just got played by that elf, eh? At her mistress's shocking announcement, Rena turned robotically to Fran, whom she had just thought of as an ally. L Lady Fran, D did you also just tea tease me? But instead of answering the nine-year-old girl's question, Fran just looked away and feigned ignorance. In return, it was Clara, who then spoke up. Rena, I hope that you don't think that she was your ally. She just tried to make you say bad things about me. With all due respect, Lady Clara, 
but I don't think that you have the right to say that you are the reason for this in the first place. Hearing the change in her maid's tone, Clara knew that she had gone too far. So while it was now her time to panic inwardly out of fear that she had upset Trina, the blonde approached her maid and stroked the smaller girl's head. I'm sorry Rena, I'll refrain from teasing you from now on. I'll try. Maybe. I can't promise you though. So please, cheer up, okay? Usually, hearing Clara's words, Rena would have definitely retorted, as those words didn't reflect any sincerity in her mistress at all. But with her head suddenly being caressed by the soft and warm hand of her crush, Rena didn't have the mental capacity to do so. After all, she was too busy fighting off the embarrassment, keeping her fantasies intact, and etching the current sensation on her head deep into her memory. Unfortunately for the mistress servant bear, there was currently a third party in the room. In fact, they were in the private room of said third party. Wow. Watching this scene in front of me, I have so many comments that I don't know where to start. Upon picking up Fran's voice, Clara begrudgingly turned her attention to the elf but still kept petting her servant. Do you have to interrupt? We were just in such a good mood. Really? Are you serious? At least try to remember where you currently are. You are in my bedroom, flirting with your clueless wife. He -e. Unfortunately, Fran's words seemed to have made Clara even happier than before, though the elf didn't need to think for long about why. So, after letting out a heavy sigh, she spoke up in a serious tone. All jokes aside, I need your attention now. Noticing the seriousness in the former high priestess's voice, Clara stopped caressing her maid's head. Rena, snap out of it, Fran seems to have something serious to say. Why yes. Although Rena was startled by her mistress's words at first, she managed to regain her composure almost instantly after and turned towards Fran. I'm sorry for the display earlier, Lady Fran. It's nothing you have to apologize for. Now then, take a seat. We need to talk. While saying this to Rena, Fran subtly tapped on her lap as if to show the redhead where to sit. Unfortunately, this gesture went unnoticed by Rena as she moved to stand behind Clara as if it was the most natural thing in the world. To make matters worse, Franz pointing at her own lap was noticed by Clara, which earned the elf an annoyed glare. Seriously, children mature at an alarming rate these days. Even though Rena already seems to act well beyond her age, Clara's behavior really takes the icing on the cake. Once again, Fran couldn't help but be highly impressed by how both girls appeared. Unfortunately for Rena, Fran concluded that Clara's mental age was superior to Rena's, even though the redhead was actually the mentally older one of the two. Have you already seen Lord Derek's guest list for your social debut? Fran asked, after pushing her previous thoughts to the back of her mind. Clara shook her head at the question. No, not yet. I have bad news for you. It seems the Lumiers are invited, just because further invited them. It doesn't mean that. At first, Clara was taking Fran's bad news rather lightly, but after she saw her instructor's grim expressions, Clara could feel the color in her face draining. Don't tell me, they are going to be there? Fran nodded. But before Clara could react to the elf's confirmation, thud, a dull sound came from behind her. When she looked back, her mind stopped working. As she saw Rena collapsed on her knees with tears dripping from her face. Arena, what is wrong? Seeing her maid in this state, Clara jumped out of her chair and rushed to the red-haired girl's side. Hey, are you hurting anywhere? When Rena saw the face of her beloved mistress, she was at first slightly relieved. But then she recalled the bad news that Fran had just told them and, thus, paled again. Then she looked at Clara. Hey, are you getting married, Clara? 31. Chapter 34 dash Would you antagonize your further for your maid? Hey, are you getting married, Clara? At first, both Clara and Fran were confused as to why Rena would come to this conclusion when Fran had told them that the Lumiere family would be attending Clara's social debut and 12th birthday. But then Clara recalled that she had once told her maid that Eric had tried to get a connection to the Lumiere by marrying Clara off. So... Clara spoke up in a gentle voice to calm the agitated Rena down. 
I'm not getting married. Father has already promised me that he won't bring up that topic anymore. Ah, really? Yes, so I'm not going anywhere, okay? MHM. Rena nodded at her mistress's words and wiped her eyes dry. Then she and Clara stood up and returned to their places, with Clara sitting on the sofa facing Fran and Rena standing diagonally behind her mistress. I'm sorry Lady Fran, I have interrupted your important conversation and, once again, showed you an unsightly display. Okay, apology accepted. Well, there's nothing to apologize for in the first place. Are you already completely calm? Yes Tilda. Rena smiled with a bright smile. Good, to hear, Fran said and then turned to face Clara. I know what you're thinking. So please wipe that smug look off your face, it's annoying. Or what? Just let me keep my good mood, ha. Huh? After heaving a sigh, the elf looked at Rena again and patted her own lap. Rena, how about you come here and sit on my lap? Maybe I can calm you further down while I hug you? Ha, huh? stupid elf, what are you saying? Of course, it's rejected. Needless to say, it was Clara who interjected immediately at Fran's suggestion. Rena on the other hand, couldn't follow the conversation since Fran had accepted her apology at all. Still, she managed to decline her teacher's offer. N no, I'm already calm, but thank you nonetheless. My look at this kind, innocent girl. How can it be, that you chose such a feisty mistress? Instead of Rena, it was, once again, Clara who spoke up hissing the white flag. Enough of this already. You win this time. So can we continue our conversation? It went without saying that her smug expression from a minute ago was now nowhere to be seen. Having achieved her goal, Fran flipped her in a switch to turn serious again. Okay, back to the topic. It seems Duke Lumiere himself will come. What? Why should the Prime Minister himself attend the social debut of a Viscount's daughter? He has no reason to. Clara stopped herself during her speech upon realizing what Duke Lumiere's goal was and looked back at the girl standing behind her. A. Eh? Rena was naturally confused by the sudden focus of attention on her. Noticing the redhead's confusion, Clara asked, Do you remember what I told you about the Lumiers? Yes, you said that Lord Derek tried to connect with them by having you marry one of their sons. Rena couldn't help but blush remembering the way she had acted earlier at the thought of her crush getting married. Yes, but I told you more about them, didn't I? Ah, you also explained that the Lumiers are looking for people with strong magical affinities. D don't tell me. Seeing that her maid finally understood the problem, Clara was about to confirm Rena's conclusion, but it was then, when the red-haired girl's next words confused not only her but Fran as well. The Lumiers want you to marry one of their sons, after all. Eh, eh, Rena? How did you reach this conclusion? Clara was the one who broke the short, awkward silence. W well, they collect people with unusual and strong magic abilities. Wouldn't they want you with your fire breath? This time, it was Fran, who answered the maid's question. No, if they did, they wouldn't have turned down Eric's marriage proposal in the first place. It's already well known, that the members of the Dragon Hurts family can breathe fire. Why would they come, then? We have another girl here besides me who has a special magic affinity. Haven't we? Both Clara and Fran looked. No. Glared at the red-haired girl. But without waiting for a reaction from her maid, Clara turned back to Fran. But I also wonder, why they would attend. Did they somehow get wind of the fact that we have someone with dark magic affinity? I think so, the elf shared Clara's conclusion. I suspect you might have a servant here who knows about Trina's abilities and sold the information to the world. Fran, my opinion of you has changed for the better over the last year. You might even say that I trust you to a considerable extent. So please don't say anything that might diminish that trust in you again. Add Clara's words, which sounded like a threat, Fran glared at the blonde girl, who returned it. The staring contest lasted for several seconds until the elf raised her arms in the air. Okay, okay young lady, I'm sorry for my thoughtless words. I didn't mean to offend any of your staff, as long as you understand. The expression on Clara's face softened again. It was then that Rena jumped in again, 
still unable to understand the root of the problem. Um, why do you think that the Lumiers would come for that reason? Maybe they just accepted the invitation to celebrate your social debut and birthday? I mean, they are the Prime Minister's family, right? Maybe they are good people. Fran shook her head at the nine-year-old's words. No, they're absolutely not good people. Only upon hearing those words, Rena remembered that Fran had lost her position as the High Priestess primarily because of the Prime Minister. So feeling bad that she might have hurt Fran's feelings by seeming to protect the Lumiers, Rena left her position, approached her instructor, and bowed. I'm sorry Lady Fran, I have not thought deeply about my words and have hurt you as a result. I hope you can forgive me. Not letting this chance slip by, the elf quickly took the small girl her arms and rubbed Rena's cheeks with her own. Artilda. You are so sweet, Rena. Of course. I'll forgive you. If all people were like you, the world would be a much better place. Relieved that Fran didn't seem to be hurt, sad, angry or the like at all, Rena just kept still and let her teacher do as she pleased. After all, it was because of Rena's careless words, so she was simply reaping what she had sown. Yes, it was only because of her guilty feelings for Fran and not at all because Rena liked the scent of the elf and being in close contact with a beautiful woman. Definitely not. The only problem was that Rena's not objecting to Fran's actions might upset Clara, and indeed, when Rena threw a glance at her mistress, she could clearly perceive that Clara's face was twitching. No, that was putting it too mildly, as Clara's entire body was trembling, close to exploding. Fortunately for the redhead, Clara was able to control herself. Unfortunately, this meant that Rena was in for a long scolding session afterwards. But it was then, when Fran suddenly stopped what she was doing and let go of the maid. This caused both Rena and Clara to look at the elf, only to see a grim expression on Fran's face. Is something wrong? Over the past year, Clara had gotten a pretty good grasp on the elf's personality. Although Fran seemed to be joking around and teasing her very often, too often to be honest, Clara judged the elf to be a trustworthy person. In her eyes, Fran had a good head on her shoulders and knew the political world very well. It was clear that Fran hadn't become the high priestess for nothing. That was why Fran's predictions and analyses of events very often hit the mark. Therefore, when Clara saw her magic instructor's grim face, she knew that something bad was bound to happen. After all, this meant that Fran had just realized something, and it was undoubtedly bad news for them. And indeed, the next words that came out of the former high priestess's mouth, confirmed Clara's bad feeling. Clara, I have a question for you, and I want you to think deeply about it and answer me honestly. The girl nodded, albeit with obvious hesitation. Would you antagonize your further for your maid? 29 Chapter 35 I hope Clara will like it. It was about half an hour after Rena, Fran, and Clara had finished their conversation. Now, Clara was on her way to her father's office, with Fran following close behind. Usually, this was Rena's position, but Clara had sent her maid into town to run some errands. After all, Clara was about to interrogate her father and she absolutely did not want Rena to be there to hear it, because she was sure that her maid would definitely come to some stupid conclusions. Clara wanted to avoid that at all costs. Arriving at the office, Clara opened the door without knocking and burst in. Inside the room, her father sat at his desk, doing paperwork, with Ireland, his guard captain, assistant, and friend standing beside him. Apart from them, there were also several servants helping Eric with his work. Oh, Clara, my beloved daughter, Eric was just about to enter his doting parent mode when he saw Clara, but when he saw her serious facial expression, he changed his tone. Ahem. Clara, where are your manners? Why do you enter a room without knocking? Clara, on the other hand, just ignored Eric's scolding and came straight to the point. What are you planning to do with Rena? Hearing his daughter's question, Eric heaved out a sigh. Then he motioned with his hand for his servants to leave the room until only Clara, Fran, Arland, and Eric himself remained. Clara, your maid's existence. No, your maid's abilities, 
are a secret, so I hope that you stop shouting out her name like that and make her seem special when other people are present, even if they are our staff. Only then did Clara realize the mistake she had made. No, Fran had even warned her before about a possible mole among her staff, but at the time Clara had only been furious with her teacher for that unfounded suspicion. And now, even her father was being secretive about Rina in front of his own servants. True, as far as Clara could tell, Rina hadn't seemed to have had any close contact with anyone else in the mansion for the last two years, but Clara didn't know that it was because of her maid being secretive. So, Clara, what about Rina? Pulled from her thoughts by Eric's question, Clara replied, I heard that you invited the Lumiers to my social debut. That's right. You know that I invited them out of formality. Furthermore, I have heard that Duke Lumiere himself will be attending, that seems to be the case. Why would he do that? Who knows? Slowly getting annoyed by her father's short and evasive answers, Clara stomped over to Eric's desk and slammed both hands on it. Father, please stop dodging my questions. Have you told them about Rena's dark magic affinities? Why would I do that? Because you want to sell Rena off to them so you can be on friendly terms with them. Hearing this, Eric took a deep breath before continuing, Clara, why can't you understand that being friends with them can tremendously increase chances of survival? I would rather die fighting with my friends than sell them out for my own survival. At his daughter's statement, Eric's eyes opened widely as he stared at his soon-to-be adult daughter. Then, a few seconds later, he leaned back on his chair and relaxed his body. Friends, huh? I see. On the other hand, Clara just remained silent because she couldn't understand her father's gestures or actions at all. She could only hope that he would finish his thoughts soon and answer her question. Luckily, Clara didn't have to wait long. I didn't tell the Duke about your maid's existence or capabilities. Actually, I am also wondering why the Prime Minister suddenly announced that he would be attending. Your guess is as good as mine, so I cannot answer your question. Hearing Eric's response, Clara let out a sigh of relief. Even though she was still displeased with the way things were, it was at least clear that her father didn't intend to let go of Rena. But it also meant that they were back to square one again as to why the Lumiers had announced their presence. So, Clara turned to her teacher, Lady Fran. It appears your assumption that my father might be the one who leaked the information about Trina is wrong. At this, Fran just shrugged her shoulders. So it seems, at this point, when everyone present was wondering about the Duke's motives, Clara couldn't help but remember her maid's words, which Clara had previously dismissed as naivety. It can't be that they just want to celebrate my coming of age with me, can it? Clara, my dear daughter? I know that I have taught you well enough that you are not stupid enough to truly believe that. So I'm really intrigued to know who put that bug in your ear. I would like to have a word with that person. Eric smiled kindly. His eyes, however, didn't reflect that smile at all. Ah ha ha. Seeing her father's expression, Clara couldn't possibly tell that it was Rena's idea. After all, she could already see how Rena would be scolded by her father if he were to learn about it. So all Clara could do was laugh it off and hope that Eric would forget about her stupid remark. Unfortunately, the world was a cruel place. When Rena had made that naive remark, there had been a third person present, and that person was known to be very mischievous. And indeed, ah, Lord Eric, it was your daughter's maid. Forgive me, father. It was my stupid idea. I hope you can forget it. So, in order to protect her precious maid from Eric's scolding, Clara voluntarily took the bullet and prepared herself for a long scolding session. But deep down she vowed that one day she would pay Fran back. While Clara and Fran were in Eric's office, Rena was on her way to one of the many market streets of the royal capital, Valhale. The reason Clara had asked her to go to the blacksmith to pick up the weapons they had ordered for Rena a few weeks prior, and that even though Clara had insisted to go together to get them at that time, but well, Rena wasn't stupid. She understood that Clara had just used this fetch quest as an excuse to send her away. 
It was obvious to Rena that her mistress wanted to confront Eric after Fran had expressed her thoughts about Eric possibly giving Rena to the Lumiere for a connection, and Rena's presence at the confrontation might be inconvenient for her mistress, though she couldn't quite wrap her head around why it would be the case. But whatever the reason was, Clara had asked her for something so Rena just had to follow her crush's wishes. It was just a little unusual because, in the past, Clara had never allowed her to leave the mansion alone. In fact, the blonde girl had always accompanied Rena when she went into town, and since Clara was the daughter of a Viscount, they had always had a guard with them. So this was actually the first time Rena had gone out alone after being employed by the Dragonhurts family. An approximately ten-minute walk after Rena had left the mansion, she finally arrived at the high-class shopping street that was clearly meant for the rich population, namely the aristocrats. Usually, this was a place where she would never have set foot in, but as a maid of an aristocratic house, this had changed. After all, she had accompanied Clara here on several occasions already. Fortunately, now even without a noble at her side, Rena was not out of place here. Looking around, Several maids or butlers were walking along this street, shopping for their masters. So even though Rena was a nine-year-old child, who might even look younger than that, no one had spoken to her or sent her away, because she was wearing a maid uniform with the dragon hurt emblem sewn on it. On her way to the blacksmith where her weapons were ordered, Rena noticed a small stall by the side of the road. As this street was a shopping street for the rich, all the shops were usually inside buildings, so this stall stood out a little in a bad way. But this was not what drew Rena's attention, it was the products on display. Therefore, she approached to get a closer look. Oh, young lady, welcome. An old woman who seemed to be the stall owner spoke up as Rena closed in. Good day, ma'am. Did you make these accessories? No, I did not make them. My family did. I see. Rena looked around the stall, then turned back to the old lady. They're also well made. I really wonder why no one else is browsing. These were her true thoughts, not just some flattery as the items displayed were actually really of high quality. Foo fa foo. Thank you, little miss. My great granddaughter will be happy to hear your praise. At the old woman's words. Rena smiled back and returned to scanning the merchandise on display, from rings to earrings to necklaces. Everything that could be considered an accessory was laid out on the table stall. Roughly counting, Rena estimated that there were easily over 50 items placed on the table. Additionally, even an untrained die like Rena's could see that they were all individually handcrafted, each with its own design and theme. She couldn't help but be impressed by the person who made them. Unfortunately, they didn't seem to attract anyone's attention here. Among all these displayed items, there was one that especially stood out to Rena. It was a small oval brooch. It had a red socket as a base that was about 7 centimeters long and 4 centimeters wide. A small blue and yellow crystal was perfectly embedded in the socket. Seeing the color combination of the entire brooch, Rena could feel her face getting hot. Of course. It did not take her long to realize that this was an accessory that mixed her trademark color with those of her crushes. When she looked at the price tag of the brooch, Rena couldn't contain her surprise. Is this the price of this brooch? She had to confirm the price first, as it seemed to be too low for the quality of the brooch. Yes, at that response, Rena immediately took out her purse and placed the exact amount of money for the brooch on the table. I'd like to take this brooch. After the exchange, the girl took the brooch she had just bought with the money she earned as a maid and put it in her bag. Then, after bidding farewell to the old woman, Rena walked, no, skipped happily from just making a good purchase to the actual destination of her outing, the blacksmith. I hope Clara will like it. 25. Chapter 36. Take back what you've said, mister, or you're going to regret it. A five-minute walk further down the street from where Rena had just bought the brooch for Clara, she finally arrived at the blacksmith's shop where her weapons had been ordered. Without hesitation, she opened the door, entered the shop, and went straight to the counter. When the female clerk who was reading a book at the counter noticed Rena, even recognized her, she spoke up. Oh welcome, 
Young maid, you are from the Dragon Hertz family, aren't you? Are you here to take what you've ordered? Rina couldn't help but be a little surprised by the question. After all, it was three weeks ago when she had come here with Clara and a guard. Why yes, you remember me? Ahaha. Uh -huh. Of course, I remember you. It's not very often that I get to see such a beautiful girl with such distinctive hair and eyes like you. Hearing those words, even though they were only flattery, it was inevitable that Rena blushed to match her hair color. She was not used to such treatment, after all. Look at her getting red how cute Tilda. R. Wait for a moment please. I'll get your ordered items quickly. Then the woman put down her book and left the room through a door behind the counter. Not wanting to get bored waiting for the clerk to return with the weapons, Rena looked around the small shop, checking out the items on display. From conventional weapons like standard swords, spears, halberds, and daggers to weapons she had never seen before, this shop seemed to make and sell everything. For example, there was a staff almost two meters long with two blades attached to each end. Even with her memories from her previous life, Rena couldn't remember that such a weapon existed. It was hard for her to imagine how this weapon could be useful in combat, as the risk of self-harm or friendly fire was quite high. But ignoring the strange ones, as Rena looked further, there was one weapon that stood out from the rest. It was like a long flexible cable that had been coiled into a circle so that it could be hung up for display. At one end of the cable was 30 centimeters long stick attached to it, probably serving as a handle. The color of the entire thing was black. I is this a whip? I didn't know that it was a weapon in this world. For some reason, upon identifying the weapon, the face of her mistress came to her mind. Rena didn't know why. But she had the overwhelming feeling that a whip would fit Clara perfectly, even though the blonde didn't fight with weapons, but with magic. What was even stranger was that Rena could feel her face heating up as she imagined her mistress wielding that black whip. Luckily, before the red-haired girl could overheat from her weird imagination, she was interrupted by the voice of the clerk who came back. Okay little maid, I have your... What's the matter? Oh are you still red from earlier? He... How precious. Eh? Ah, no. Um, do you have the ordered weapons? Despite her confusion as to what the clerk was talking about, Rena still managed to push the conversation forward. After all, she wanted to get this errand done as quickly as possible so that she could return to her beloved mistress. Ah, sorry little miss. Here they are. The clerk placed two sheathed weapons on a counter. One of these was a small dagger that Rena could easily attach to her leg under the skirt of her maid uniform. In this way, if her mistress was in grave danger, she could quickly draw the dagger and kill enemies with their hidden blade skills. The second weapon was a one meter long, double-edged sword. Since Rena's sword fighting style was focused on speed and defeating enemies with quick successive thrusts and slashes, the blade of her new sword was especially light and thin. It could even be said to resemble a rapier. At first, before her sword training began, Rena had thought for herself that maybe fighting with a bludgeon-like weapon would be good for her, as such types of weapons complemented her gravity magic very well. But when she had mentioned that she wanted to train with that kind of weapon, Clara had vehemently refused it for some reason. A big club absolutely doesn't fit you at all. She had said, looking back, Rena could indeed see her mistress's point, as she had a small body frame. Even she had to laugh when she imagined a small girl swinging a large club around that was twice the size of its wielder. As a result, at Clara's insistence, Rena was forced to learn to fight with the rapier-like sword. Such an elegant weapon suits you much better, or something along the lines Rena was told by her mistress. And of course, Rena was not one to disregard her crush's wishes. Back to the present. The red-haired girl grabbed her two new, sheathed weapons with both arms. Thank you, mom. Well then, I will take them with me. Goodbye. After receiving a nod of confirmation from the clerk, Rena made her way to the exit. After all, since Clara had already paid for the weapons in advance when they had ordered them a few weeks prior, Rena didn't have to do anything further. So she was free to go. 
But just as she was about to leave the store, a male voice stopped her from behind. Wait, please, little missy. Turning around, Rena could see a man walking through the door behind the counter. He was a middle-aged man, who stood almost two meters tall. From his clothing, or lack thereof, Rena concluded that he was probably the blacksmith who made the weapons that were sold in this shop. After all, apart from a pair of baggy shorts that only reached his knees, he wore nothing but a leather ray print to protect his upper body from the sparks of fire during his forging. As his upper body beneath the apron was naked, Rena could clearly perceive his jacked body. Additionally, his biceps were so muscular that their perimeter was probably larger than the perimeter of Rena's head. Looking at this man, Rena couldn't help but suspect that he had to be more than just an ordinary blacksmith. Even though Rena liked girls herself, she found it hard to resist the urge to touch those oops, so all she could do was awkwardly avert her eyes. Fortunately, or unfortunately, Rena's thoughts were interrupted by the clerk's loud voice. Dear, you can't just show yourself like that in front of a young girl. Show some tact. S. Sorry. But there is something I need to check first. The man apologized to the clerk and walked over to Rena. Excuse me for asking, but who are these weapons for? T. They are for me. As the man approached Rena, she couldn't help but feel a little overwhelmed by his huge presence. And it was not only the sheer difference in their heights. Now that she was closer to the man, Rena could clearly feel his oppressive aura. It made her wonder even more if he had been an important knight before becoming a blacksmith. But unaware of the little girl's inner distress, the man continued, I don't mean to be rude, but these weapons don't suit you. Give them back. A. Eh? W.Y. Before Rena could comprehend the sudden turn of events, the clerk intervened. Dear, what are you saying? The customers have already paid. I will send the money paid up front back to the employers of this girl. It's the Dragon Hurts family, isn't it? No problem. I know them well. That's not the problem. You can't just take back our customers' orders. What's up with you, honey? I can't possibly let a feeble-looking girl like her wielding my prized weapons. Even though the sword is light, I really doubt that this girl could even handle it properly. And now that I look closer, isn't she even much younger than our daughter? Ha! Huh? There's no talking to this guy. Starting to get annoyed with the man, the clerk turned away from him and crouched down to be at eye level with Rena. I'm sorry for my husband's behavior. Please forgive him. I hope that his harsh words didn't hurt you. Rena shook her head, swaying her blazing red hair from side to side. No, I can see where he comes from. I certainly don't look like a can fight. Look like? You mean you can fight? Yes. My employers have been teaching me how to. Rena highlighted the dagger in her arms. I've learned how to quickly kill possible assailants to protect Lady Clara in emergencies. R. Lady Clara is the blonde, beautiful girl, who was here with me a few weeks ago. Then she looked at the sword. The sword is for duels, official fights, or when I fight against demons during the impending invasion. Rena had explained her purpose, hoping that the smith would finally calm down and let her leave. Unfortunately, her words had only achieved the opposite, as he seemed even more agitated than before. TSK, those damned nobles, hiding behind children for their own safety. I have thought better of the Dragon Hurts family, though, but in the end, they're all the same. The man muttered, clicking his tongue. But when Rena heard those words, she couldn't possibly keep her mouth shut. After all, Eric, Lauren, and first and foremost Clara, had done a lot for her, so she couldn't allow them to be insulted, especially since she was the reason for them being looked down upon. Therefore, Rena mustered her courage and glared back at the man, even though he had an intimidating aura around him. Take back what you've said, mister, or you're going to regret it. 26. Chapter 37. HHHH Have I just destroyed their training puppet? Take back what you've said, mister, or you're going to regret it. If an outsider were to see the scene, they would probably fear that the situation in the weapon shop was about to get out of hand. On one side was a nearly two meter tall, muscular man with an intimidating look in his eyes. On the other side of him stood the little girl, who returned his gaze, ready to take up the fight. The state of the girl's mind, however, 
didn't reflect her appearance at all. You are. DD did I just threaten this man? WW what are you doing stupid Rena? Just because he said those things about Clara, it didn't automatically mean was insulting her. Unfortunately, the blacksmith was unaware of Rena's panic attack, which was why he kept that terrifying glint in his eyes. His next words, spoken in a sharp tone, certainly didn't help the poor girl in calming down. Come with me. Then, he grabbed the girl's free hand, which was not holding the two weapons, and led her to the door behind the counter of the store, closely followed by his wife, who sighed in resignation. What the couple didn't notice was that Trina was inwardly praying, praying that her death would be a painless one. Only the gods could know how she came to the conclusion that her death was imminent. But in her mind, for some reason, Rena got the image of a pig being led to the slaughterhouse by a butcher. She couldn't shake off the feeling that this image perfectly reflected her current situation. So, we're here, eh? Torn from her fantasy by the man's voice, Rena looked around to see that she, the blacksmith, and his wife were in a small courtyard at the back of the building that housed the shop and the forge. Unbeknownst to the girls in a confusion as to why they were here, the man walked over to a set of three wooden mannequins that were placed at the edge of the fenced courtyard. These are training dummies. I use them to measure the sharpness and quality of the weapons that I make. Then he approached Trina, took the thin sword from her, drew it from its sheath, and slashed at a training puppet. The result was a cut about 15 centimeters deep in the wooden puppet's torso. See that cut? My swords are sharp. However, it doesn't mean that everyone can cut them like that, just because they have a good weapon. Good skills and techniques are also important to achieve such a deep cut. The man sheathed the sword again and threw it towards Rena, who caught it easily. Seeing that, he gave the girl a satisfied nod and pointed to an undamaged mannequin. Now it's your turn. Show me how deep you can cut it. If you can give me a satisfying result, I'll gladly lower my head and apologize for insulting your employer. Hearing this, Rena approached the training dummies to examine them and assess whether she would be able to complete the given task. Meanwhile, the clerk walked over to the man and whispered to him. What's wrong with you, dear? Don't you think you're being a bit harsh? She's just a little girl trying to make a living. At his wife's words, he clenched his fists and whispered back, That's exactly why. She is a child, who might be even younger than our daughter. Can you imagine our daughter working hard for money and even being forced to train to fight monsters? All this while the nobles hide in safety. Damn it, since King Thor's death. The nobles have become rotten to the core. Even the Dragon Hurts family, Commander Rick would be turning over in his grave if he could see the sorry state of his family, using young, clueless children as meat shields. But is this really the case? I think that this girl likes her current employer. I mean, I even suspect that she might even be very fond of the Dragon Hurts's young lady. The clerk couldn't help but chuckle a little as she remembered seeing the interaction between the mistress-servant pair a few weeks ago when they came to order the weapons. Isn't that even worse? They manipulate this poor girl, so she would even sacrifice her life for their child. That doesn't seem to be the case to me, but how is not handing over the weapons going to help the girl? If her employers are really what you think they are. Wouldn't it put the girl in an even worse position? Seeing that her husband simply remained silent and avoided eye contact with her when the clerk asked the question, she could only exhale in annoyance. No plan as usual, huh? Why did I marry such a dumb man? Ah, because of his jacked body. H hey, aren't you a bit too mean? Um, unfortunately for the man, before his wife could answer his question. Rena interrupted as she finished inspecting the training puppets. So, he turned his attention back to the red-haired girl. So, will you do it? Yes, I have to manage to make a deep cut like yours in the puppet, right? The man crossed his arms and nodded. And if I succeed, you will apologize for insulting the Dragon Hurts family? Again, the man nodded his head. What if I fail? This time, before the man could say anything, the clerk replied. How about you quit being a maid and work for us, eh? Both Rena and the blacksmith were surprised by the clerk's suggestion. That was why the man pulled his wife aside and whispered into her ear. What are you saying? Well, 
You want to help her, right? You don't want the girl to be exploited as cannon fodder, do you? That's why you refuse to sell her the weapons, right? Yes, but if she loses her job because of you, she will have to survive on the streets. So we have to take responsibility for her. Don't you think so? And I think having a cute girl like her as our poster girl, along with our daughter, could really boost our sales. He he he. At his wife's evil grin. The man couldn't help but shrink back a little. Wow, I think that you want to exploit her more than those nobles. But are you sure? Won't the Dragon Hurts family see this as a challenge? I don't really want to fight against nobles. Ahaha. I was only joking. I just want to see her reaction. As far as I can see, this girl won't accept this challenge, no matter what. She is easy to read, after all. By the looks of it, this girl adores her mistress, so she won't do anything that might separate them. Unfortunately for the couple, the easy to read girl wasn't actually easy to read, as she had a somewhat strange thought process. Although the clerk had correctly guessed Rena's feelings for Clara, that didn't mean that the girl would act to make those feelings become true. Who would have guessed that the pride of the Dragon Hurts family was more important to Rena than her own desires? At the very least, not the clerk. That was why Rena's next words surprised and despaired the couple at the same time. All right, I agree to your terms. E-H-H-H. Wait, 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 wait. Um, what's your name? It was the woman who asked Rena the question. R. Forgive me for my late introduction. Rena put down the sheathed dagger and sword, grabbed the hem of her skirt with her then free hands, pulled it up slightly, and bowed. My name is Rena. I am Lady Clara's personal maid. Wow. After saying that, the smith's wife shook her head to get rid of her fascination for the girl in front of her. There were more pressing matters to attend to, after all. Do you know what you've just agreed on? If you lose, you might never see your mistress again. Yes, the pride of my benefactors is at stake. I can't let this go. Then, Rena turned to the smith who had challenged her. I have to recreate a cut as deep as yours on the undamaged part, right? Upon hearing Rena's determined words, the man pushed his confusion to the back of his mind and concentrated on the situation at hand, which was his bet with the little maid. Yes, and the stakes are as I mentioned earlier. If you win, I will bow my head and apologize for insulting your benefactors. If you lose, you will stop working as a maid for the Dragon Hurts and come to my shop and work here in the store as our poster girl. Can I hit the dummy more than once? At first, the man was confused as to what Rena meant by her question, but after thinking about it for a while, he was able to understand her intention. It's fine with me, but I didn't muster up that much strength to get this deep cut on the puppet. In fact, I think it's harder to hit the same spot multiple times to deepen the cut. But you're free to try if you want to. Nodding at the man's words, Rena picked up her sword from the ground, unsheathed it, placed the scabbard on the ground and approached the undamaged, wooden puppet next to the one the man had cut earlier. Then, she assumed her stance by lowering her center of mass slightly and pointing the end of her sword at the dummy. Afterwards, she closed her eyes to calm down her breathing. A split second later, her red eyes shot open again and she leapt at the wooden dummy at a speed that was barely visible to an untrained eye. When she was within striking distance of the dummy she slashed at it once. But because she had only stopped her leap after hitting the puppet, it was now behind her. So, she turned round and used the momentum of her rotation to strike the dummy a second time. This was quickly followed by a third and fourth slash. It did surprise her that she hadn't felt any resistance from the puppet so far, but that didn't stop her from going for the fifth and final attack of her combination to do so. She jumped back two meters before plunging forward again and swinging her sword at the wooden dummy as she passed it. Landing safely on her feet after her last attack, Rena picked up the scabbard to sheath her sword back again. Only then, she turned around to verify whether or not she had won the bet. When she saw the training dummy, or rather what remained of it, she could feel sweat running down her back. After all, the state in which the puppet was, was not what she had imagined. HHHH have I just destroyed their training puppet. 28. Chapter 38. I'm home. 
Clara, HHHH, have I just destroyed their training puppet? When Rena saw the wooden puppet lying on the ground, cut into several pieces, she couldn't help but start internally panicking. But now, upon seeing its condition, she could finally understand why she hadn't felt any resistance when she had slashed it. After all, the sword had sliced through it like butter. Wow, this sword is amazing. The man must be a very skilled blacksmith to forge a sword that is strong enough for me to achieve this feat. A little afraid of how the couple might react to her destroying their training equipment, Rena timidly and slowly glanced at them. What she saw was not quite what she had expected. She had prepared herself to be yelled at like her former parents on earth did, regardless of whether she was actually in the wrong or not. But the owners of this shop didn't. Both husband and wife just stared at her with their mouths wide open. If Rena wanted to, she could even put an entire apple in each of their mouths. So, unsure of what to do, the red-haired girl raised her voice nervously. You um, I'm sorry for destroying your training puppet. Oh of course, I will pay for the damage done. To underline her words with her actions, she pulled out her purse. Since she started working for the Dragon Hertz family she had never bought anything for herself with the money she had earned. After all, it was like a dream come true for Rena to be able to stay by Clara's side and even help the blonde in her everyday life. Therefore Rena felt bad receiving money on top of that. For that reason, aside from buying little gifts for her beloved mistress every now and then, like the brooch earlier, she had never spent her money. So. She was confident that her savings would be enough to compensate for the destroyed training dummy. However, Rena couldn't have been more mistaken in her assumption that the couple would be angry, as the blacksmith's next words showed. Why you? What did you just do? A. I s slashed the dummy. B. But I'm sorry, I didn't think that why your sword was that sharp. S. So I ended up hitting it with everything I had. I see, so you accidentally cut the dummy into pieces. Huh? Ha 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 ha, Rena was your name, you said? Confused by the man's reaction, a weak nod was all the maid could muster in response to his question. Very well, Rena, it's your win. Forget about the damage. The smith approached the girl and bowed his deeply. I'm sorry for insulting your benefactors. I hope that you can find it in your heart to forgive me. Seeing that the smith was serious, Rena managed to calm down almost instantly from her inner confusion a few seconds ago. Okay, mister. I forgive you. The fact that she had managed to regain the honor of the Dragon Hurts family, especially of her loved one, made Rena unbearably happy. For the first time in her life. No. In both of her lives, she felt that she was not useless, that her existence might actually have some meaning. Even though Rena knew that what she was doing was almost irrelevant and that the Dragon Hurts family would never learn about it, she still felt a little satisfaction in her achievement. Therefore, a bright, natural smile appeared on a girl's face. Then, I'll take my leave. Thank you very much for your high-quality weapons. With those words, Rena gave the couple a short bow, picked up the dagger from the ground, and exited the courtyard. After Rena left the couple, they stood there, still dazed by the girl's mesmerizing smile. It took them both more than five minutes to come to again. Honey. The man was the first to speak up. What is it, dear? You said that girl, Rena, came here with the Dragon Hertz's daughter three weeks ago to order the weapons, right? Yes. Do you know what her current situation is? The woman raised her right hand to her chin and looked up, trying to remember what she had managed to overhear when Clara and Rena had visited for the first time. I'm pretty sure that she's the Dragon Hertz's first daughter's personal, live-in maid. Does that mean that she is an orphan? I think so, or at least she was abandoned by her parents. H. Hey, what do you think about a dog? Don't think about it. Before the smith could finish his sentence, he was interrupted by his wife, who had already guessed his next words. Just leave her alone, it's unfortunate for her, but strong and beautiful girls like her will likely end up dead on a battlefield, or as a trophy wife and sex toy for some stuck-up nobleman. As the clerk finished her sentence, an unfamiliar male voice suddenly sounded from behind the couple. Oh Tilda? 
I think I've just overheard something interesting. What are you talking about? When they heard this, the smith and his wife turned around in surprise. In front of them stood a round, bald man in gaudy clothes, who was nearly 160 centimeters tall. Behind him were two men in night uniforms, guarding the round man. Looking closer, the couple saw an emblem sewn onto the man's jacket. It depicted an angel-like woman with yellow, round halo above her head and white wings sprouting from her back. This was the reason why the couple immediately crouched down in front of the newcomer. Gee good day, young Master Lumia. It's an honor to have you visit our humble blacksmith, but why are you here? Forgive me for my rudeness, but this courtyard is a private space. It was the smith who spoke up after identifying the emblem, commoner or not. There was no one in the entire Valkyria kingdom, who couldn't recognize the symbol that belonged to the Ducal Lumia family. After all, it was said that they only lost to the royal family, when it came to power. Amu, lowly commoners like you should cower in fear in the dirt before me. At those words, the smith and his wife lowered their heads further, until their forehead touched the ground. It is as you say, very well, because of your behavior. I might be gracious enough to overlook your rudeness and answer your question. I entered your shop to buy this to help me train my lovely toys. The round man took out the black whip Rina had been staring at earlier, but there was nobody at the counter, so I came here to look for you. I'm very sorry for that. In return, please take the whip in your hand free of charge. Ah ha ha ha. Fine, I'll accept it. So, back to my question. I've heard something about a strong and beautiful girl who might end up as a sex toy. Now, I really hope that someone like that would end up as my sex toy. So, who are you talking about? At the round man's question, the smith could only grit his teeth in frustration. After all, before him stood the firstborn son of the esteemed Lumia family. But since the current head of that house was still alive, the man was still only the heir, despite already being in his forties. Nonetheless, the smith knew that the heir of the Lumias could be gruesome, so he had to answer that question while being as ambiguous as possible to protect Trina's future from becoming even worse. We were talking about a customer who had just bought my weapons. Name, address, and occupation? I don't know. Are you kidding me? Then at least tell me what she was wearing and what she looked like. Thinking that dodging the questions any further might endanger his family, the smith answered the man truthfully, hoping that even then the fat man couldn't do anything with the information. She wore a maid uniform. My apologies, but I don't know from which noble house she was. Unfortunately, it was then that a guard stepped forward. Young master, I think he's talking about the red-haired maid carrying a sword and a dagger that we saw earlier. Ha! Huh? I remember seeing that one because she was indeed beautiful, but I'm not interested in little children. Hearing this, both the smith and the clerk breathed out a sigh of relief inwardly, only to pale again at the knight's next words. But didn't they say that she was strong? Won't she then be an interesting recruit for the lord? <clears throat> yes, you're right. Were you able to see for which house she works? Yes, I distinctly remember seeing a yellow dragon sewn on her uniform. Dragon hurts. Huh? Wait. Didn't further say that he'd be attending their eldest daughter's social debut next week? Yes, he did. Ah ha ha I see. Then I'll have to bring him the good news, won't I? Having said this, the bald man turned back to the couple who were still cowering on the ground and threw them a sack of money. Take it, for I am in a good mood at the moment. Well then, I'll take my leave. Ah ha ha With that, the man and his two guards exited the courtyard and the store, leaving the couple behind. A few moments later, both stood up and returned to their work with the man heading to the forge and the woman to the counter in the store. Despite the silence, both husband and wife were unified in their thoughts. They were praying inwardly for the girl, whose future they might have just destroyed. Leaving the blacksmith behind, Rena skipped along the road to the Dragon Hurts Manor. After all, she was in a pretty good mood right now, having successfully defended Clara's honor and, much more importantly, having bought a present for her birthday next week. The image of her crush wearing a brooch that had their trademark colors, yellow, blue, and red mixed together, naturally brought a smile to Rena's face. 
but just when she thought she couldn't be happier at the moment, she was pleasantly surprised as soon as she entered the Dragon Hurt's mansion. Welcome home, Rena. After all, upon stepping in, she saw her beloved waiting for her. So she was wrong. Her happiness could increase as the smile on the red-haired girl's face grew even brighter. I'm home, Clara. 23. Chapter 39. Interlude 5 to 1. A Father's Worries. It was several minutes after Eric had chewed out his daughter Clara for naively thinking that Duke Lumiere would attend her social debut out of kindness. Of course, it was obvious to him that it wasn't actually his intelligent daughter who had originally come up with the silly thought. Clara had simply expressed an idea that she had heard before. Naturally, Eric already had an inkling who might have put the idea in his daughter's head. That was why, after his daughter had left his office, he had gathered his friend Darland, his wife Lauren, and his daughter's magic instructor Fran in his room to talk about that certain someone. Fortunately, the elf and his guard captain had been there already, so all he had to do was to wait for his wife to arrive. Luckily, the present people and he didn't have to wait for too long, for a knock-knock sound came from the door soon after he had sent his servant to call for Lauren. Lauren come in, at his prompt. The door opened and his beautiful and lovely wife entered. After Lauren had taken her place next to Eric on the couch across from Ireland and Fran, she spoke up. I was wondering what you wanted to talk about, dear, but looking at this lineup, it's probably about our lovely daughter and her maid, isn't it? That's correct. With Clara's social debut coming up, I want to decide what to do with that girl Rena. I see. That's why you also wanted me to be present, Lord Eric? Yes, Lady Fran. So, having taught Rena for two years, what do you think of her powers? What exactly are her abilities? Dear, haven't we already talked about this? Didn't we agree to wait until Rena opened up to us herself? It was Lauren who interrupted her husband as he questioned Fran about Rena's powers. Ah, Lord Eric, Lady Lauren. I don't think that Rena would tell you of her own accord. W.Y., I know, we have almost no interaction with her, but we have never treated her badly. Eric jumped up slightly in panic upon hearing Fran's statement. He knew that his daughter was very fond of Rena. That was why he never intended to let the red-haired girl go. The test he had announced was just a pretext to gauge Rena's and his daughter's determinations. He planned to let them pass, no matter what. In fact, he was quite certain that Clara and Reno would be able to clear what he had in mind easily. Luckily, the elf's next words calmed him down again, sort of. No, Lord Eric, it's not what you think. From what I've seen after observing her for the past two years, I can say that the problem lies within Rena. Why she hasn't opened up to anyone except Clara and me yet. What do you mean? Forgive me, but I think that saying more would invade her privacy. That girl has much going on in her mind. I suggest that you try to have a conversation with her from time to time and get an idea of her personality for yourself. Fine, I'll leave it at that, and follow your advice. Fran nodded in satisfaction at Eric's response. And as for her magic, I won't give you the details. What I can say is, that she is a genius. She will be a force to be reckoned with in the impending invasion. Then, the elf glared at Eric sharply. Never let the Lumias learn about her until she has made a name for herself, if she falls into their hands. Well, just don't let it happen. This time, Eric nodded in acknowledgement of the former High Priestess's words. For you to say that much. I understand, but still, this girl is insane. What do you mean? At Fran's question, Eric turned to his friend and guard captain, Arland, tell her yourself, ha. Huh? Arland saluted at Eric's order and turned to Fran to answer her question. At Eric's behest, I'm in charge of training Rena when it comes to weapon handling. The guard captain himself is training a little maid? Naturally, Fran was visibly confused by Arland's words. After all, a man who was both guard captain and assistant to the head of a noble family had better things to do. Well, yes, because of that girl's circumstances. I can't let anyone else train her. The fewer people who know about her, the better. Arland, please continue. Yes, to be precise, I'd teach her how to fight with a dagger and a sword, and well, 
How should I put it? Rena learns incredibly fast. In fact, a little too fast for my taste. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say she's stronger than most of my men. Stronger? I can't be. Fran was somewhat skeptical about Ireland's statement. I cuddle he, cough touch, cough cough examine her body daily. She doesn't seem to have a lot of muscles. At the former high priestess's words, all three, Eric, Lauren, and Ireland, just stared at her with exasperated expressions. The for Fran uncomfortable silence was only interrupted by Eric after what felt like an eternity. Lady Fran, I don't question your tastes, or actions, or whatsoever. Each to their own, after all. But please, don't commit any crimes while you're in my mansion. Ahahaha, what are you talking about, Lord Eric? It was all to help her with her magic training. I promise, ahem. Please go, Sir Guard. Again, the three of them gave Fran a doubtful look this time for her blatant attempt to change the subject. However, to keep the conversation going, Arland continued, Of course, I didn't mean physically stronger. In fact, that girl is really weak physically. Her blows are light, too light that I even question whether she would be able to pierce someone with her dagger in an emergency. Then what did you mean? It's her flexibility, speed, endurance, and most importantly, her skill with weapons. In a one-on-one -on -one duel, I think she can win against most of my men. No, let's be honest. I suspect she might even win against me. Naturally, Eric was not amused to hear this. Arland, I can understand you wanting to brag about your student, but I can have my guard captain belittle himself. No 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 no, that's not what I meant. I'm serious. I once had a mox battle against her to test her growth. And, well, I managed to win barely. Not what I wanted to hear, I assumed worse with the way you started your sentence. No, this is bad, Eric. The Mox battle was over half a year ago. I never challenged her again because, as I said, I only barely managed to win. I fear that it won't happen again as she has grown since then. Arland, you never told me about this. I only know that you said that she can keep up with you. At the words of his employer and friend, all Arland could do was scratch the back of his head awkwardly. Why yeah well, s sorry. Of course, he couldn't admit that he was too embarrassed to say that he, a seasoned knight, was weaker than a nine-year-old girl. Unfortunately for him, it didn't take a genius to guess what he was thinking, as everyone else in the room had already seen through him. So, to protect his friend's pride, Eric continued. There you have it. That girl is talented in both magic and combat, is intelligent, has good manners, does her work perfectly, and is observant of her surroundings. If that's not insane, I don't know what is. Okay, dear, I understand that Rena is special. I doubt you called us together just to say that, right? W. Well, yes. If it's just that, I would have been really glad to have someone like Rena stay permanently as Clara's assistant. Fufu, I think so too. Dear, her loyalty to our Clara seems to know no bounds. But I think that Rena's feelings for Clara go beyond loyalty. After saying this, Eric turned to Fran. That's also why you're here, Lady Fran. What do you think of my daughter's relationship with her maid? I hope that Clara won't be corrupted by Rena. Lady Fran? Confused by the silence, Eric pressed the elf for an answer, but instead of replying, Fran looked at Lauren, is he serious, ahaha, I have no excuses, he was never good at understanding his own daughter's feelings, uh, what are you talking about, Lady Fran, Lauren, Fran faced Eric again, then, Lord Eric, what do you mean by hoping that Clara won't be corrupted by Rena, I don't see Rena very often, but when I do, I notice that the way she looks at Clara is a little dangerous. No, dangerous is the wrong word. But I suspect that she might have feelings for my daughter that she definitely shouldn't have. I'm sorry to burst the bubble, but your daughter is much more dangerous in that regard. 30. Chapter 40, Interlude 5 to 2, Further Versus. Head of the family. Homosexuality. In the Valkyria Kingdom. No, in the entirety of Gildos. Neither the word homosexuality nor its concept existed. No, this was wrong. Maybe its concept did exist, 
It was just that it was kind of a taboo subject. No, this was also incorrect. It was that nobody talked about that subject openly. Well, why should they? A person's love life was a private matter. It was not as if people who happened to love the same gender were a problem for society or anything like that. So the general view of the population in Lodos was that there was no need to talk about one's sexuality to each their own. Well, that was for the common folk. For the nobility, it was a different story. After all, it was vital for aristocrats to always have an heir in their main family, to keep their bloodline going. It went even double if those families had innate abilities and talents that could be passed on to their offspring. The Dragonhurt's family, for example, was one of them, as most of their family members were able to cast magic with their mouths. Of those with magical abilities, 99% could only use their hands for the loading phase. Therefore, the end of the dragon hurts bloodline meant that the forces of humanity would lose people with very special abilities. So, as the head of the dragon hurts family, Eric had the responsibility to keep his bloodline alive. That was why the current topic of the conversation between him, Lauren, Fran, and Arland was bad news deep in his mind. However, Eric had an inkling that it was no news to him. From his daughter's behavior, he already suspected that Clara belonged to those who loved the same gender, but he didn't want to see it as the truth. He couldn't allow it, so he questioned Fran about her statement concerning his daughter. Can you explain what you mean by Clara being more dangerous than Rena in that regard? Fran was unsure whether it was her place to tell him about his daughter's feelings. She doubted that Clara would mind it since Clara wasn't exactly subtle in her approaches to Rena. No, not only that, Fran was sure that even an outsider with more than two brain cells could instantly see Clara's feelings for the red-haired girl. The only one who didn't see through Clara's feelings was probably the girl in question, Rena. No, maybe Rena knew but just chose to ignore them. That story, however, was for another time. Back to the topic at hand, Fran looked at Lauren, who just nodded in return. It meant that Lauren agreed to have Clara's feelings told to Eric. Therefore, Fran did just that. Then, Lord Eric, I'll spell it out for you. Your daughter is head over heels in love with her maid. Period. I see Eric turn to his wife. Lauren, did you know? Of course. How can you be so sure? Anyone who looks at her a little would know. Eric had no response to Lauren's words. So he could only clench his fists. After all, reading between the lines, his wife had just implied that he didn't see his daughter for who she was at all. Fortunately, Lawrence saw Eric's anguish. So, she explained her words a little more. To this day, Clara had never practiced dancing with anyone other than Rena. W. Well, it's not uncommon for girls to have dance lessons with their personal maid. Clara also never allowed Rena to practice it with anyone but her. Again, Eric was speechless. Furthermore, when they danced together, our daughter always took the male part. In fact, from what I heard from her dance teacher, Clara mastered the male part before the female one. You don't have to say more. I already understand it, dear Lady Fran, Ireland. Thank you for answering my questions today. You are dismissed, for now. At these words, the elf and the guard captain got up and left the room. Before closing the door, however, Fran turned to Eric. Whatever you decide to do with Rena, Lord Eric, please remember her capabilities. I can only repeat myself. She is vital to our forces in the fight against the demons. Losing her to the likes of Lumiere or any other selfish noble family is something I won't allow. Please keep that in mind. After uttering what sounded like a threat to the head of the noble dragon hurts family, Fran stepped out of the room and closed the door, leaving the couple behind. It's still kind of hard to believe. Eric spoke up as soon as he was alone with his wife. What do you mean? Lauren tilted her head at her husband's words. I know that both girls are very intelligent. Too intelligent. In fact, that it's even scary. But aren't they still children? Even though our daughter will be an adult next week, Rena still has to turn ten if I remember correctly. When I was her age, I was absorbed in playing as a knight and so on. It's kind of hard to believe that they already have such, you know, feelings. Foo-foo-foo. Yes, you're right. At that age, 
All you could think about was playing with your sword, so you didn't even notice my advances at all Tilda. Eric couldn't say anything to counter these words. To make matters worse, he could even feel his face heating up with embarrassment. Noticing his reaction, Lauren couldn't help but chuckle inwardly. It depends from person to person, but most girls at that age tend to be more mature than boys in that regard than you might think. And I can safely say that both girls fall into that category, she said, sliding closer to him on the couch and leaning her head on his shoulder. And so, the couple just sat there, enjoying the comfortable silence together. It was several minutes later that the silence was broken again, as Eric spoke up weakly, having finished his thoughts on the matter with his daughter and the maid. Lauren, what is it, dear? At the sound of his wife's soft voice, Eric clenched his fists and faced her. As the head of our family, the right decision would be to banish Rena. From what I've heard today, I'm sure that Clara won't be able to fulfill her duties as the first daughter of a noble, as long as that girl is around. Yes, your assessment sounds right. If I do, she'll probably hate me to death. Yes, she will. But as her father, I'm sure that she will then fulfill her duties, even though she has to bury her own wishes. I knew it all along. I just didn't want to realize it. The same day Clara brought the girl here, I knew it wasn't purely out of goodwill. It was probably love at first sight. Don't you think so, Lauren? Lauren chuckled at his confession. Fufu. Yes that's probably the case. What do you think we should do? What is the right thing to do here? Dear, you are the head. Whatever you decide to do, I will follow. There is no right or wrong here. I see. But let me tell you something good. What is it? Eric looked at his wife with a puzzled expression. There is an obvious way to solve the problem that you have as the head of our family. With these words, Lawrence snuggled even closer to her husband and placed her hands over his. It is a very simple solution in my opinion Tilda. 20. Chapter 41. I get the feeling I'll have a nice dream tonight. It was the day before Clara's birthday and social debut celebration. Rena was currently walking through every part of the mansion where the guests would be allowed to go, checking that everything was presentable. It was said that the social debut was one of the most if not the most important event in a noble's life. It was, after all, their first official introduction to the noble society. And in such a society, first impressions had a huge impact on a person's future. It would not be an exaggeration to say that if the debut failed, one would be shunned by their peers for the rest of their lives. It was not impossible, but a comeback from such a state was hard to achieve. Luckily, the aristocrats knew that very well. Therefore, the organizers and their staff would do everything in their power to make the social debut of their son or daughter a success. As a result, there was hardly anyone who had ended their debut in a failure. That was the reason why Irina made sure that every nook and cranny of the guest area, including the dining and dancing hall, the toilets, and the reception and waiting area were spotless. After all, nothing was more important to her than ensuring that her beloved mistress could look forward to a healthy and happy future. Of all the staff working for the Dragonhurts family, Rena was probably the one who had worked the hardest over the past week, but as she checked the dance hall for a second time, she felt a presence behind her. Hello, little maid. Hearing the voice, Rena tensed up instantly swiftly turned around, and bowed. Gee greetings, Lord Eric. D do you need me for anything? Even though two years had already passed since she had moved into the Dragonhurt's mansion, Rena had hardly any interaction with Clara's parents. While she was able to converse normally with Lauren, she still found it difficult to talk to Eric. There were three main reasons why Rena was still nervous in front of Clara's father. The first, of course, was his appearance. Eric was a tall man with a well-built body who radiated a great deal of self-confidence and authority, as his position as a noble required, but this was a problem for Rena, as these points made Eric resemble her father in her previous life too much. She was simply not good at dealing with such men. The second reason, however, was much more prominent as to why Rena was not comfortable with him. He was her beloved one's father. Rena was well aware that her feelings for Clara were something that should not be, 
That was why she had buried them deep in the depths of her heart. But still, buried or not, she couldn't help but unconsciously stare at her mistress's enchanting appearance from time to time. So, even though she had no intention of approaching her mistress for a relationship, the man in front of her couldn't possibly know that. Therefore, when he was present, Rena had to be especially careful not to reveal her feelings. After all, if he were to know her feelings, she would probably be thrown out of the mansion at once, even if Clara were to protest. The last main reason was that she had never heard him call her by her name before, except on the day when they first met. Naturally, this gave Rena the feeling that he didn't approve of her, maybe even despised or hated her. But luckily, being hated was nothing new to her. Well, never, not even in her wildest dreams, could Rena have imagined that the reason he never called her by her name, was because Eric was simply bad at dealing with little girls other than his daughter and because even he was mesmerized by Rena's graceful manners. Still, even with those three reasons, Rena was usually able to conduct a normal conversation with him. But now, when he had suddenly called out to her, she couldn't avoid being a bit shaken. That was why, she had only managed to stutter out her response. Eric, on the other hand, felt the red-haired girl tense up and thus, felt a little sorry for her, but continued anyway. What are you doing right now? I am double-checking that all the rooms the guests have access to are see clean for Lady Clara's social debut tomorrow. I see. You are working hard for my Clara as always. Thank you. N no. It's nothing you need to thank me for, Lord Eric. I just like doing it. At the thought of her mistress, a small, unforced smile unconsciously appeared on her face, which naturally didn't go unnoticed by Eric. You, I see, Lauren and Lady Fran were right. Question mark of course. Rena wasn't able to understand what he meant, so she tilted her head in confusion. But since she had correctly guessed that his words were not directed at her either way, she didn't ask any further and just waited for him to continue. And luckily, she didn't have to wait for long. I have a question for you. At these words, Rena straightened her back. Why yes, I will answer it as best as I can. Are you? No, your answer to this question is obvious. Why are you so loyal, even devoted to my daughter? Hearing this, Rena couldn't help but twitch nervously. Had he found out about her feelings for her mistress after all? Had she been too obvious? Would she be dismissed now? Such questions popped into her head. Fortunately, her fears were unwarranted, as Eric's next words proved when he saw the state she was in. No need to get nervous. I'm just wondering where your devotion comes from. True, Clara did save you from a terrible fate. But in my opinion that doesn't explain why you work so hard for her. I'm sorry. But I've taken the liberty of having some of my servants observe you for the past two years. What they have reported to me, is that every action you have taken, has always seemed to have the well-being of my daughter in mind. So why, unfortunately, Rena couldn't just truthfully answer his question. After all, how could she reply to him, that she had simply fallen in love with the first beautiful and kind girl she had met? And how could she tell him that she was only loyal or devoted to Clara because of her impure feelings like love? Rena knew very well, that it was neither devotion, nor loyalty, or whatever Eric had called it. It was just her selfish desire to stay by the side of her crush, even if the love would never become true. So how was she supposed to answer that question? Meanwhile, Eric observed the girl closely as she tried to come up with an answer for him. Unfortunately, or fortunately, for her, he was notably accurate when it came to reading people's thoughts, so he could already more or less guess from Rena's gesture and facial expression what was going through the girl's mind, and exactly because he could see through the girl before him, he was now certain that his daughter would be safe and happy with Rena by her side. So, for the first time in his life, he bowed his head to a commoner. A little girl at that. Please be good to my dear daughter. I leave her in your hands. Unlike Eric. However, Rena was not good at reading people at all. No. This was putting it too mildly. Rena was terrible at guessing other people's thoughts, especially when it came to people she had almost no interaction with. That was why Eric's actions only confused her more and even caused her to panic. And Lord Eric? What's the matter? H. Have I done something wrong? 
If so, please forgive me. Despite the growing fear in the girl's eyes, Eric couldn't help but laugh at himself inwardly. The reason for this was that he had considered selling Rena to the Lumiers, firstly, to get her away from his daughter and secondly, to get a connection to them. But now he was glad that he hadn't gone through with it. In fact, he regretted that he hadn't interacted with this girl more often, because he would have then been able to see who Rena really was much sooner. He would have understood much earlier that having this girl at Clara's side would only make his daughter happier. So, for the first time since he had hired her, he naturally called her by her name, Rena. I've heard that Clara wants you to accompany her into the party venue. However, with Rena being Rena and unable to see through people, the change within Eric went unnoticed by her. She didn't realize that Eric had accepted her to be at his daughter's. So, she only nodded to confirm his statement. Have you accepted? He asked further. Isn't that role only for permanent servants? I'm not one yet, so I can't. But Cla, Lady Clara is too insistent, and won't accept my refusal. Eric chuckled slightly at this answer. I see. Then I ask you as well. Please accept my Clara's proposal and accompany her to the party venue tomorrow. Rena might be socially awkward and slow when it came to reading people, but she was not stupid. Well, maybe she was stupid, but not stupid enough to misunderstand Derek's words this time, especially when that much had already been said. Still, Rena wanted to be sure, so she asked for confirmation. Lord Derek, does that mean... He nodded and bowed his head once again. Yes, as I already asked earlier. Please take care of my daughter from now on and forever. When he looked up again, he was met with wide, red eyes and an astonished expression. W what about the test? When he heard that question, he was unable to keep a clear conscience. After all, the said test was never meant for Rena but for Clara. It was just an excuse so he could buy time and of his servants observe Rena until the time for the test came. That was important for whether he would employ Rena as his daughter's permanent assistant or not. After all, back then he hadn't known whether to pass this girl to the Lumiers or not. The outcome of the test didn't matter. But when he saw the anxiety of the girl in front of him, he actually felt bad. After all, Rena could have never been sure of her future because of this, and that had probably been bothering her all along. He couldn't possibly imagine the impact it had on the mind of such a young girl. Still, his mistakes had been made and it was impossible to undo them. He could only hope that the girl would be able to rest her mind from the uneasiness from now on. For that reason, he smiled softly as he answered her question. You don't need to worry about the test anymore. I'm sorry that you have to feel anxious until now. Regardless of the test's outcome, I would like you to stay by my daughter's side forever, or at least for as long as you want to. Come to my study after Clara's social debut tomorrow. We can sign the contract then. As you wish, Lord Eric. MHM. Well, I've distracted you from your work long enough, so I'll leave for now. Ah. And remember to rest well tonight. We need you to be at your best to support Clara after all. With these words, Eric turned away and left the ballroom. Only when he was out of Rena's sight, she returned to her work again. But for some reason, she felt that her motivation was at its peak at the moment. For some reason, she found it hard to resist the urge to skip instead of walking normally. For some reason, she felt as if a huge weight had been lifted from her shoulders. For some reason, she couldn't wipe out the wide grin off her face. And for some reason, I get the feeling I'll have a nice dream tonight. 24. Chapter 42 Dash Who is the girl standing behind you? The next day, after having a wonderful dream that Rena, unfortunately, couldn't remember, she had woken up at the usual time and had started her day in the usual way. However, this was no ordinary day for her or the Dragonhurts family. It was the day of Clara Dragonhurts's social debut, so all the staff had been running around like chickens since long before sunrise, including Rena. But now, as the sun was at its peak in the sky, Rena was currently standing behind the blonde girl at the main entrance of the Dragonhurts mansion, greeting the guests who came to celebrate Clara's twelfth birthday and coming of age, aka social debut. This was Rena's first official job as her mistress's permanent assistant. Well, 
first official job sounded more pretentious than it actually was, since all Rena had to do was to stand behind Clara and bow with her. Whenever a new guest arrived, if the blonde didn't know the name of a newcomer, it was Rena's task to remind Clara of their name when they approached. Although that sounded difficult as more than a hundred guests had announced their attendance, it wasn't actually that bad. The reason for that was two facts. First, Rena's memory capabilities of her second life were kind of overpowered. She had no problems at all, as she could easily associate thousands of names with their respective faces. Second, her mistress was also quite high spec. Not once had Rena had to remind Clara of a name. So, as already mentioned, all Rena had done the whole morning was literally just stand there and occasionally bow to the guests. And since she had remembered the guest list, she knew that one was still missing. It was Duke Thales Lumia, the Prime Minister of the Valkyria Kingdom. In a country where social status played a major role, it was the norm for the less important people to arrive first at these gatherings, and for those of higher status to come last. Therefore, the first to arrive was Rena's and Clara's magic instructor Fran, who was a commoner. At first, Rena found it odd that Fran had left the mansion early in the morning only to enter the party venue through the main entrance later, but it made sense to her after Clara explained the reason. Fran didn't officially live at the Dragon Hurt's manor. Keeping up airs was important, after all. What stood out to Rena was that Fran hadn't arrived alone. Fran was accompanied by a woman who appeared to be a dark elf. Rena recognized it because the former high priestess's companion had a pale skin tone, silver hair, and long ears. Even though the dark elf was not on the guest list, the fact that she came together with Fran could only mean that the newcomer was the former vice knight commander Milia. Fran's friend, and since invitees were allowed to bring a certain number of companions with them, neither Clara nor Rena particularly minded Milia's participation. But apart from the two commoners, nothing that had happened so far had been out of place. The only thing that bothered Rena was that the guests all had been staring at her for a while before entering. Was it because of her unusual hair and eye color, or because she was particularly ugly? Back to the topic at hand. Because guests of lower social standing had to come early and guests of higher standing tended to arrive late, both Clara and Rena had still to wait for the arrival of Duke Lumia. Since he had the highest ranking among the guests, he would naturally be the last to arrive. Luckily, they didn't have to wait too long. A large carriage, which could easily hold ten people, pulled by four full-grown horses, appeared at the gate. The image of a woman with angel-like wings and a holy halo over her head, painted on the door at the side of the carriage, clearly showed that it belonged to the Ducal Lumia family. When it stopped in front of the gate, the driver at the front hopped out of his seat and opened the door of the carriage. Out of it stepped a dandy, old man with neatly combed, white hair and a white moustache. He wore black, gaudy clothes adorned with decorations that made Rena want to puke inwardly when she thought of their value. So this is Duke Thales Lumia, the Prime Minister of this country. Rena had heard that he was supposed to be over 70 years old, and indeed, he certainly looked the part, judging by the wrinkles on his face and the colorlessness of his hair. But it was only when compared to the values of her previous life in a world full of dangers like Yildos, where even traveling from one city to another was risky, it was uncommon, if not even outrageous, for people to reach his age. Even royals who had even better health care and guards often died before turning 60. And now, a few meters in front of Rena was an over 70-year-old man, who looked healthy even by the standards of first world nations on earth. The duke stood tall, with a straight back and an expression on his face, radiating the confidence that he still had many decades to live. That, however, was a different story for the man who stepped out of the carriage after the duke. He was a round, bald man, not even 160 centimeters tall, who had difficulties even walking down the five steps of the stair leading out of the vehicle. He was the Lumiere's firstborn son. Seeing the state he was in, Rena couldn't help but sympathize with the man a little bit. After all, 
his figure very much resembled her own in her previous life. From her experience, she knew how uncomfortable it was to have to live with a body like that. Especially when Rena got the taste of what it felt like to have a high spec and healthy one. But it wasn't that she had only felt physically uncomfortable in her skin in her past life. It had been also mentally draining back then. The reactions, the hatred, and the contempt she had received, had been much worse in her opinion. That was why, Rena unconsciously glanced at her mistress from behind. How would the kind Clara react, if she found out that I once looked like that? Would she still want me to serve her? Or, but when Rena saw, that Clara didn't even flinch upon seeing the second man step out, Rena felt somewhat relieved. Still, it didn't automatically mean that Clara would accept Rena's old self, to begin with. After all, Rena didn't know about her mistress's sexuality yet. So she still assumed that Clara liked men. And one usually tended to be more lenient in judging the appearance of people of the sex one was attracted to. So, just because Clara didn't look at the fat man in disdain, it didn't mean that Clara would react the same way to Rena. Still, it was better than nothing. Unbeknownst to Rena's inner thoughts, the two Lumiers approached with two guards in tow. When they stood in front of the girls, Rena and Clara bowed in unison. While Rena, a maiden servant, remained silent, Clara spoke up to greet them. Greetings, Duke Thales Lumia, and young master Terma Lumia. My name is Clara Dragonhertz. I am very grateful for your attendance at my twelfth birthday and social debut. Please enjoy your time here. Usually, this would have been the end of the conversation. The Lumias and their guards would have entered the mansion and Clara would have followed after ordering the gates to be closed so that the celebration could be started. However, both father and son were still standing in front of Clara, staring at her. No, this was not it. The over 40-year-old young master was the only one staring at the blonde. One could clearly see what was going through his head as he leered at the blonde girl. For Terma Lumia, Clara Dragonhertz who was much more mature than her peers with her well-endowed chest, was right in the middle of his strike zone. On the other hand, the Duke, Thales Lumiere was not interested in Clara. It was the red-haired girl standing behind the blonde who caught his eye. Even though Rena wasn't looking at him, she could feel his intense gaze on her. With the conversation between Clara, Fran, and herself a week ago in her mind, she couldn't help but be afraid of what the Duke might be thinking staring at her like this. She could only hope that it was her unusual hair color or her ugly face that drew his gaze. However, the world was a cruel place. Normally, it was unheard of for guests to show their interest in specific servants of another noble family. Especially when those servants were personal ones, as in Rena's case. That was why both mistress and servant knew that it was going to be a long, busy, and headache-inducing day when they heard Duke Thales's next words when he turned to Clara, who is the girl standing behind you. 23, chapter 43 dash only over my dead body. Who is the girl standing behind you? Thales asked after turning his inspecting gaze from Rena to Clara. Forgive me for my rudeness, Duke Lumia, but please follow the norm yourself and don't ask for information about other people's servants. At Clara's courageous words, the glare on Thales's face intensified to a degree that made even Eric look like a child by comparison. I don't like to repeat myself. That was why his few words were enough for Clara to clench her fists and give in. She's my permanent personal maid. Personal, I see. What's her name? Her name is Rena. Rena? What family is she from? I can't remember seeing anyone with her distinctive features among the nobles of the kingdom. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Duke Lumia, but she has no family name. Usually, were Clara calm, she would have never disclosed that Rena had no family name. But under the Duke's pressure, Clara had no choice but to answer his question truthfully. A commoner is your permanent assistant? I see. Is she so special that you want to bind her to you like this? Duke Lumia, the guests are waiting, please go in so that the festivities can begin. HMPF, very well, I'm looking forward to the party. With these words, the Duke, his son, and the two guards entered the mansion. 
Only when they were out of sight did Rena move from her position behind her mistress and close the gate as no more guests would come. And even if they did, they wouldn't be allowed to enter because the most important invitees were already present. When Rena came back half a minute later, she saw that her mistress was still there, so she spoke up, Clara, is something wrong? Don't you have to hurry up and change into your dress? Ah, yes. Thank you for reminding me. I was just deep in thought. Come with me. After I have changed, you still have to accompany me to the party venue for my speech. Yes. Rena smiled happily at her mistress's words. With that, the two girls entered the mansion, hand in hand, pulled by Clara. Even though it might seem to an outsider that the blonde was taking advantage of the confusion of the situation to grab her maid's hands, Clara's mind was currently occupied with what had happened earlier. No matter how I look at it, the Duke knew about Rena and was clearly interested in her, but how? Who has leaked the information? Further said that it wasn't him and I don't think it was a lie. It also certainly wasn't Fran neither, because she seems to have her own agenda with Rena. My Rena, I will have to interrogate her about that one day. Well, I've shown to all guests today, that Rena is my personal maid, so even the Duke won't make a move on her. Will he? Clara looked back at the girl, she was pulling along, who tilted her head and smiled. See cute, I have to protect her from the Prime Minister at all costs. While Clara was, once again, pumping herself up to protect Trina, the girl in question had the same thoughts, only the other way around. That man, to The way he looked at Clara was dirty. No, I absolutely can't have someone like that standing next to Clara. I'm her personal maid. It's my job to ensure that Clara marries a respectable man. Lumiere's first son is out of the question. Rena stealthily glanced at her mistress, who was currently pulling at her hand. As they walked quickly to reach the dressing room, Clara's long, curly, blonde hair fluttered in the air. Once again, her mistress's appearance fascinated Rena, but at the same time, Dark feelings were building up inside the red-haired girl. Dark feelings that were buried deep inside her but still couldn't help but resurface from time to time. Dot 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 if. Renan unconsciously tightened the hand that held Clara's and thought of the brooch in her pocket she had failed to give to her mistress. Dot if I only were. While Clara was changing into her ordered dress, the guests gathered in the party venue's main hall, and because the Lumiers had just entered a few moments ago, Everyone knew that the party was about to begin. Nonetheless, in order to pass the time until the head of the Dragon Hurts family entered to give his speech, the people in the room talked to each other. And of course, as one might have already expected from a noble gathering, the guests divided themselves into groups of their respective political factions. Naturally, the two Lumiers, as the family with the highest standing, had the most aristocrats gathered around them. And yet, regardless of their faction, they all seemed to be talking about one topic. Who was the red-haired maid standing behind the dragon Hertz's daughter? Which family did she hail from? Was she a commoner? Why would the famous dragon Hertz family choose a commoner to be their eldest daughters, and thus, their heir's personal assistant? Did the maid have special abilities? Was that why the Ducal Lumiere family attended this party? Because they had heard about her? Such questions were on the minds of most of the guests. This is bad. Naturally, Fran, who was also waiting in the main hall, noticed the interest of all the guests present. What do you mean? Fran looked at her silver-haired, dark elven friend, Milia who had asked the question. I'm talking about the mood of all the aristocrats here. They are all wondering about Rina. Rina? You mean your people with the dark magic affinity? Fran nodded. Yes, you know. The red-haired maid who greeted us along with her mistress at the front gate. Ah, her. I've been wondering about it since we've arrived. Why did you even allow that girl to stand at the entrance to greet guests? Her facial features. Well, I don't want to sound weird, but a cute child like her would naturally attract attention. Additionally, her red hair is not what I would call inconspicuous. Of course, I would have objected to it, but if I had, it would have made me very suspicious. I can't have my covert to be blown yet. For the world, Milia wasn't able to respond to her friend's words, 
She knew very well how much Fran had given and would still give for the safety of the world. So, the Dark Elf simply remained silent and waited for the former High Priestess to continue. Clara, the blonde girl and today's star, was hell-bent on binding Rena to her. I kind of understand that. But I also can't help but think that announcing Rena's existence to the world is somewhat illogical. I mean, the attention is all the more focused on Rena now. And now forget about binding her. If someone found out about Rena's abilities and revealed them, the whole country would be after her. Fran, I think you should have stopped Clara. Well, there's no crying after spilled milk now. Yes, I know. Unfortunately, Clara is head over heels in love with her maid. These feelings have made her unable to think straight, so there was no way I could reason with her. LL love, you say? Why you mean that kind of a love? Milia blushed a little as she said these words. Noticing her friend's state, Fran put her palm in front of her mouth and grinned mischievously. Fufu, our innocent, former Vice Knight Commander is blushing at the thought of love. However, this only cooled Milia's embarrassment. You are absolutely in no position to tease me about this. Who was it who gave up everything including, manners, healthy eating, and love for the sake of research and magic? Before Fran could counter her dark elven friend, the sound of a trumpet echoed through the entire hall. This caused everyone to turn to the elevated platform that resembled a stage at the end of the hall. A few seconds later, the large double doors behind the platform opened and a tall, blonde man entered the hall. Arriving at the center of the stage, he spoke up. Greetings, honored guests. I am Viscount Eric Dragonhertz. I would like to thank you all for your attendance today to celebrate the 12th birthday and social debut of my dear daughter. He then stepped aside and pointed pompously to the door through which he had passed. And there she is, my daughter, Clara Dragonhertz. With that, the trumpet sounds came out of nowhere again. Simultaneously two figures stepped on the elevated platform through the door. The first one, obviously, was Clara. She was wearing a red, shoulder-bearing dress decorated with yellow and blue clothes stripes and ornaments. Complementing this outfit was a yellow tiara with a red crystal on Clara's head. At first, everyone in the hall wondered why the main color of Clara's dress was red. But when they saw the red-haired maid, who had closely followed Clara into the hall, it didn't take long for everyone to understand the message behind Clara's outfit. Throughout the morning, everyone had been speculating about who the maid they had seen at the entrance might be and whether she might be someone with special powers. Now, everybody knew that the maid was indeed special, at least for the dragon Hertz's firstborn daughter and heir and said I challenged all who were interested in her red-haired maid. After all, Clara's coordinated attire literally screamed. Only over my dead body. 20. Chapter 44- Where is the Duke? Like my father, I would also like to thank you all for attending my 12th birthday and social debut. I hope that we can work together to fight back the demons in the future invasion. For today, please enjoy yourself with the entertainment we have prepared for you. After her greeting, Clara bowed curtly but gracefully, which was followed by applause from the guests. With that, the celebration officially began and they returned to their respective groups and factions. They were now free to dance, eat, or socialize with each other in the party venue. Then, Clara turned round and whispered in her maid's ear, Thank you for now, Rena. As we've already discussed on our way here, please leave the party venue and stay in my bedroom until the festivities are over. Um, are you sure, Clara? You don't need my support anymore? Even though they had already discussed this topic, Rena was still unsure as to why she had to be sent away. She wasn't able to understand Clara's plan and thus, couldn't help but feel abandoned. The blonde, on the other hand, immediately saw through her maid's thoughts. So she put her hand on Rena's head to comfort her. You don't have to look like an abandoned puppy. I've already told you, haven't I? I've already achieved my goals for today. 
so it's counterproductive for you to be here, drawing even more attention to yourself. So I need you to hide for the rest of the day, okay? This time Rena nodded weakly and left the hall through the door she and Clara had entered earlier. After closing the door from outside, she made her way to Clara's room, as she had been instructed, naturally. With all the staff of the Dragon Hurts mansion busy entertaining the guests at the venue, the corridor, where Rena was walking through, was empty. That was exactly why Rena could feel that there was something unsettling in the air around her. As if to prove her suspicions right, the lights in the corridor suddenly went out after a few minutes of walking. Feeling that all her senses were screaming for Rena to duck down, she followed suit and did just that, narrowly avoiding a hand holding a needle that was about to pierce her neck from behind. Thinking fast, and concluding that someone hostile had sneaked up on her, Rena quickly kicked back, and indeed, her hunch was correct and her feet hit something, perhaps the assailant's shin. So she used that something as a launching pad and jumped forward to gain distance from her attacker. After landing safely and stabilizing herself, Rena turned around, only to see that there was no one there. The unseen assailant must have gone into hiding in the meantime. For Rena, not being able to see who was attacking her, was a major disadvantage. She had to immobilize them at once or her life might be in grave danger. Therefore, a split second later, Rena formed a large, black magic circle with her feet and stuck it to the floor through her shoes, effectively creating a barrier around her, that would pull anyone stepping into the area of effect to the ground. A year ago, this feat would have been impossible for her, as it was usually unheard of to form magic seals through clothing, especially shoes. So, her training with Fran had definitely paid off. As planned, a few seconds after Rena had cast the spell, a thud sound came from behind her, causing her to turn around. What she then saw, was a black-robed figure, sprawled out on the floor. Unfortunately, because the attacker was hooded and lying face down. Rena wasn't able to recognize that person, so she cautiously approached the lying figure while maintaining the gravity magic that held the assailant down. At that moment, all of Rena's instincts suddenly cried out to her again, telling her of the fast approaching danger. Therefore, in a split second, Rena quickly drew her dagger from under her skirt, turned in the direction from which she felt the incoming danger and deflected a needle that was flying at her. But because of her sudden action, and because it happened so quickly, the red-haired maid couldn't keep up her gravity magic. As a result, the assailant, who had been pinned to the ground until now, managed to get up. Although Rena realized this, she wasn't able to react in time. So the hooded figure, back on its feet, leapt at Rena and stabbed her in the neck with a thin needle from behind. At that moment, Rena felt her consciousness fading, as the needle either was coated with some sort of paralyzing poison or had hit an important nerve. Either way, she knew from that moment on, that she wasn't going to get out of this situation unscathed. So, as a last attempt at retaliation, she turned the dagger in her hand around and swung her arm backwards, stabbing the figure behind her. Ugh. FCK? Naturally. It wasn't without consequences, as the hooded figure kicked Trina in rage in the back with all his might, sending her flying several meters forward. Are you okay? A second person, who had probably thrown the needle at Rena, approached the hooded figure. That damned brat stabbed me, Arland. You useless piece of shit. I'll tell the Duke about this. Now take that damned brat. This was the last Trina heard before she lost consciousness for good. After sending Rena out of the party venue, Clara made her way down from the elevated stage. For today, she had three goals to achieve, which she hadn't told anyone. Not her father. Not her teacher Fran. Not even her now official personal assistant Rena. After all, her first goal was about Rena. Clara wanted to reveal her maid's existence to the world while demonstrating that the red-haired girl was her personal assistant. Clara knew that it was impossible to hide Rena and her capabilities from the world forever. A girl with such hair, eyes, and face would attract attention at some point. So today, at her social debut, Clara decided to show that a certain red-haired commoner girl was bound to the Dragon Hertz's firstborn daughter. In a society full of rumors, gossip, and conspiracies, 
This information was bound to spread throughout the entire Valkyria kingdom and even the whole world. Clara was quite certain that there were seldom people with red hair. So when someone spoke of red-haired girl, it would be clear to everyone, they were talking about Rena, her maid. This should make her beloved assistant a somewhat untouchable existence in noble circles. Even powerful families like the Lumiers would find it difficult to approach Rena without facing a backlash. Clara's second goal was to establish connections. With her social debut behind her, she was now legally allowed to seek out other noble families trading companies, and other powerful individuals or organizations to officially become friends. For that, Clara had already chosen a few, among them, were former High Priestess Fran and former Vice Knight Commander Milia. In the past, they would have never made it on her shortlist for it, but over the past two years, it had become clear to her that they, at least Fran, were highly intelligent people with their hearts in the right place, not to mention, these two were still quite popular with the common people, so Clara was sure that she would have some use for them in the future. Though she was aware, that Fran had some hidden agenda with Rena, that was not a problem at the moment. Apart from these two, Clara also wanted some connections with merchants who might sponsor or even invest in her. Unfortunately, none of the people on her shortlist were invited, as her father had compiled the guest list. So she would have to visit them at a later point. Last but not least, Clara also needed powerful, political friends. Sadly, she didn't know which noble family to ally with yet, so she had to look for some at this party. Her third goal for today was, of course, to keep an eye on the troublesome ducal Lumia father and son bear and their two guards. Even though Clara had sent Rena away from the party venue, she couldn't be too sure that they wouldn't also leave to make a move on her maid. So, after confirming that the Duke and his three companions were present, Clara headed over to Fran and Amelia for their official first meeting. After all, it was a secret that Fran was her and Rena's magic instructor. Clara had to show to the public, that she had now had ties to the former High Priestess and the former Vice Knight Commander Milia. Greetings, Lady Fran. Greetings, Lady Milia. Once again, I'd like to thank you for attending my debut today. Fran, as intelligent as she was, immediately saw through Clara's intentions, and since her student's action didn't collide with her plans, she went along with it. Young Lady Dragonhurts, congratulations and happy birthday. I'm also grateful for the opportunity to be here today. Likewise, congratulations on reaching adulthood and happy birthday, Lady Dragonhurts. Your grandfather, Knight Commander Rick was very good to me in the past. He told me how proud he was of you when we worked together. Seeing how you are now, I'm sure that he would have been even prouder. I'm sorry for what happened to him. Milia bowed deeply after her words. Thank you for your kind words. Lady Milia, I can't say that I've already forgotten about everything, but you don't have to worry about it that much anymore. In return, I hope to have a fruitful relationship with you in the future. About that, may Milia and I visit you in the near future? We have things to discuss with you, Lady Dragonhurts. It would look bad to the other guests if a person of higher rank asked for a trade with someone of lower rank. So Fran, as the one with the lower standing, took the liberty of requesting a private meeting with Clara. As a former high priestess, she knew that nobles love to keep up appearances, so she did Clara this small favor. Needless to say, the young dragon hurts agreed to it. With that the three of them talked, chuckled and even laughed a little to show their amicable relationship to the other guests. Only after a few minutes, when Clara had decided that it was enough, she parted ways with the two elves. What remained today was to find allies with political power. For that, they needed to be at least a Viscount. Of course, a Count would be better, but beggars couldn't be choosers. So before Clara walked around looking for potential business partners, she made sure that the Lumiers were still present. Luckily, she didn't have to search for long before she caught sight of a plump, bald man. But when she realized that he was alone, her mind went blank. Where is the Duke? 19. Chapter 45. So this is what a kiss feels like. Where is the Duke? After looking around, Clara could see an over 40-year-old, fat, bald man, comfortably seated in on a chair, 
drinking wine, eating, and conversing with nobles from the Lumiere's political wing. However, the leader of that faction, the Duke himself, was nowhere to be seen. Oh, no, where are his guards? To make matters worse, the two guards who had accompanied the Lumiere were also missing. This is bad. What a blunder. I was too careless. The Duke had already shown his interest in Rena. That was why Clara had sent her maid away from the party venue. That way, the Duke would have no chance to make contact with her maid. She had never thought that he would actually sneak away, but in the end, he did. For Clara, this was the worst case scenario. Unfortunately, as the star of today's celebration, Clara couldn't just leave now to make sure the Duke wasn't following Rena. So all she could do was to hope that the current thoughts swirling in her head were her pessimism playing a prank on her, and that the Duke had only stepped out with his guards to freshen up in the powder room. Rena, hearing her name called out in a familiar voice, Rena opened her eyes. In a dark void in front of her stood a blonde girl with curly hair, who was at least a head taller than her. That girl had a sad expression on her face and was on the verge of crying. Rena, I went out of my way to be kind to you. I picked you up off the streets, fed you, gave you clothing, and even educated and trained you. The girl started to cry. Sob I did so much for you, so why? Tell me, Rena. Why? We. Oui. The crying expression twisted into one of rage, leaving no trace of the girl's once beautiful face. So tell me. You useless piece of shit, you say you love me, don't shit on me. I tease not love, you would have never done that if you were to really love me. After shouting these words, the blonde girl, Clara, closed her eyes, seemingly trying to calm down, when she opened them again. She stared at Trina with her cold eyes. You know what? I regret saving you that day. I should have left you to your fate back then. Now. The girl's mouth formed a terrifying grin, that made Rena tremble with fear. No, that's not it. I wish I had killed you with my own hands back then. I wish. But before Rena could hear the end of the blonde sentence, her mind was pulled away. And she opened her eyes. This time for real. Oya, you're awake? Hearing a male-sounding voice, Rena tried to assess her current situation. She was lying on her back on a couch in a room that seemed familiar to her. She tried to stand up, or at least sit up, but it was to no avail. Neither of her limbs wanted to obey her. Therefore she tried to remember what had happened in the first place to get her into this situation. Fortunately, it didn't take her long to recall that she had been attacked on her way to Clara's bedroom. Was I kidnapped? This was the only conclusion she could come to. Have you finished assessing your condition? The male voice prompted Rena to turn her head in the direction it came from. What she saw was a dandy, old man, sitting comfortably on a sofa with his hands resting on his crossed legs. She recognized him. He was the current Prime Minister of the Valkyria Kingdom, Duke Thales Lumia. Behind him stood three men. Two of them were the guards that Rena had seen accompanying the Duke and his son at the entrance. But since one of the two guards had a blood-soaked bandage around his right thigh, Rena didn't have to be a genius to guess that he was the assailant from earlier. However, the presence of the third man behind the Duke could prove to be very troublesome for her mistress's family in the future. Sir, Arland, at the words that the red-haired girl managed to stutter despite her condition, Arland averted his gaze. Seeing this, and realizing that staying here would not end well for her and the Dragon Hurts family, Rena gathered all her mana and formed a large magic seal underneath her to immobilize everyone in the room. Or at least she tried to. Oh, 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 what an energetic young girl we have here. It's useless. My servant has injected you with a poison that has two effects. The first is to paralyze you and the second is to temporarily seal your mana. This statement shocked Trina to the core, even more than the fact that she was practically being kidnapped or poisoned. After all, she had learned from Fran an expert on everything concerning magic and its uses, that it was impossible to seal one's mana away. If it were really possible, it would be a game changer when it came to fighting beings made of mana, and according to Fran, most demon races were such beings. No, it's not the time to think about this right now, I have to get out of her as soon as possible. 
Rena thought to herself as if to try to convince herself that it was possible. Unfortunately, as on earth, with age mostly came wisdom and the experience of reading the minds of others, as both a duke and the prime minister of a great kingdom, Thales Lumiere had, needless to say, much of both. Guessing the thoughts of a young girl, especially one as expressive as Rena, was a child's play for him. Calm down, little girl, I'm not going to bite. No, you sending your men to attack me demonstrated otherwise. Rena had to muster all her courage to refute the Duke's words. Unexpectedly, instead of being offended by Rena's rudeness towards him, the head of a ducal family, Thales laughed out loud in amusement. Ah ha ha ha, you're brave, little girl, I like it. Well then, in recognition of your courage in talking back to me, I shall explain my actions to you. Well, except that there was not much to explain in the first place. Your little mistress was guarding you like a precious treasure. There was no way I could talk to you like this if I approached you normally. That's right. I just want to have a little chat with you. His explanation sounded extremely absurd and fishy to Rena, but since there was nothing she could do to validate it, she remained silent for now. But before that, the Duke turned to his uninjured guard. Bring her in. Following Thaler's order, the knight left the room through a door behind them and returned a few seconds later. This time, however, the guard was not alone, as a girl entered the room with him. Rena estimated her to be around 11 or 12 years old, as she appeared to be slightly shorter than Clara, who was very tall for her age. The newcomer had brown, straight hair that barely reached over her shoulder plates. Like Rena, the girl also wore a maid uniform. That uniform, however, was clearly of a much higher quality than Rena's, but that was to be expected from a maid of a ducal house. Apart from the brunette's well-formed face and slender frame, which showed signs of malnutrition, her black eyes stood out to Rena. After all, those eyes resembled Rena's in her former life, filled with hopelessness and despair. Seeing that, Rena could more or less guess what life that girl had led until now. Unaware of Rena's thoughts, Thales took out a small vial of light blue, transparent liquid and gave it to the girl. Do it. The girl nodded weakly at the command and walked over to Rena, who was still lying on her back on the couch. Unfortunately, since Rena was still paralyzed, she could only watch helplessly as the girl approached. When the girl was finally beside Rena, she crouched down, opened the lid of the vial and to Rena's surprise, drank its content. But the redhead had no time to be shocked as the brunette's face suddenly drew closer until Rena felt something soft against her lips. Exclamation mark. Seeing the girl's closed eyes only a few centimeters away from her, Rena didn't have to be a genius to realize that the soft, wet feeling on her lips was the brunette's lips. Rena's mind already went blank at that, but the other girl was not done yet as Rena soon felt another soft and slimy object trying to open up her lips, and with Rena in full confusion mode, it wasn't long before her upper and lower lips parted. Then she felt a liquid flow from the older girl into Rena's mouth and soon down her throat. Only after what felt like an eternity did the girl's face pull away from Rena's again. Shocked, Rena immediately sat up and slid to the other end of the couch to get as far away from the girl as possible. She then unconsciously brought her fingers to her lips as if to try to relay the feeling from earlier on them, all while staring at the brunette's lips. Needless to say, Rena's facial color matched her hair and eye color at this point. Furthermore, her brain was in full-on overheating mode. As a result, she didn't even realize that she could move her body again and that the liquid the girl had just forced her to drink was an antidote to the paralyzing poison. Rena even completely forgot about the situation she was in, with Duke Lumia, someone who was supposedly hostile to her mistress, sitting across from her watching her every move with judging eyes. After all, never in her life had she dared to dream of ever receiving a kiss, let alone one on the lips. Once again, Rena glanced at the brunette who was still standing at the other end of the sofa. For some reason, that girl seemed to be ten times more beautiful and a hundred times cuter than before. There was no way that Rena's face wouldn't heat up and that her heart wouldn't speed up. After all, Rena had just received something from this girl 
that she had never experienced before. So this is what a kiss feels like. 16. Chapter 46 dash dot if you don't want your beloved mistress to suffer, so this is what a kiss feels like. Rena was so deep in her fantasies, remembering the feeling on her lips, that she didn't even realize she was muttering those words out loud for everyone in the room, the brunette girl, Duke Thaler's Lumia, his two guards, and Arland, to hear. So, now that you can move, can we talk? That was why Rena's already red face blushed even more when she heard the duke's voice, but then she remembered the seriousness of the current situation, so she shook her head to get rid of her air embarrassment and confusion, only afterwards did she realize that she could move her body almost normally again, so she quickly formed a magic seal on the floor to pull everybody in the room down, but failed again. Seeing the red-haired girl's actions, Thaler's sighed in annoyance. I'm not stupid enough to cure you of that what seals your mana. So don't try it. Like I said, calm down, so we can speak. The Duke intensified his glare. I don't like repeating myself. Because of the pressure, Rena had no choice but to follow the command, and so she sat back down on the couch. Good girl. Noticing that was Rena obeying him, Thaler's mouth formed a subtle smile. Now. What do you think? What are you talking about, Duke Lumia? Thalers pointed at the brunette. Do you like her? As Rena's gaze followed his fingers, eventually landing on the girl she had kissed earlier, she felt her face heat up again. Looking at the red-haired girl's reaction, the Duke didn't need any confirmation. Before you're wondering, information is one of the most important resources in the world. Needless to say, I know everything about you. Rena cooled down almost immediately when she heard those words. After all, they implied that he even knew about her hidden feelings for her mistress. She knew that she had to keep them to herself at all costs. After all, even though Eric had entrusted Clara to her, in Rena's mind, it was only as Clara's personal maid. In other words, Rena feared that the Dragon Hurts family would still kick her out if they found out about her impure feelings. That was why, if the Duke were to know about them, it would be bad news for her, as he could use that information as blackmail material. Naturally, those fears were written all over Rena's face, so Thalers had no trouble reading her thoughts. No need to panic, little girl. No, Rena. I want to have a friendly relationship with you. Those words managed to calm Rena down for a bit, but she still eyed the Duke suspiciously while keeping her guard up. After all, she had been attacked earlier, and Fran and Clara seemed to hate that man. There was no way she could be on friendly terms with him. So, back to my question. Do you like this girl? Thalers asked ignoring Rena's suspicion while once again, pointing at the brunette. Rena nodded weakly, the brunette maid was someone she had shared her first kiss with, there was no way, it wouldn't leave a lasting impression on her mind and emotions, after all, Rena had always been someone who fell in love easily, too easily, in fact, that was also why she had literally gone through hell in her past life, I see, you know, your feelings for your mistress are not meant to be, never. A commoner has to know their place and keep their filthy hands off those with noble blood. The same goes for you. Even though his words were beyond harsh, deep down, Rena felt them resonate deep within her. She, too, thought that someone as dirty and ugly as herself should stay away from someone as pure as Clara. So, how about I give her to you? He looked at the brunette. She currently serves my household as a maid, but I can give you full control over her. You can do whatever you want with her. I think it's a good offer. Don't you too? What do you even want from me? Is it? Is it because of my magic? Rena was reluctant to ask her second question at first, but when she remembered that Ireland had probably betrayed the Dragon Hurts family, or that he had even been working with the Duke from the beginning, Rena lost her hesitation. Oh, oh. I thought you were just a stupid child who couldn't control her emotions, but you seem to be more than that. Color me impressed. Thalers praised Rena without any hint of sarcasm. That's right. I want you to serve my family. With the impending demon invasion, I need as many strong individuals as possible. But it's not only your dark magic or swordsmanship that I desire. Having said this, 
Sailors clapped with his hands. This prompted the uninjured guard to leave the room again, only to return a few seconds later. But this time, instead of a girl following him, the guard held a sealed small box in his arms. The guard then looked at the Duke and received a nod from him. So, he unsealed the box and opened it. Before Rena could even realize what was happening, a neary feeling crept up her spine, as a dark cloud escaped from the box. The cloud gathered in the middle of the room, not too far away from everyone present. At this, Rena jumped to her feet, ran to the brunette, grabbed her hand, and pulled her to the edge of the room, as far away from the cloud as possible. Rena knew what she was seeing. It was a demon spawning cloud. After all, she had touched one two years ago. At that time, she had literally gone through hell, for the physical and mental pain she had felt back then was unbearable. It was as if her loved ones had personally ripped off her skin and tortured her to death. She had hoped to never encounter that fog again. So her instinct was to get as far away from the cloud as possible and to take with her the girl she had shared her first kiss with. Only when Rena was convinced that the cloud posed no immediate danger to her or the girl, she turned her attention to the one responsible, namely Duke Lumia. W what have you done? Calm down. How? Huh? With the demon spawning cloud here? Won't demons crawl out of it soon? Yes, they will soon. Then how can I stay calm? Why are you doing this? As I said, it's not only your magic and swordsmanship that I desire. Now, touch the cloud. I should touch it? Rena couldn't believe what she was hearing. She was determined not to obey this command. Just remembering the pain she had felt two years ago made her want to puke. Unfortunately, the world was a cruel place and the Duke didn't come unprepared. So seeing that Rena hesitated, he continued, If you don't hurry up, demons will come crawling out of there. I can defend myself. I doubt that the demons would ignore you. So your guards and Sir Ireland will surely fight. Oh oh, clever girl. Yes, you're right. They will fight to protect me. But then, I have another question for you. Do you know where we are? How should I know? You're the one who drugged me and brought me here. Well then, look around. Only then did Rena realize that she hadn't even checked where she was. So she looked around the room. Unfortunately, there were no windows, so she couldn't see outside. Still, she had the feeling that she'd seen this room before. But she couldn't quite put her finger on where and when. Annoyed by Rena's slow thinking, the Duke spoke up. Ha! Huh. We are still in the Dragon Hurt's mansion. Wow, now imagine. You have invited many of this kingdom's nobles to your social debut, only to have them injured or even killed by demons running amok during the festivities. Only after these words from the Duke, it dawned on Rena what he meant. She couldn't let that happen. Wasn't she determined to ensure Clara's happy future? Rena let go of the brunette's hand and slowly approached the cloud while trembling in fear of the pain she was about to experience. Yes, your mistress's life as a noble would be over. No, maybe she. No, the entire Dragon Hurts family could be even accused of treason for working together with the demons. In that case, only the gallows would await them. With each step Rena got closer to the dark cloud, her trembling became more and more intense. That's right. Rena, touch the cloud. Suck it into your body. Show me your true potential. With the Duke's words in the background, Rena reached out her hand and touched the demon spawning cloud. If you don't want your beloved mistress to suffer. 14. Chapter 47 Dash Never Negotiate on Your Own Again. Lady Clara, what is it? Section Dollar Percent and it's your maid. In front of Rena, in a familiar dark void. A girl with brown hair wearing a maid uniform approached a slightly taller girl with curly, blonde hair, Clara. The brunette seemed to be complaining about the blonde's maid, namely Rena. In Rena's eyes, Clara had always looked at her kindly. This time, however, when the redhead's name was mentioned, Clara faced grimaced in annoyance. Now my good mood is gone. What about her? Since I was forced to give her the antidote mouth to mouth. She has been looking at me with her lecherous eyes. She has the nerve to misinterpret it as a kiss. She is your property, so keep her on a leash. Ha! Huh? She is not my property, nor do I want her to be my property. She's just someone I stumbled upon when I was upset about my father. I just saved her to distract myself. But because of that, 
she sticks to me like a creep. At these words, the brunette looked at the blonde with pitying eyes. So you too, huh? My condolences. What can we do? Clara shrugged her shoulders. There's nothing we can do. Just ignore her and hopefully, she will leave automatically. Confidence sounds a bit different to me. Well, I'm not. After all, she's still by my side after two whole yay. Splash. Fortunately, Rena didn't have to listen to this conversation for much longer, because, for the second time today, she was suddenly pulled out of whatever she was watching. This time it was because water had been splashed on her face. So when she came to, Rena sat up straight on the couch and let her eyes wander around to check on her surroundings while trying to regain her focus. She was in the same room as before. When she saw the four men, the Duke, his two guards, and the traitor Ireland, Rena was even a little happy. Happy, because what she had seen in that void was only a dream. It's just a dream. It's just a nightmare. Rena repeated these sentences over and over in her head as if she was trying to convince herself, but just as she was about to be convinced that what she had seen in the nightmare earlier was simply that, a nightmare, her gaze landed on the brunette maid. This caused Rena to tense up immediately. Is something wrong, mistress? The girl asked Rena in a monotone voice with an expressionless face. As the girl held an empty glass of water in her hands, Rena didn't have to think long to conclude that the brunette had splashed the water over her face to wake her up, for which Rena was genuinely grateful. It took a few seconds for Rena to realize what she had just heard. She tilted her head and looked at the girl's expressionless face. M mistress? Yes. From today on. I'm yours. By order of Duke Lumia. Those words caused Rena to turn to the Duke. I haven't accepted your proposal yet. Now, now, Rena. You're exactly like Arland has told me. Sometimes you're clever and quick thinking. Sometimes you are slower than a newborn. Especially when it comes to yourself. Look around you and reassess your situation before you reject my proposal. Seriously. Why am I, who you apparently see as your enemy? giving you advice. I wonder about that as well, Rena thought to herself. Nonetheless, she followed his advice and looked around again, this time more attentively than before. Only then, she noticed that the demon spawning cloud, which the Duke had somehow set up earlier, was gone. So, you finally figured it out. You have the power to cleanse demon spawning clouds. I want that power in my grasp. You treating other people like objects doesn't appeal to me at all. Rena pointed at the brunette to stress what she meant. Why should I work for someone like you? Ah ha ha ha, there's a lot of courage hidden in that tiny body of yours. Now hear me out, before declining my suggestion. I've shown that I'm capable of capturing demon spawning clouds in boxes. Such a thing is unheard of. The amusement on the duke's face vanished at once and his expression twisted into an intense, oppressive glare. You surely understand what it means that I revealed such information to you, don't you? Rena gulped under the increased pressure she suddenly felt from him. Of course, she understood what he was implying. He was threatening her. The Duke had no intention of letting her leave this room without achieving his goals. So either she agreed to serve him, or she wouldn't leave this room. It was that simple. However, before she could even seriously think about his offer, he continued, I'm not a monster. I won't separate you from the Dragon Hurts girl if you agree to serve me. Then what do you even want? Be patient. I'll get to it. I want two things from you. The Duke paused for a moment, then raised one finger. First, I will give you missions in the future. I want you to complete them. No questions asked. And before you complain, hear me out. Then, he raised a second finger. Second. I want you to accompany a select few of my subordinates to slay the Demon King as soon as his location is known! Exclamation mark. Not even letting Rena be shocked by his demands, he pressed on. Of course, you won't work for free, I'm also known to be a generous man to my allies. So I will be to you, Rena. What do you think, who has the most powerful military in the kingdom right now? It might be your private army. That's right. Not only have I employed highly powerful and talented individuals, many have also sought to be part of my forces. Let me tell you this. 
It's no exaggeration to say that my army is stronger than the Valkyria Kingdom's official one. In fact, you might already know this, but Viscount Dragonhurts also asked for my protection several times. He even offered his daughter as a bride for my son. But you have refused, and Lord Eric is no longer interested. Ahaha, yes, because he has you now. On a side note. Remember my firstborn son, Tima? Rena nodded. The one who accompanied you, but isn't here with you in this room? Yes. He seems to be very interested in Dragon Hertz's daughter. He will surely ask me to get that girl for him. Rena tried her best to keep calm, to no avail, one might add. Seeing the red-haired girl's reaction, the Duke smiled and leaned back on the couch. Now, what do you think my answer would depend on? So, if I agree to carry out all the missions you give me and accompany your unit to subjugate the Demon King once his location is known, you'll leave my mistress alone and won't support your son marry her? My son probably wants to have that girl as a sex toy instead of a marriage partner, but that's the gist, yes. In addition, I will take the Dragon Hurts under my family's protection during the demon invasion if Viscount Dragon Hurts is still interested. Lastly, I will give this girl. He pointed at the brunette to you. You will be her mistress then. Did it ever occur to you that I might agree with you now but refuse to carry out your so-called missions later? Don't underestimate me, girl. I can burn this entire capital to the ground with a snap of my fingers. Erasing the likes of Dragon Hurts from existence is no task. It's a minor inconvenience at best. Do not misunderstand me. I could have simply kidnapped you, drugged you, and beaten you into submission. But I've taken a liking to you, so I've just decided it would be better for us to start on friendly terms for now. Don't take my grace for granted. So, what will it be? Friendly terms, or not? At these words. Rena got off the couch and dropped to her knees. I would like to agree on your terms. The Duke smiled. Good girl. I allow you to call me by my name. Do you still have any questions? Lord Thalers, I do. Then let me hear them. Um, this girl. Rena looked at the brunette standing beside her. Is there anything that binds her to you? An unusual question. No need to be afraid. I won't take her away from you. Nothing is binding her to me or my family. I picked her up a few days ago, just for you, so be grateful. I see. Then I have another question. I assume that there is a way to unseal my mana again? Otherwise, you wouldn't be interested in having me as your servant. Ahahaha, I may be repeating myself, but your intelligence is all over the place, Rena. Sometimes, you're quick, sometimes, you're just plain stupid. To your question, yes, your mana will be available to you in a few days. You don't have to do anything. As for how I sealed it, I'll keep it a secret for now. Show me your loyalty to me first, then we can talk about it later. Anything else? Rena thought for a few seconds, then shook her head. I see. Now for the future. As you've already guessed, Arland works for me. I will assign your future missions through him. Fortunately for both of us, there's nothing for you to do in the foreseeable future. So continue training under him and that high elven teacher of yours to become stronger. Of course, you must not tell the dragon hurts that Ireland works for me. Yes, Amu. Well, we can call it a day. I'm going back to the party venue. Your overprotective mistress will be suspicious if I stay away for too long. And I'm sure you still have some things to discuss with your servant. Wait, Lord Thalers. How long has it been since I was brought here? Ah, you were unconscious two times. I completely forgot. Sorry about that. I estimate it has been a little bit over two hours since then. Hearing that, Rena was visibly relieved. It meant that Clara's birthday wasn't over yet. There was still time to give her the present. Meanwhile, Thalers, the two guards, and Arland headed for the exit. But before the Duke completely stepped out of the room, he turned to Rena for a last time. Last but not least, I have some advice for you, which will do you good if you keep it in mind. Rena tilted her head. Yes? You're too naive and you show your emotions on your face too quickly. Never negotiate on your own again. 11. Chapter 48- Rena. You were my first and you will be my last. Next. The room was silent after the Duke and his group 
including Ireland, had left, neither Rena nor the girl, the only ones left, said a word, while Rena was busy alternating her facial expressions between blushing and paling at the memory of the kiss and the nightmare respectively, the brunette just stood there, watching her new mistress. The colors of Rena's face had changed a dozen more times before she finally had enough and pulled herself together. Only then she managed to look at the brunette seriously. Um, may I ask you a few questions? Of course. The girl answered in a monotone voice that matched her expressionless face. But please don't be polite to me, mistress. Oh, okay. But in return, also talk to me normally. A and P please don't call me M mistress. Especially the mistress part was important to Rena, as she couldn't stay calm when a cute girl addressed her like that. All right, I will talk to you informally, but I will still address you as mistress. Unfortunately, Rena wasn't allowed to have a calm mind, so she slumped her shoulders dejectedly. Deep down, though, she was pleased with the answer. Fine. Call me what you want. Um, first of all, can you tell me about yourself? Yes, mistress. I'm Marianne, 12 years old. I was living with my single mother when Duke Lumiere picked me up four days ago. D did he kidnap you? No. It was a clean transaction. What do you mean by that? Rena tilted her head at Marianne's strange phrasing. My mum got a huge amount of money from the Duke. S so she sold you off? Marianne nodded. Yes, even though we were poor. She loves to have a gaudy lifestyle. She accepted his offer without a second thought. I see. I'm sorry for asking but. Do you want to go back to your mother? Why do you ask? Because you still have a family, unlike me. Just because the Duke treated you like a commodity. It doesn't mean that you are one. If you want to go back to your mother, I won't stop you. In fact, I think you should go back to your family while you still have one. No. I stay with you. I S.C. Rena couldn't help but look down and blush at this straight answer. After all, Marianne's words were easy to misunderstand. Fortunately, Marianne spoke up before the wrong ideas could take root in Rena's head. Can you also tell me about yourself, mistress? Why yes, of course. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself first. With that, Rena told Marianne about her name, her age how she had lived in an orphanage, how she had escaped from the orphanage, how she had come to the capital, and how she had been hired as Clara's personal maid. Naturally, Rena didn't tell the brunette anything about her magical abilities. Don't you think it's hard to work at your age? Rena shook her head, swaying her red hair from side to side. No, I love working here, especially for my mistress. A soft smile appeared on her face as she thought of Clara. Do you love the young lady Dragon Hurts? Hi you e. At this question, Rena jumped up from the couch and took a karate-like stance, as if she was about to fight Marianne for whatever reason. LLLL love? WWWW what did he do why why you mmm mean? Ignoring, or not caring about the strange sound Rena gave off or the strange posture she took, the brunette clarified her words in a still monotone voice. You had a very soft expression on your face when you spoke about the young lady. That's why I guessed you might have romantic feelings for her. WWW what A-R-Y-Y-U-T-T -T talking about? I D G D don't tell LL love her. I see. I understand your situation, mistress. Because of the difference in status between you and her, you have to hide your relationship. Don't worry. I'll keep it a secret. Hi you e e e e. Needless to say, Rena couldn't keep up with why Marianne had gotten that misunderstanding and how to clear it up. Now, I can also understand the Duke's orders. He knew you like girls. That's why he ordered me to give you the antidote mouth to mouth. He wanted to use me as a honey trap to get you on his side. Fortunately, Marianne's words were serious enough to calm Rena down almost immediately. Of course. Rena had already suspected that Marianne's presence was only meant to pique her interest. Or rather, Thalers had even said so himself. Still, when the brunette told her that the kiss was just an order, Rena couldn't help but feel a little hurt. It wasn't that she was hopeful or the like, but still, anything that hurt, hurt. Do you hate me? 
Marianne tilted her head at the question, which came out of nowhere for her. Why? Rena tried but wasn't able to look into the older girl's face. You were separated from your home because of me. The brunette seemed to think for a moment, but then, instead of answering the redhead's question, she asked another one. I ask you again. You have romantic feelings for the young lady Dragon Hurts, haven't you? After realizing, that Rena couldn't just sit this question out. She nodded weakly with a bright red face. After all, this was the first time ever, in both of her lives combined, that she told anyone about her feelings. Are you going out with her? This time, Rena shook her head. Do you want to go out with her? Again, Rena shook her head. She had no intention of ever becoming romantically involved with anyone. However, Marianne had other plans as she listened to her new mistress's answer and slowly and surely approached Trina, but the red-haired girl didn't understand what the brunette was up to. So Rena simply remained still and watched as Marianne came closer and closer until Marianne's malnourished looking but still beautiful face was only a few centimeters away from her. Then, for a split second, Rena felt a beck on her lips before Marianne backed away. Only then did Rena realize what had just happened. However, maybe because of the serious mood they were in, she didn't go into overheating mode as one might have expected. Rena still got red, but it was not from embarrassment. Why? Why have you done that? You asked me if I hate you. Does this answer your question? Marianne was still calm despite Rena's displeased face. No. Not at all. I love you, mistress. Wah! Well, hearing this, the red tint on Rena's face intensified, as her emotions changed from anger to embarrassment. A few seconds later, however, she realized, that there was no way that Marianne's words were the truth. So the red color faded again. She sat down on the couch and took a few breaths before speaking up. Indeed, your actions have answered my question. So you hate me so much, that you want to get my hopes up, only to crush them, right? Sadly for you, I've already experienced that. Before I died. The last sentence was murmured so quietly, that Marianne couldn't hear it. No, that's not it. Then explain yourself. Rena crossed her legs as she glared at the brunette. This might be the first time in both of her lives combined, that she had ever felt so irritated. As I've said before, I was living with my single mother before the Duke picked me up. No, it might even be appropriate to say that he saved me from the hell that was called home, and by extension, because he did it for you, you saved me, mistress. Of course, Rena didn't buy the brunette's absurd logic. So she remained silent for now and waited patiently for her to continue. And since Marianne was no fool, she correctly guessed the younger girl's intention and went on. My mum. No, that woman is a single mother who loves buying unnecessary stuff. Well, maybe it's also because of her job that she often wears expensive accessories and fancy clothes. What is her job? It didn't escape Rena's attention that Marianne was talking about her mother in a hateful tone. She's a prostitute. She works in a so-called high-class brothel, aimed at rich commoners, or the lower nobility. I see. Prostitution was something, that Rena couldn't evaluate. She just didn't know what to make of it and what to comment on Marianne's words. Of course, young girls selling their bodies for a daily meal was nothing to scoff at in her opinion. But what about adult women or men, who had chosen this profession? In fact, in her past life, Rena had often, too often in fact, considered visiting a lesbian brothel, but in the end, she had refrained from doing so. Rena shook her head to clear her thoughts of her past life out of her head and turned her attention back to the topic at hand. Is it too hard for you to have a mother who works in such a field? Rena's eyes showed sadness when she said this. Her image of prostitutes was that of women, who were more or less forced to do that job, so that they could buy a meal to get through the day, or even feed their fatherless children. As someone, who had never experienced parental love, she thought it was a privilege, even a gift, to have a mother who would go to such lengths to earn a living for her child. So she found it heartbreaking that the girl in front of her couldn't see that. Don't you love your mother who gives this much for you? Rena looked at the girl, expecting to see a face reflecting on her words. 
but what she perceived instead, was an angry face from a normally emotionless girl. Don't talk like you know about us. Rena was so shocked by the loud voice, that she flinched quite visibly and reflexively slid back on the couch as far away from Marianne as possible. Seeing the younger girl in that state, the brunette managed to calm down almost immediately after and regained her usually stoic face. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get loud. That woman isn't the person for who you think she is. She does it for pure pleasure and money. In fact, she loves money so much, that she even trained me to become a prostitute. Wow. For the NTH time today, Rena wasn't able to contain her surprise. Were it not for you? The Duke wouldn't have taken me away from that place. So it's thanks to you that I escaped that fate. Okay, I understand your thoughts. Even though I still find it a bit far-fetched for you to be grateful to me. I can accept it for now. But I don't buy your claim that you LL love me. Despite the seriousness of the situation, Rena still couldn't say that last sentence without blushing. Because this woman kisses and has intercourse with countless men, I've decided to do the opposite. The first person I share my kiss with will be my last. That's right, mistress, no. Before Rena could even seriously register the gravity of what she had just heard, Marianne continued. Rena, you were my first and you will be my last. Four.